Part 18 of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume 1, by Captain Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Benjamin Tapner, John Cobby, John Hammond, Richard Mills, Richard Mills the Younger, and others. Executed for murder. We do not recollect ever to have heard of a case exhibiting greater brutality on the part of the murderers towards their victim than this. The offenders were all smugglers, and the unfortunate objects of their crime were a custom-house officer and a shoemaker, named, respectively, William Galley and Daniel Chater. It would appear that a daring and very extensive robbery having been committed at the custom-house at Poole, Galley and Chater were sent to Stansted in Sussex to give some information to Major Battine, a magistrate, in reference to the circumstance. They did not, however, return to their homes, and on inquiry it turned out that they had been brutally murdered, the body of Galley being traced by means of bloodhounds to be buried, while that of Chater was discovered at a distance of six miles in a well in Harris's Wood, near Lee, in Lady Holt's Park, covered up with a quantity of stones, wooden railings, and earth. At a special commission held in Chichester on the 16th of January, 1749, the prisoners Benjamin Tapner, John Cobby, John Hammond, William Carter, Richard Mills the Elder, and Richard Mills the Younger, were indicted for the murder of Daniel Chater, the three first as principals, and the others as accessories before the fact, and William Jackson and William Carter were indicted for the murder of William Galley. From the evidence adduced, the circumstances of this most horrid murder were proved, and it appeared that the two deceased persons, having passed Havant on their road to Stansted, went to the new inn at Lee, where they met one Austin, and his brother and brother-in-law, of whom they asked the road, and they conducted them to Rowland's Castle, where they said they might obtain better information. They went into the White Hart, and Mrs. Payne, the landlady, suspecting the object of their mission, sent for the prisoners Jackson and Carter, and they were soon after joined by some others of the gang. After they had all been sitting together, Carter and Chater called out, and demanded to know where Diamond, one of those suspected of the robbery, was. Chater replied that he was in custody, and that he was going against his will to give evidence against him. Galley, following them into the yard, was knocked down by Carter, on his calling Chater away, and they then returned indoors. The smugglers now pretended to be sorry for what had occurred, and desired Galley to drink some rum, and they persisted in plying him and Chater with liquor, until they were both intoxicated. They were then persuaded to lie down and sleep, and a letter to Major Battine, of which they were the bearers, was taken from them, read, and destroyed. One John Royce, a smuggler, now came in, and Jackson and Carter told him the contents of the letter, and said that they had got the old rogue, the shoemaker of Fording Bridge, who was going to inform against John Diamond the shepherd, then in custody at Chichester. Here William Steele proposed to take them both to a well, about two hundred yards from the house, and to murder and throw them in. But this was rejected, and after several propositions had been made as to the mode in which they should be disposed of, the scene of cruelty was commenced by Jackson, who, putting on his spurs, jumped upon the bed where they lay, and spurred their foreheads, and whipped them, so that they both got up bleeding. The smugglers then took them out of the house, and Mills swore he would shoot any one who followed or said anything of what had occurred. Meanwhile the rest put Galley and Chater on one horse, tied their legs under the horse's belly, and then tied the legs of both together. They now set forward, with the exception of Royce, who had no horse, and they had not gone above two hundred yards before Jackson called out, whip em, cut em, slash em, damn em, upon which all began to whip except Steele, who led the horse, the roads being very bad. They whipped them for half a mile till they came to Woodash, where they fell off, with their heads under the horse's belly, and their legs, which were tied, appeared over the horse's back. Their tormentors soon set them upright again, and continued whipping them over the head, face, shoulders, etc., till they came to Dean, upwards of half a mile farther, and here they both fell again as before, with their heads under the horse's belly, which were struck at every step by the horse's hoofs. Upon placing them again in the saddle, the villains found them so weak that they could not sit, upon which they separated them, and put Galley before Steele, and Chater before little Sam, 
and then whipped galley so severely that the lashes coming upon steel at his desire they desisted they then went to harris's well and threatened to throw galley in but when he desired that they would put an end to his misery at once no said jackson if that's the case we have something more to say to you and they thereupon put him on the horse again and whipped him over the downs until he was so weak that he fell off they next laid him across the horse and little sam getting up behind him subjected him to such cruelty as made him groan with the most excruciating torments and he fell off again being again put up astride richards got up behind him but the poor man soon cried out i fall i fall and richards pushed him with a force saying fall and be damned the unhappy man then turned over and expired and they threw the body over the horse and carried it off with them to the house of one scardifield who kept the red lion at rake the landlord remarking the condition of chater and galley's body the fellows told him that they had engaged with some officers had lost their tea and that some of them were wounded if not dead this was sufficient and jackson and carter carried chater down to the house of the elder mills where they chained him up in a turf house their companions in the meantime drank gin and brandy at scardifield's and it now being nearly dark they borrowed spades and a candle and lantern and making him assist them in digging a hole they buried the body of the murdered officer they then separated but on the thursday they met again with some more of their associates including the prisoners richard mills and his two sons richard and john thomas stringer cobby tapner and hammond for the purpose of deliberating what should be done with their prisoner it was soon unanimously resolved that he must be destroyed and it was determined that they should take him to harris's well and throw him in as it was considered that the death would be most likely to cause him the greatest pain during this time the wretched man was in a state of the utmost horror and misery being visited occasionally by all his tormentors who abused him and beat him violently at last when this determination had been arrived at they all went and tapner pulling out a clasp knife ordered him on his knees swearing that he would be his butcher but being dissuaded from this as being opposed to their plan to prolong the miseries of their prisoner he contented himself with slashing the knife across his eyes almost cutting them out and completely severing the gristle of his nose they then placed him upon a horse and all set out together for harris's well except mills and his sons they having no horses ready and saying in excuse that there were enough without them to murder one man all the way tapner whipped him till the blood came and then swore that if he blooded the saddle he would torture him the more when they were come within one hundred yards of the well jackson and carter stopped saying to tapner cobby stringer steele and hammond go on and do your duty on chater as we have ours upon galley it was in the dead of the night that they brought their victim to the well which was nearly thirty feet deep but dry and paled close round and tapner having fastened a noose around his neck they bade him get over the pails he was going through a broken place but though he was covered with blood and fainting with anguish of his wounds they forced him to climb up having the rope about his neck they then tied one end of the cord to the pails and pushed him over the brink but the rope being short he hung no farther within it than his thighs and leaning against the edge he hung above a quarter of an hour and was not strangled they then untied him and threw him head foremost into the well they tarried some time and hearing him groan they determined to go to one william comleys a gardener to borrow a rope and ladder saying they wanted to relieve one of their companions who had fallen into harris's well he said they might take them but they could not manage the ladder in their confusion it being a long one they then returned to the well and still hearing him groan and fearful that the sound might lead to a discovery the place being near the road they threw upon him some of the rails and gate-posts fixed about the well as well as some great stones and then finding him silent they left him the next consultation was how to dispose of their horses and they killed galleys which was grey and taking his hide off cut it into small pieces and hid them so as to prevent any discovery but a bay horse that chater had ridden on got from them this being the evidence produced the jury after being out of court about a quarter of an hour brought in a verdict of guilty against all the prisoners whereupon the judge pronounced sentence on the convicts in the most pathetic address representing the enormity of their crime and exhorting them to make immediate preparation for the awful fate that awaited them adding christian charity obliges me to tell you that your time in this world will be very short 
the heinousness of this crime, of which these men had been convicted, rendering it necessary that their punishment should be exemplary, the judge ordered that they should be executed on the following day, and the sentence was accordingly carried into execution against all but Jackson, who died in prison on the evening that he was condemned. They were attended by two ministers, and all, except Mills and his son, who took no notice of each other, and thought themselves not guilty because they were not present at the finishing of the inhuman murder, showed great marks of penitence. Tapner and Carter gave good advice to the spectators, and desired diligence might be used to apprehend Richards, whom they charged as the cause of their being brought to this wretched end. Young Mills smiled several times at the executioner, who was a discharged marine, and having ropes too short for some of them, was puzzled to fit them. Old Mills, being forced to stand tiptoe to reach the halter, desired that he might not be hanged by inches. The two Mills were so rejoiced at being told that they were not to be hanged in chains after execution, that death seemed to excite them in no terror, while Jackson was so struck with horror at being measured for his irons that he soon expired. They were hanged at Chichester on the 18th of January, 1749, amidst such a concourse of spectators as is seldom seen on the occasion of a public execution. Carter was hung in chains near Rake in Sussex, Tapner on Rooks Hill near Chichester, and Cobby and Hammond at Selsey Isle, on the beach where they sometimes landed their smuggled goods, and where they could be seen at a great distance east and west. Samuel Couchman and John Morgan, Lieutenant of Marines, Thomas Knight, Carpenter, and others. Shot for mutiny. The Chesterfield man-of-war, under the command of Captain O'Brien Dudley, were stationed off Cape Coast Castle, on the coast of Africa, when a dangerous mutiny broke out among the crew, of whom the above-named officers were the leaders. They were charged on their trial with exciting and encouraging mutiny, and running away with His Majesty's ship Chesterfield, on the 10th day of October, 1748, from the coast of Africa, leaving their captain, two lieutenants, with other officers, and some seamen on shore. It appeared, from the evidence adduced before the court-martial by which the prisoners were tried, and which was presided over by Sir Edward Hawke, that on the 15th of October, 1748, Captain Dudley, being on shore at Cape Coast Castle, sent off his barge to Lieutenant Couchman, ordering him to send the cutter with the boatswain of the ship to see the tents struck, and to bring everything belonging to the ship on board that night. Couchman, however, directly ordered the barge to be hoisted in, and the boatswain to turn all hands on the quarter-deck, and then, coming from his cabin with a drawn sword, said, "'Here I am, God damn me, and I will stand by you while I have a drop of blood in my body.' He was accompanied by John Morgan, the second lieutenant of Marines, Thomas Knight the carpenter, his mate John Place, a principal actor, and about thirty seamen with cutlasses. They gave three huzzas and threw their hats overboard.' damning old hats, and saying that they would soon get new. Couchman now sent for the boatswain to know if he would stand by him and go with him, but he replied, No, and said, For God's sake, sir, be ruled by reason, and consider what you are about. Couchman threatened to put him in irons if he did not join in with him, but the boatswain told him he never would be in such piratical designs, and he was immediately ordered into custody, and two sentinels put over him. Couchman soon after sent for Gillam, the mate of the ship, but he also refusing to join him was put into custody with five or six others. They were confined, however, only five or six hours, for in the middle of the night after their confinement, Couchman sent for them into the great cabin, desired them to sit and drink punch, and then dismissed them. The next day the boatswain was invited to dinner by the new commander, who began to rail against Captain Dudley, and proposed to him to sign a paper. He refused indignantly, and was immediately dismissed. When he quitted the great cabin, he went to the gunner, who informed him that he had twenty pistols still at his disposal, and it was determined that an effort should be made that night to recover the ship from the mutineers. When evening drew on, the boatswain proceeded to sound the ship's company, and he soon found about thirty of the seamen, besides the mates, gunner's mates, and coxswain of the barge, ready to aid him. The boatswain took the command on himself, and the first step which he took was to get all the irons or bilbos on the forecastle. He then sent for the twenty pistols, which were all loaded. He next ordered three men upon the grand magazine, and two to the abaft, and the remainder, who had no pistols, to stay by the bilbos, and secure as many prisoners as he should send. This disposition being made, he went directly down on the deck, 
where he divided his small company into two parties, and one going down the main, and the other the fore hatchway, they soon secured eleven or twelve of the ringleaders, and sent them up to the forecastle without the least noise. The two parties then joined, and went directly to the great cabin, where they secured Couchman and Morgan, with the carpenter, whom they immediately confined in different parts of the vessel. The ship being thus secured, the captain again boarded her, and took the command of her, and on her return to England the mutineers were brought to trial. The court-martial, having found them guilty of the crimes imputed to them, they were shot in the month of June 1749. The boatswain, Roger Winkett, was afterwards rewarded with three hundred pounds a year as master attendant of Woolwich Dockyard. John Mills executed for murder the case of this felon becomes remarkable from the fact of the criminal being the son of Richard Mills the Elder, whose ignominious fate we have just recorded. It appears that he was engaged in the robbery of the Custom House, but escaped, and soon after his father, brother, and their accomplices were hanged, he thought of going to Bristol, with a view of embarking for France, and having hinted his intentions to some others, they resolved to accompany him. Stopping at a house on the road, they met with one Richard Hawkins, whom they asked to go with them but the poor fellow hesitating they put him on horseback behind mills and carried him to the dog and partridge on slendon common which was kept by john reynolds they had not been long in the house when complaint was made that two bags of tea had been stolen and hawkins was charged with the robbery he steadily denied any knowledge of the affair but they obliged him to pull off his clothes and having stripped themselves they began to whip him with the most unrelenting barbarity and curtis one of the gang said he did know of the robbery and if he did not confess, he would whip him till he did, for he had whipped many a rogue, and washed his hands in his blood. The villains continued whipping the poor wretch till their breath was almost exhausted, when at length the unfortunate man mentioned something of his father and brother, on which Mills and Curtis said they would go and fetch them, but Hawkins expired soon after they had left the house. On their way back they met Winter, one of their companions, who informed them of this fact, when they dismissed the men, whom they had compelled to accompany them, saying that they should be sent for when they were wanted. Their next anxiety was as to the mode in which they should dispose of the body, and it was proposed to throw it into a well in an adjacent park. But this being objected to, they carried it twelve miles, and having tied stones to it in order to sink it, they threw it into a pond in Parham Park, belonging to Sir Cecil Bishop, and in this place it lay more than two months before it was discovered. Mills was afterwards taken into custody on the information of Pring, an outlawed smuggler, and, being tried, was convicted. The country being at that time filled with smugglers, a rescue was feared, wherefore he was conducted to the place of execution by a guard of soldiers. When there he prayed with the clergyman, confessed that he had led a bad life, acknowledged the murder of Hawkins, desired that all young people would take warning by his untimely end, and humbly implored the forgiveness of God. He was executed on Slendon Common on the 12th of August, 1749, and afterwards hung in chains on the same spot. Amy Hutchinson, burnt for the murder of her husband. This malefactor was born of indigent parents in the Isle of Ely, and having received a poor education at the age of sixteen, she attracted the attention of a young man, whose love she returned with equal affection. A father, being apprised of the connection, strictly charged his daughter to decline it, but there was no arguing against love. The intimacy continued till it became criminal. The young fellow, having soon grown tired of her, he went off to London, and she determined to revenge herself upon him for his infidelity. By marrying another suitor, named John Hutchinson, who had previously been disagreeable to her. The marriage accordingly took place, but her first admirer, happening to return from London, just as the newly wedded pair were coming out of church, the bride was greatly affected at the recollection of former scenes, and the irrevocable ceremony which had now passed. Unable to love the man she had married, she doted to distraction on him she had lost, and only a few days after her marriage admitted him to his former intimacy with her. Hutchinson becoming jealous of his wife, a quarrel ensued, in consequence of which he beat her with great severity, but this producing no alteration in her conduct, he had recourse to drinking, with a view to avoid the pain of reflection on his situation. In the interim, his wife and the young fellow continued their guilty intercourse uninterrupted, but, considering the life of her husband as a bar to their happiness, it was resolved to remove him by poison. 
For this purpose the wife purchased a quantity of arsenic, and Mr. Hutchinson being afflicted with an ague, and wishing for something warm to drink, she put some arsenic in ale, of which he drank very plentifully, and then she left him, saying she would go and buy something for his dinner. Meeting her lover, she acquainted him with what had passed, on which he advised her to buy more poison, fearing the first might not be sufficient to operate, but its effects were fatal, and Hutchinson died about dinner-time on the same day. The deceased was buried on the following Sunday, and the next day the former lover renewed his visits, which occasioned the neighbours to talk very freely of the affair. The young widow was taken into custody on suspicion of having committed the murder. The body being exhumed, it was found that death had been caused by poison, and the prisoner was convicted and sentenced to death. She was strangled and burned at Ely on the 7th of November, 1750, confessing the crime of which she had been found guilty. End of part 18 Part 19 of the Chronicles of Crime by Camden Pelham This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 19 John Carr, executed for forgery This offender was born of respectable parents who gave him a good education in the north of Ireland. Having gone to Dublin at the age of sixteen years, he soon afterwards entered into business as a wine merchant, but being uncontrolled, he fell into bad habits and company, and was compelled to give up his trade. An associate inviting him to join him at Kilkenny, he proceeded thither by coach, and seeing a lady in the conveyance, the elegance of her appearance and manners impressed him with an idea that she was of rank. He determined, if possible, to profit by the opportunity afforded him. He handed her into the inn, and, a proposal being made that the company should sup together, it was agreed to on all hands, and while the supper was preparing, Carr applied himself to the coachman to learn the history of the young lady, but all the information he could obtain was that he had taken her up at Dublin, and that she was going to the spa at Mallow. He was determined, however, to become better acquainted with her, and prevailed on the company to repose themselves the next day at Kilkenny, to take a view of the Duke of Ormond's seat, and the curiosities of the town. This proposal being acceded to, the evening was spent in the utmost harmony and good humour, and the fair stranger even then conceived an idea of making a conquest of Mr. Carr, from whose appearance she was induced to suppose that he was a man of distinction. It was now diamond-cut diamond, and in the morning the fair incognita dressed herself to great advantage, not forgetting the ornament of jewels which she wore in abundance, so that, when she entered the room, Carr was astonished at her appearance. She found the influence she had over him, and resolved to afford him an early opportunity of speaking his sentiments, and while the company were walking in the gallery of the Duke of Ormond's palace, an occasion presented itself which was not lost by either party. The lady at first affected displeasure at so explicit a declaration, but, soon assuming a more affable deportment, she told him that she was an English woman of rank, that his person was not disagreeable to her, and that, if he was a man of fortune, and the consent of her relations could be obtained, she should not be averse to listening to his addresses. She further said that she was going to spend part of the summer at Mallow, where his company would be agreeable, and he followed her to that place, contrary to the advice of his friend who had formed a very unfavourable opinion of the lady's character. It is needless to say that the company of so refined and elegant a person was not to be kept without some expenses, which were not of a very moderate character, and the difficulties in which our hero had already placed himself were in no wise diminished by his new connection. He remained with her, however, until the end of the season induced them to return to Dublin, and then a trip to England was proposed preparatory to the final steps being taken, to complete the nuptial arrangements. The gallantry and wits of the gentlemen were sorely tested to procure the requisite funds for the trip, but he at length succeeded in obtaining such a sum as he and the lady deemed sufficient. The passage only remained to be secured, and the too credulous sharper was employed in obtaining it, but in his absence the lady shipped all the effects on board a vessel bound for Amsterdam and, having dressed herself in a man's apparel, she embarked and sailed, leaving Carr to regret his ill-judged credulity. 
Thus reduced to want, he went to London, and having enlisted as a foot soldier, he was discharged after several years' service. He subsequently entered as a marine, but soon afterwards came to London again, and opened a shop in Hog Lane, St. Giles. He now married a girl, who he thought had money, but soon discovering her poverty, he abandoned her, and removed to Short's Gardens, where he entered into partnership with a cork-cutter. But having obtained the promise of support from his partner's customers, he set upon his own account, and was tolerably successful, though his passion for gambling prevented his retaining any part of the produce of his business. His new companions at the gaming-table, having an eye to their own profit, offered to procure him a wife of fortune, though they knew he had a wife living, and actually contrived to introduce him to a young lady of property, with whom a marriage would probably have taken place, but that one of them, struck with remorse of conscience, developed the affair to her father, and frustrated the whole scheme. Being now again thrown upon his own resources, he engaged himself as a porter to a merchant, but while in this condition, his master having entrusted him with a cheque for sixty pounds, he procured it to be cashed, and having spent the money in the lowest debauchery, he again entered as a marine. There being something in his deportment superior to the vulgar, he was advanced to the rank of sergeant, in which he behaved so well that his officers treated him with considerable favour. The vessel in which he sailed was of considerable power, and taking a merchant ship richly laden, and soon afterwards several smaller vessels, the prize money accounted to a considerable sum. This gave Carr an idea that very great advantages might be obtained by privateering, and having procured a discharge, he entered on board a privateer, and was made master-at-arms. In a few days the privateer took two French ships, one of which they carried to Bristol, and the other into the harbour of Poole, and refitting their ship they sailed again, and in two days took a French privateer, and gave chase to three others, which they found to have been English vessels belonging to Falmouth, which had been captured by a French privateer. These they retook, and carried them into Falmouth, in their passage to which the place they made prize of a valuable French ship, the produce of which contributed to enrich the crew. On their next trip they saw a ship in full chase of them, on which they prepared for a vigorous defence, and an action soon after taking place many hands were lost by the French, who at length attempted to shear off, but were taken after a chase of some leagues. The commander of the English privateer, being desperately wounded in the engagement, died in a few days, on which Carr courted his widow, and a marriage would have taken place, but that she was seized with a violent fever, which deprived her of life, but not before she had bequeathed him all she was possessed of. Having disposed of her effects, he repaired to London, where he commenced smuggler, but his ill-gotten goods being seized by the officers of the revenue, he took to the still more dangerous practice of forging seamen's wills, and gained money thus for some time, but being apprehended, he was brought to trial at the Old Bailey, convicted, and was sentenced to die. He was of the Romish persuasion, and died with decent resignation to his fate. Carr was hanged at Tyburn on the 16th of November, 1750. Norman Ross, executed for murder. About the time at which this man met his most deserved punishment, the public journals teemed with accounts of the impudence and crimes of the party-coloured tribe of servants, denominated footmen. To such a daring pitch had their impudence arrived, that they created a riot at the theatre in Drury Lane, even in the presence of the heir apparent to the throne. One evening when the Prince and Princess of Wales, the father and mother of King George the Third, attended the performance, these miscreants commenced a dreadful uproar. It was then the custom to admit servants in livery into the upper gallery gratis, in compliment to their employers, on whom they were supposed to be in attendance, and not content with peaceably witnessing the performance, they frequently interrupted those who had paid for admission, and assuming the prerogative of critics, hissed or applauded with the most offensive clamour. In consequence of these violent proceedings, the manager shut the door against them, unless they each paid their shilling. Upon an occasion when that part of the royal family, already mentioned, were present, they mustered in a gang, to the number of three hundred, broke open the doors of the theatre, fought their way to the very door of the stage, and in their progress wounded twenty-five peaceable people. Colonel de Vale, then an active magistrate for Westminster, happened to be present, and in vain attempted to read a proclamation against such an outrage, 
but though they obstructed him in his duty, he caused the ringleaders to be secured, and the next day committed three of them to Newgate. At the ensuing sessions they were convicted of the riot and sentenced to imprisonment. In the meantime, the collar of these upstarts was raised to such a pitch that they sent the following threat to the manager. To Mr. Fleetwood, in Lincoln's Inn Fields, Master of the Theatre, Drury Lane. Sir, we are willing to admonish you before we attempt our design, and, provided you use us civil and admit us into our gallery, which is our property according to formalities, and if you think proper to come to a composition this way, you'll hear no further, and if not, our intention is to combine in a body incognito and reduce the playhouse to the ground, valuing no detection, we are indemnified. The manager carried this letter to the Lord Chamberlain, who ordered a detachment of fifty soldiers to do duty there each night, and thus deterred the saucy knaves from carrying their threats into execution. At the Edinburgh Theatre it was also a custom to admit men wearing the badge of servitude into the gallery gratis, and when Garrick's inimitable farce, High Life Below Stairs, wherein the waste and impudence of domestic servants of rich men is completely exposed, was performed there, a most violent clamour broke out in the gallery, so as entirely to interrupt the performance, and put the other part of the audience in fear of the consequences. The hardy Scotchmen, however, laid hold of the rioters, and kicked every footman, who alone were concerned, out of the house, where, without paying, they never more entered. Having thus referred to an evil which existed in 1751, and which even to this moment continues to exist to a considerable extent, namely the overbearing insolence of the fellows who usually fill the situations of domestic servants in the families of the rich, it is time to proceed to the history of the subject of this sketch. Ross was born of decent parents in Inverness, and received an education by which he would have been fitted to fill a situation in a merchant's counting-house. The difficulty in obtaining such employment, however, induced him to enter the service of a lady, who had always exhibited great kindness towards his family and he soon afterwards accompanied her son to the continent, in the capacity of a valet de chambre. He continued in this situation during about five years, when he returned to Scotland, and was employed by an attorney in Edinburgh. But having contracted an intimacy among other servants, from their instruction he acquired all the fashionable habits of drinking, swearing, and gaming, and was dismissed on account of his impudence, and the irregularities of his conduct, he was subsequently engaged by a Mrs. Hume, a widow lady of good fortune, whose residence during the summer was at Ayton, a village about four miles from Berwick-upon-Tweed. The extravagance of our hero, and an unfortunate intercourse which he had with a fellow-servant, soon compelled him to look for some other means of procuring money, besides that which was honestly afforded him by his mistress, and having exhausted the patience of his friends by borrowing from them repeatedly, he formed the resolution of robbing his employer. It would appear that Mrs. Hume slept in a room on the first floor, and that the keys of her bureau were usually placed under her head for safety. Sunday night was the time fixed upon for the commission of the robbery, and, waiting in his bedroom, without undressing himself till he judged the family to be asleep, he descended, and, leaving his shoes in the passage, proceeded to his lady's bedchamber. Upon his endeavouring to get possession of the keys, the lady was disturbed, and being dreadfully alarmed, called for assistance, but the rest of the family, lying at a distant part of the house, her screams were not heard. Ross immediately seized a clasp-knife that lay on the table, and cut his mistress's throat in a most dreadful manner. This horrid act was no sooner perpetrated than, without waiting to put on his shoes, or to secure either money or other effects, he leapt out of the window, and after travelling several miles, concealed himself in a field of corn. In the morning the gardener discovered a livery hat, which the murderer had dropped in descending from the window, and, suspecting that something extraordinary had happened, he alarmed his fellow-servants. The disturbance in the house brought the two daughters of Mrs. Hume downstairs, but no words can express the horror and consternation of the young ladies upon beholding their parent weltering in her blood, and the fatal instrument of death lying on the floor. Ross being absent, and his shoes and hat being found, it was concluded that he must have committed the barbarous deed, and the butler therefore mounted a horse, and alarmed the country, lest the murderous villain should escape. The butler was soon joined by great numbers of horsemen, and towards the conclusion of the day 
when both men and horses were nearly exhausted through excessive fatigue, the murderer was discovered in a field of standing corn. He was immediately secured, and being brought to trial, he had the effrontery to declare that he was admitted to share his mistress's bed, and that his custom was always to leave his shoes at the parlour door. That on the night of the murder he proceeded as usual to her room, but on entering it his horror was aroused at discovering her to be murdered. He leapt out of the window to search for the perpetrators of the deed, and dropping his hat he thought it better not to return until night. Having been found guilty, he was sentenced to have his right hand chopped off, then to be hanged till dead, the body to be hung in chains, and the right hand to be affixed to the top of the gibbet, with the knife made use of in the commission of the murder. Upon receiving sentence of death, he began seriously to reflect on his miserable situation, and the next day he requested the attendance of Mr. James Craig, one of the ministers of Edinburgh, to whom he confessed his guilt, declaring that there was no foundation for his reflections against the chastity of the deceased. Six weeks elapsed between the time of his trial and that of his execution, during which he showed every sign of the most sincere penitence, and refused to accompany two prisoners who broke out of jail, saying he had no desire to recover his liberty, but that on the contrary he would cheerfully submit to the utmost severity of punishment, that he might make atonement for his wickedness. The day appointed for putting the sentence of the law into force being arrived, Ross walked to the place of execution, holding Mr. Craig by the arm, having addressed a pathetic speech to the populace, and prayed some time with great fervency of devotion, the rope was put around his neck, and he laid his right hand upon the block, when it was struck off by the executioner at two blows. He was immediately afterwards run up to the gallows, when, feeling the rope drawing tight, by a convulsive motion of the arm he struck his bloody wrist against his cheek, which gave it a ghastly appearance. The sentence was subsequently fully carried into effect. The execution took place on the 8th of January, 1751. Thomas Colley, executed for murder. This offender was a victim to his own feelings of superstition. At the time of his crime and execution, the belief in witchcraft was almost universal, and Colley was hanged for the murder of a poor old woman named Osborne, whose qualities as a witch he tested by ducking her in a pond until she was dead thereby indisputably proving to the satisfaction of all, and to the credit of the deceased woman, how unjustifiable were the suspicions which had been entertained of her character. The evidence given against the prisoner was to the following effect. On the 18th of April, 1751, a man named Nichols went to William Dell, the crier at Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire, and delivered to him a paper to the following effect which was to be cried. This is to give notice that on Monday next, a man and woman are to be publicly ducked at Tring, in this county, for their wicked crimes. This notice was given at Winslow and Leighton Buzzard, as well as at Hemel Hempstead, on the respective market days, and was heard by Mr. Barton, overseer of the parish of Tring, who, being informed that the persons intended to be ducked were John Osborne and Ruth, his wife, and having no doubt of the good character of both the parties, sent them to the workhouse as a protection from the rage of the mob. On the day appointed for the practice of the infernal ceremony, an immense number of people, supposed to be not fewer than five thousand, assembled near the workhouse at Tring, vowing revenge against Osborne and his wife as a wizard and a witch, and demanding that they should be delivered up to their fury. In support of their demands they pulled down a wall belonging to the workhouse, and broke the windows and window frames. On the preceding evening, the master of the workhouse, suspecting some violence from what he heard of the disposition of the people, had sent Osborne and his wife to the vestry room belonging to the church, as a place the most likely to secure them from insult. The mob would not give credit to the master of the workhouse that the parties were removed, but rushing into the house, searched it through, examining the closets, boxes, trunks, and even the salt box, in quest of them. There being a hole in the ceiling, which had been left by the plasterers, Colley, who was one of the most active of the gang, exclaimed, "'Let us search the ceiling!' And this being done, but of course without success, they swore that they would pull down the house, and set fire to Tring, if the parties were not produced. The master of the workhouse, apprehensive that they would carry their threats into execution, and unmindful of the safety of the unfortunate wretches whom it was his duty to protect, 
at length gave up their place of concealment, and the whole mob, with Colley at their head, forthwith marched off to the church and brought them off in triumph. Their persons secured, they were carried to a pond called Marlston Mere, where they were stripped and tied up separately in cloths. A rope was then bound round the body of the woman, under her armpits, and two men dragged her into the pond, and threw it several times. Colley going into the pond, and with a stick, turning her from side to side. Having ducked her repeatedly in this manner, they placed her by the side of the pond, and dragged the old man in, and ducked him. Then he was put by, and the woman ducked again as before, Colley making the same use of his stick. With this cruelty the husband was treated twice over, and the wife three times, during the last of which the cloth in which she was wrapped came off, and she appeared quite naked. Not satisfied with this barbarity, Colley pushed his stick against her breast, and the poor woman attempted to lay hold of it, but her strength being now exhausted, she expired on the spot. Colley then went round the pond, collecting money of the populace for the sport he had shown them in ducking the old witch, as he called her. The mob now departed to their several habitations, and the body being taken out of the pond was examined by Mr. Foster, a surgeon, and the coroner's inquest being summoned on the occasion, Mr. Foster deposed that, on examining the body of the deceased, he found no wound, either internal or external, except a little place that had the skin off on one of her breasts, and it was his opinion that she was suffocated with water and mud. Hereupon Colley was taken into custody, and when his trial came on, Mr. Foster deposed to the same effect as above mentioned, and there being a variety of other strong proofs of the prisoner's guilt, he was convicted and received sentence of death. His defence was that he had endeavoured to protect the old people from violence, instead of attempting to injure them. After conviction he seemed to behold his guilt in its true light of enormity. He became, as far as could be judged, sincerely penitent for his sins, and made good use of the short time he had to live in the solemn preparation for eternity. The day before his execution he was removed from the jail of Hartford, under the escort of one hundred men of the Oxford Blues, commanded by seven officers, and being lodged in the jail of St. Albans, was put into a chaise at five o'clock the next morning, with the hangman, and reached the place of execution about eleven, where his wife and daughter came to take leave of him. The minister of Tring assisted him in his last moments, and he died exhibiting all the marks of unfeigned penitence. He was executed on the 24th of August, 1751, and his body afterwards hung in chains at a place called Gubblecut, near which the offence was committed. It is not a little remarkable that, at so recent a period, so many people as composed this mob should be found so benighted in intellect, and utterly uninformed, as to be guilty of so miserable and so glaring a piece of absurdity and wickedness as that which was proved in the evidence against the prisoner. In former ages, it is true, not only the people, but even the authorities of the land, believed in witchcraft and sorcery, but it is indeed extraordinary that in the eighteenth century a scene such as that described could have been permitted to occur at a village within thirty miles of the metropolis. The following copy of an indictment furnished us by a friend who took it from the American court record must prove a matter of curiosity to the reader at the present enlightened era. Essex, a town in the colony of Massachusetts Bay in New England. The jurors of our Sovereign Lord and Lady, the King and Queen, King William and Queen Mary, present, that George Burroughs, late of Falmouth, in the province of Massachusetts, Bay, Clark, a Presbyterian minister of the Gospel, the ninth day of May, and divers other days and times, as well before as after, certain detestable arts called witchcraft and sorceries, wickedly and feloniously, hath used, practised, and exercised at, and in, the town of Salem, in the county aforesaid, upon and against one Mary Walcott, single woman, by which said wicked arts the said Mary, on the day aforesaid, and divers other days and times, as well before as after, was, and is, tortured, afflicted, pined, consumed, wasted, and tormented against the peace, etc. A witness, by the name Anne Putnam, deposed as follows, on the 8th of May, 1692, I saw the apparition of George Burroughs, who grievously tormented me, and urged me to write in his book, which I refused. He then told me that his two first wives would appear to me presently, and tell me a great many lies, but I must not believe them. 
then immediately appeared to me the forms of two women in winding sheets and napkins about their heads at which i was greatly affrightened they turned their faces towards mr burroughs and looked red and angry and told him that he had been very cruel to them and that their blood called for vengeance against him and they also told him that they should be clothed with white robes in heaven when he should be cast down into hell and he immediately vanished away and as soon as he was gone the women turned their faces towards me and looked as pale as a white wall and told me they were mr burroughs two wives and that he had murdered them and one told me she was his first wife and he stabbed her under the left breast and put a piece of sealing wax in the wound and she pulled aside the winding sheet and showed me the place she also told me that she was in the house where mr darris the minister of danvers then lived when it was done and the other told me that mr burroughs and a wife that he hath now killed her in the vessel as she was coming to see her friends from the eastward because they would not have one another and they both charged me to tell these things to the magistrates before mr burroughs face and if he did not own them they did not know but they should appear this morning this morning also appeared to me another woman in a winding sheet and told me that she was goodman fuller's first wife and mr burroughs killed her because there was a difference between her husband and him upon the above and some other such evidence was this unfortunate man condemned and executed the days are now happily past when such monstrous absurdities are heard of end of part nineteen part twenty of the chronicles of crime part one by camden pelham this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty frederick caulfield executed for murder the following is a remarkable instance, if it be true, of a dream occasioning the discovery of a murder. Adam Rogers, a creditable man who kept a public house at Port Law, a small village nine or ten miles from Waterford, in Ireland, dreamed one night that he saw two men at a particular green spot on an adjacent mountain, one of them a sickly-looking man, the other remarkably strong and large. Then he fancied that he saw the little man murder the other, and awoke in great agitation. The circumstances of the dream were so distinct and forcible that he continued much affected by them, and on the next morning he was extremely startled at seeing two strangers enter his house about eleven o'clock in the forenoon, who resembled precisely the two men that he fancied he had seen. After the strangers had taken some refreshment, and were about to depart in order to prosecute their journey, Rogers earnestly endeavoured to dissuade the little man from quitting his house, and going on with his fellow-traveller and he assured him that if he would remain with him that day he would himself accompany him to carrick the next morning that being the town to which they were proceeding he was unwilling and ashamed to tell the cause of his being so solicitous to separate him from his companion but as he observed that hickey which was the name of the little man seemed to be quiet and gentle in his deportment and had money about him and that the other had a ferocious bad countenance he dreaded that something fatal would happen and wished at all events to keep them asunder the humane precautions which he took however proved ineffectual for caulfield such was the other's name prevailed upon hickey to continue with him on their way to carrick declaring that as they had long travelled together they should not part but should remain together until he should see hickey safely arrive at the habitation of his friends they accordingly set out together and in about an hour after they left port law in a lonely part of the mountains just near the place observed by Rogers in his dream, Caulfield took the opportunity of murdering his companion. It appeared afterwards, from his own account of the horrid transaction, that as they were getting over the ditch, he struck Hickey on the back part of his head with a stone, and when he fell down into the trench in consequence of the blow, Caulfield gave him several stabs with a knife, and cut his throat so deeply that the head was almost severed from the body. He then rifled Hickey's pockets of all the money in them, took part of his clothes and everything else of value about him, and afterwards proceeded on his way to Carrick. He had not been long gone when the body, still warm, was discovered by some labourers who were returning to their work from dinner. The report of the murder soon reached Port Law, and Rogers and his wife went to the place and instantly knew the body of him whom they had in vain endeavoured to dissuade from going on with his treacherous companion. 
They had once declared their suspicions that the murder was perpetrated by the fellow traveller of the deceased, and an immediate search was made, and Caulfield was apprehended at Waterford on the second day after. He was brought to trial at the ensuing assizes, and convicted of the fact. After sentence, the prisoner confessed that he had been guilty of the murder, and stated that he had accompanied Hickey home from the West Indies, and that observing that he had money in his possession, he had long contemplated the deed which he afterwards effected, but was unable to meet with a good opportunity until their arrival at the spot alluded to. He was executed at Waterford in the year 1751. William Parsons, Esquire, executed for returning from transportation. The unhappy subject of this narrative was the eldest son of Sir William Parsons, Baronet, of the county of Nottingham, and was born in London in the year 1717. He was placed under the care of a pious and learned divine at Pepper Harrow, in Surrey, where he received the first rudiments of education. In a little more than three years he was removed to Eton College, where it was intended that he should qualify himself for one of the universities. But his misconduct prevented his friends from carrying out their intentions in this respect, for having been detected in various acts of petty pilfering, he was dismissed from the school, and sent home to his father. His disposition was now found to be of so unpromising a character, that it was thought advisable to send him to sea, and an appointment was procured for him as midshipman on board a vessel of war lying at Spithead which was immediately about to proceed to Jamaica. Our hero soon obtained the necessary outfit and joined his ship, but some accident detaining her beyond the time when it was expected she would sail, he applied for leave of absence and went on shore, but having no intention to return, he directed his course towards a small town about ten miles from Portsmouth called Bishop Swaltham, where, by representations of his respectability, he soon ingratiated himself into the favour of the principal inhabitants. His figure being pleasing, and his manner of address easy and polite, he found but little difficulty in recommending himself to the ladies, and he became greatly enamoured of a beautiful and accomplished young lady, the daughter of a physician of considerable practice, and prevailed upon her to promise that she would yield to him her hand in marriage. News of the intended alliance, coming to the knowledge of his father and of his uncle, the latter directly hastened to Waltham, to prevent a union which would have produced consequences of the worst character to the contracting parties, and having apprised the friends of the young lady with the condition and situation of the intended bridegroom, their consent was withdrawn, and our hero was, with some difficulty, induced to rejoin his ship. Restless, however, in his new employment, he had scarcely reached Jamaica when he determined that he would desert and return to England and the sailing of the Sheerness Man of War for that place afforded him an opportunity of carrying his design into execution, of which he lost no time in availing himself. A new effort to obtain the hand of his former love was as unsuccessful as that which he had first made, and his uncle having ascertained the fact of his presence in England, induced him at once to go back to the residence of his father with promises of future amendment. For a time his determination to alter his course of life was obeyed, but soon again launching forth into habits of irregularity, he was dispatched as midshipman on board the Romney for the coast of Newfoundland. On his revisit in England after an absence of some years, he was mortified to learn that the Duchess of Northumberland, to whom he was distantly related, had revoked a will in his favour which she had made, and had bequeathed to his sister the fortune which he knew had been intended for him and now, finding himself spurned by his friends, he was soon reduced to a condition of absolute necessity. Through the friendly intervention of a Mr. Bailey, however, he procured an engagement at James Fort on the River Gambia, but here, as in all other situations unfortunate, he contrived to engage himself in a quarrel, in consequence of which he was compelled to return to Europe, a step, however, which he was alone enabled to take by setting at defiance the commands of the Governor of Fleur that he should not quit the colony, and take his passage under an assumed name on board a homeward-bound trader. Arrived in London, he found no friend to whom he could apply for assistance or relief, but at length discovering the residence of his father, he went to him and implored some aid, even if he should not give him any further countenance. Five shillings, and advice to enter a horse regiment as a private, were all that he could obtain, however, and rendered wretched by his miserable condition, 
the grave appeared to be the only resource to which he could look for consolation. But a thought suggested itself in time to prevent his rashly taking away his life, that he should represent himself as his brother, who had recently come into a fortune, and under the pretext that he was entitled to the legacy, he committed frauds upon various tradesmen to a considerable amount. His impudence and his ingenuity were now required to be exerted in order to relieve him from the difficulty in which he was involved in consequence of this proceeding, but his good fortune in throwing him in the way of a young lady of good fortune, to whom he was married, placed in his power the means of retrieving his lost character and his degraded position. The marriage was solemnised on the 10th of February 1740, and the intercession of his friends, to whom he was now with difficulty again reconciled, procured for him an ensigncy in the 34th Regiment of Foot from the Right Honourable Arthur Onslow. He appeared at this time to be desirous of reappearing in that position in society to which his birth entitled him, but having hired a house in Poland Street, his extravagant mode of living again, in the course of a few years, reduced him to a condition of great distress. He was compelled to sell his commission in order to recruit his shattered finances, and then in order to meet new demands he was guilty of various forgeries upon which he procured money to a very large amount. For two years he pursued new plans of iniquity with considerable success, but then being apprehended in the act of putting off a forged draft, he was committed to Maidstone Jail, and having been convicted at the ensuing assizes, was sentenced to be transported for seven years. In the month of September 1749 he was put on board the Thames transport bound for Maryland, and in the following November he was landed at Annapolis in that place. He was now guilty of new offences, even more criminal than those which he had before committed, and having first ridden off with a horse belonging to the person to whom he was assigned as a servant, and committed several robberies, he shaped his course to Potomac, from whence he immediately sailed for England. That refuge for the destitute of all classes at this period, the road, was now the only resource left to our hero, and for a time he pursued his new occupation with infinite determination and proportionate success but at length having attempted to rob mr fuller the gentleman by whom he had before been prosecuted he was recognised by him and being vigorously attacked was at length compelled to surrender and was secured and committed to newgate it was necessary to prove no new offence against him at his trial but all that was required was to identify him as a transported felon who had returned to england before the termination of the period for which he had been sentenced to be banished and this being done he was declared to have forfeited his life to the laws of his country. His distressed father and wife used all their interest to obtain for him a pardon, but in vain. He was an old offender, and judged by no means a fit object for mercy. While Parsons remained in Newgate, his behaviour was such that it could not be determined whether he entertained a proper idea of his dreadful situation. There is, indeed, but too much reason to fear that the hopes of a reprieve in which he deceived himself even to the last moments of his life, induced him to neglect the necessary preparation for eternity. His taking leave of his wife afforded a scene extremely affecting. He recommended to her parental protection his only child, and regretted that his misconduct had put it in the power of a censorious world to reflect upon both the mother and son. At the place of execution he joined in the devotional exercises with a fervency of zeal that proved him to be convinced of the necessity of obtaining the pardon of his creator. William Parsons, Esquire, suffered at Tyburn on the 11th of February, 1751. William Chandler, Transported for Perjury The scheme laid by this man for the purpose of plunder has scarcely ever been equalled in art and consummate hypocrisy. It is to be observed that in the case of every robbery committed, the hundred where it happens, or the county at large, is responsible for the amount of the loss which the injured person in such cases may sustain. In Chandler's attempt at fraud founded upon this law, he implicated three innocent men by whom he pretended to have been robbed, and who, had his tale ultimately received credit, might have lost their lives. Happily his plot was frustrated, and the real offender was brought to justice. William Chandler was the only child of Mr. Thomas Chandler of Woodborough, near Devizes, a gentleman farmer of moderate means. At an early age, the youth was articled to Mr. Banks, who was the clerk of the Goldsmiths' Company. But before two years had elapsed, 
In consequence of frequent disputes which took place, he was transferred to Mr. Hill, a respectable attorney in Clifford's Inn. His clerkship being nearly expired, the necessity of providing himself with the means of commencing practice on his own account suggested itself into his mind, and he therefore laid a plan to procure the possession of as much money as he could, and then going a journey into the country upon some plausible pretence, to trump up a story of being robbed, and sue the hundred for the amount. Upon representations to his father that he had a good match in view, the old man gave him an estate of the value of four hundred pounds, and then producing the deeds to his master, together with five hundred pounds which he had obtained by other means, but which he represented that he had received from a rich uncle in Suffolk, he procured from him the advance of five hundred pounds more, in order, as he alleged, that he might take a mortgage upon some property at Enford, within a few miles of his father's house. Mr. Hill demanded some security for his money, and his clerk immediately proposed to give him a mortgage upon his own estate. In order to favour the appearance of the probability of his proceedings, he engaged with a Mrs. Poor, who lived at Enford, in a transaction, having the mortgage of some land which she owned for its object, and the money having been duly advanced by his employer, he fixed the 25th of March, 1748, to meet Mrs. Poor, to hand over the money and receive the necessary papers. Early on the 24th, having turned most of his cash into small bills, to the amount of nine hundred pounds, he found, when he came to put these in canvas bags under his garters, where he proposed to carry them for safety, that they made too great a bundle, and therefore he took several of the bills, with some cash, amounting to four hundred and forty pounds, and exchanged them at the bank for two notes, one of four hundred pounds, and the other of forty pounds, the first of which, on his way home, he changed in his master's name, at Sir Richard Hawes, for one note of two hundred pounds, and two of one hundred pounds each. On his reaching the office, he told his master that the bank clerks were a little out of humour at the trouble he had already given them, and that he had changed his small notes with a stranger in the bank hall, for the notes which he in reality had received at Sir Richard Hawes. Mr. Hill, at Chandler's request, having then written down the numbers and dates of the several bills, and having seen them safely put up, Chandler took leave of him, and about twelve o'clock set out. About four o'clock the same afternoon he reached Hare Hatch, distant thirty miles from London, where he stopped to refresh, and about five, just as he had left his inn, he was, as he said, unfortunately met by three bargemen on foot, who, after they had robbed him of his watch and money, took him to a pit close by the road, and there stripped him of all his banknotes, bound his hands and feet, and left him, threatening to return and shoot him if he made the least noise. In this woeful condition, he said, he lay three hours, though the pit was so near the road that not a single horse could pass without his hearing. When night came, however, he jumped, bound as he was, near half a mile, all up hill, till, luckily for his purpose, he met one Avery, a simple shepherd, who cut the cords, and of whom the first question Chandler asked was, where a constable or tithing man lived. Avery conducted him to Richard Kelly's, the constable's, just by, and with him Mr. Chandler left the notices, required by the statutes, with the description of the men who robbed him, so exactly, that a person present remembered three such men to have passed by his house about the very time the robbery was said to have been committed, and the mayor of Reading, who was accidentally on the road, had a similar recollection of the bargemen, whom he had met near Maidenhead Thicket, between four and five the same day. Chandler then returned to the inn, where he had refreshed, and after telling his deplorable tale, and acquainting his landlord with his intention of suing the hundred, he ordered a good supper and a bowl of punch, and sat down with as little concern as if nothing had happened. Next day he returned to London, acquainted his master with the pretended robbery, and requested his assistance. Mr. Hill gave him the memorandum he had of the numbers, dates, and sums of the notes, and sent him to the bank to stop payment. But instead of that he went to Mr. Tuffley, a silversmith in Cannon Street, bought a silver tankard, and in payment changed one of the notes for a hundred pounds which he had received the day before at Sir Richard Hawes and on his return to his master, told him the bank did no business that day, on account of the hurry the city was in, with regard to a fire in Cornhill, which had happened the night before. He therefore went again the following morning, and when he came back, being asked by Mr. Hill for the paper, on which he had taken down the numbers, etc., he said he had left it with the clerks of the bank, 
who were to stop the notes, but that he had taken an exact copy of it. This, however, was false, for he had reserved Mr. Hill's copy, and left another at the bank, in which he had so craftily altered the numbers and dates of the three notes he received at Sir Richard Hawes, amounting to four hundred pounds, as to prevent their being stopped, and Mr. Hill remembering the difference. On the 26th he inserted a list of his notes, being fifteen in all, with their dates and numbers, in the daily papers, offering a reward of fifty pounds for the recovery of the whole, or in proportion for any part. But on the afternoon of the same day he withdrew his advertisement in all the daily papers, and took his own written copy away at each place. On the 29th of March he put the notice of the robbery and the description of the robbers in the London Gazette, as the law directs, except that he did not particularise the notes, as he had done in other papers. On the 12th of May following he made the proper information before a Justice of the Peace, but though Mr. Hill, his master, was with him, and had undertaken to manage the cause for him, yet he made the same omission in his information as in his advertisement in the London Gazette. All things being prepared, on the 18th of July, 1748, Chandler's cause came on at Abingdon before a special jury, and after a hearing of twelve hours the jury retired, and then gave the prosecutor a verdict for £970, subject, however, to a case reserved for the opinion of the Court of Common Pleas, concerning the sufficiency of the description of the banknotes in the London Gazette. In the meantime Chandler, fearing that by what came out upon the trial he should soon be suspected, and that he might be arrested, obtained a protection from Lord Willoughby de Broke, and gave out that he was removed into Suffolk to reside, as he had before pretended, with his rich uncle. But in reality he retired to Colchester, where his brother-in-law Humphrey Smart had taken an inn, with whom he entered into co-partnership, and never came publicly to London afterwards. He was, however, obliged to correspond with his master, on account of the point of law which was soon to be argued, and therefore to obtain his letters without discovering his place of abode, he ordered them to be directed to Mr. Thomas Chandler, at Easton, in Suffolk, to be left for him at the Crown at Audley, near Colchester. Mr. Hill, having written several letters to Mr. Chandler, pressing him to come to town, as the term drew near, and he evading it by trifling excuses, the former began to suspect him, even before the point of law was determined. Just before this period, twelve of the notes, of which Mr. Chandler pretended to have been robbed, were all brought to the bank together, having been bought, October the 31st, 1748, at Amsterdam, of one John Smith, by Barnard Solomon, a broker there, and by him transmitted to his son, Nathan Solomon, a broker in London. Upon further inquiry, it appeared that John Smith, who sold the notes, stayed but a few days in Holland, that he was seen in company with a Mr. Casson, a Holland trader, and came over in the packet with him. Mr. Casson was then found, and his description of John Smith answered to the person of Chandler, who was in consequence pressed by letter to come to town and face Casson to remove all suspicion, but he refused. In the interim the point of law was argued before the judges of the common pleas, when their determination was to the following effect, that as Chandler had not inserted the numbers of his notes in the Gazette, nor sworn to them when he made oath before the justice, the verdict must be set aside and the plaintiff non-suited, without the advantage of a new trial. But now the scene began to open apace for about this time the very paper which Chandler left when he'd stopped payment of the notes at the bank was found, and upon its being seen by Mr. Hill, he at once saw that he had been deceived, and proceeded to take the necessary steps to secure his apprehension. The whole circumstances attending the case were soon traced upon a minute inspection of the bank books, as contrasted with those of the banking house of Messrs. Hoare and Co., and about midsummer, 1749, Mr. Hill and others set out for Colchester with a view of securing the person of the culprit. After a fruitless journey, however, of about a hundred and fifty miles in search of the fugitive, they returned to the very inn at Colchester which was kept by the object of their search, and then departed for London without gaining any intelligence. Chandler, having seen his pursuers, thought it prudent to decamp, and proceeded to Coventry, where he took a small public house but being desirous of making some reparation to his late master, he transmitted to him a hundred and fifty pounds by letter from Nottingham. By the postmark of his letter he was eventually traced to Coventry, 
and an indictment for perjury in respect of the information on oath which he gave to the magistrates of the robbery having been found against him he was taken into custody on a judge's warrant and removed to abingdon where on the twenty second of july seventeen fifty he was arraigned on the indictment preferred against him the witnesses being all in attendance the prisoner traversed his trial until the next assizes in pursuance of a right which he possessed but then the facts already detailed having been proved in evidence he was found guilty and on the sixteenth of july seventeen fifty one he was sentenced to be transported for seven years having first undergone three months imprisonment in the county jail End of part 20part 21 of the chronicles of crime volume 1 by camden pelham this librivox recording is in the public domain part 21 mary blandy executed for parricide the unhappy subject of this memoir was a young lady of most respectable family and of superior education but who, in spite of the exertions of her parents in her early life to implant in her breast sentiments of piety and virtue, was guilty of a crime of the most heinous description, the wilful murder of her father. Mr. Francis Blandy was an attorney residing at Henley-on-Thames, and held the office of town clerk of that place. Possessed of ample means, his house became the scene of much gaiety, and as report gave to his daughter a fortune of no inconsiderable extent, and as, besides, her manners were sprightly and affable, and her appearance engaging, her hand was sought in marriage by many persons whose rank and wealth rendered them fitting to become her partner for life. But among all these visitants, none were received with greater pleasure by Mr. or Mrs. Blandy, or their daughter, than those who held commissions in the army. This predilection was evidenced in the introduction of the Honourable William Henry Cranston, at that time engaged on the recruiting service for a foot regiment, in which he ranked as captain. Captain Cranston was the son of Lord Cranston, a Scotch peer of ancient family, and through the instrumentality of his uncle, Lord Mark Kerr, he had obtained his commission. In the year 1745 he had married a young lady of good family named Murray, with whom he received an ample fortune, and in the year 1752 he was ordered to England to endeavour to procure his complement of men for his regiment. His bad fortune led him to Henley, and there he formed an intimacy with Miss Blandy. At this time Cranston was forty-six years of age, while Miss Blandy was twenty years his junior, and it is somewhat extraordinary that a person of her accomplishments and beauty should have formed a liaison with a man so much older than herself, and who, besides, is represented as having been devoid of all personal attractions. A short acquaintance, it appears, was sufficient to excite the flame of passion in the mind of the gallant captain, as well as of Miss Blandy, and ere long their troth was plighted, that they would be for ever one. The captain, however, felt the importance of forestalling any information which might reach the ears of his new love of the existence of any person who possessed a better right to his affections than she, and he therefore informed her that he was engaged in a disagreeable lawsuit with a young lady in Scotland, who had claimed him as her husband, but he assured her that it was a mere affair of gallantry, of which the process of the law would in the course of a very short time relieve him. This disclosure being followed by an offer of marriage, Cranston was referred to Mr. Blandy, and he obtained an easy acquiescence on his part in the wishes expressed by the young lady. At this juncture, an intimation being conveyed to Lord Kerr of the proceedings of his nephew, his lordship took instant steps to apprise Mr. Blandy of the position of Cranston. Prejudice had, however, worked its end as well with the father as the daughter, and the assertion of the intended bridegroom of the falsehood of the allegations made was sufficient to dispel all the fears which the report of Lord Kerr had raised. But although Captain Cranston had thus temporarily freed himself from the effects of the imputation cast upon him, he felt that some steps were necessary to get his first marriage annulled, and at length he wrote to his wife requesting her to disown him for a husband. The substance of this letter was that, having no other way of rising to preferment but in the army, he had but little ground to expect advancement there, while it was known he was encumbered with a wife and family, but could he once pass for a single man, 
he had not the least doubt of being quickly promoted, which would procure him a sufficiency to maintain her, as well as himself, in a genteeler manner than now he was able to do. "'All, therefore,' adds he, "'I have to request of you is, that you will transcribe the enclosed copy of a letter, wherein you disown me for a husband, put your maiden name to it, and send it by the post. All the use I shall make of it shall be to procure my advancement, which will necessarily include your own benefit. In full assurance that you will comply with my request, I remain your most affectionate husband. Mrs. Cranston, ill as she had been treated by her husband, and little hope as she had of more generous usage, was, after repeated letters had passed, induced to give up her claim, and at length sent the desired communication. On this, an attempt was made by him to annul the marriage, this letter being produced as evidence, but the artifice being discovered, the suit was dismissed with costs. Mr. Blandy soon obtained intelligence of this circumstance, and convinced now of the falsehood of his intended son-in-law, he conveyed a knowledge of it to his daughter, but she and her mother repelled the insinuations which were thrown out, and declared, in obedience to what they had been told by the gallant captain, that the suit was not yet terminated, for that an appeal to the House of Lords would immediately be made. Soon after this Mrs. Blandy died, and her husband began now to show evident dislike for Captain Cranston's visits, but the latter complained to the daughter of the father's ill-treatment, and insinuated that he had a method of conciliating his esteem, and that, when he arrived in Scotland, he would send her some powders proper for the purpose, on which, to prevent suspicion, he would write, Powders to clean the Scotch pebbles. Cranston sent her the powders, according to promise, and Mr. Blandy being indisposed on the Sunday night before his death, Susan Gunnell, a maid-servant, made him some water-gruel, into which Miss Blandy conveyed some of the powder, and gave it to her father, and repeating this draught on the following day, he was tormented with the most violent pains in his bowels. The disorder, which had commenced with symptoms of so dangerous a character, soon increased, and the greatest alarm was felt by the medical attendants of the old gentleman, that death alone would terminate his sufferings. Every effort was made, by which it was hoped that his life could be saved, but at length, when all possibility of his recovery was past, his wretched daughter rushed into his presence, and, in an agony of tears and lamentations, confessed that she was the author of his sufferings, and of his inevitable death. Urged to account for her conduct, which to her father appeared inexplicable, she denied, with the loudest asseverations, all guilty intention. She repeated the tale of her love, and of the insidious arts employed by Cranston, but asserted that she was unaware of the deadly nature of the powders, and that her sole object in administering them was to procure her father's affection for her lover. Death soon terminated the accumulated misery of the wretched parent, and the daughter had scarcely witnessed his demise ere she became an inmate of a jail. At the ensuing assizes at Oxford, Miss Blandy was indicted for the willful murder of her father, and was immediately found guilty upon the confession which she had made. She addressed the jury at great length, repeating the story which she had before related, but all was of no avail, and sentence of death was passed. After conviction, the wretched young woman behaved with the utmost decency and penitence. She spent the night before her execution in devotion, and at nine in the morning of the 6th of April, 1752, she left her apartment to be conducted to the scaffold. Habited in a black bombasin dress, her arms being bound with black ribbons, on her ascending the gallows she begged that she might not be hanged high, for the sake of decency, and on her being desired to go a little higher, expressed her fear that she should fall. The rope being put round her neck, she pulled her handkerchief over her face, and was turned off on holding out a book of devotions which she had been reading. The crowd of spectators assembled on this occasion was immense, and when she had hung the usual time, she was cut down, and the body being put into a hearse, was conveyed to Henley, and interred with her parents, at one o'clock on the following morning. It will be proper now to return to Cranston, who was the original contriver of this horrid murder. Having heard of Miss Blandy's commitment to Oxford jail, he concealed himself some time in Scotland, and then escaped to Boulogne in France. Meeting there with Mrs. Ross, who was distantly related to his family, he acquainted her with his situation, and begged her protection, on which she advised him to change his name for her maiden name of Dunbar. Some officers in the French service, 
who were related to his wife, hearing of his concealment, vowed revenge, if they should meet with him, for his cruelty to the unhappy woman, on which he fled to Paris, from whence he went to Ferns, a town in Flanders, where Mrs. Ross had provided a lodging for his reception. He had not been long at Ferns when he was seized with a severe fit of illness, which brought him to a degree of reflection to which he had been long a stranger. At length he sent for a father belonging to an adjacent convent, and received absolution from his hands on declaring himself a convert to the Romish faith. Granston died on the 30th of November, 1752, and the fraternity of monks and friars looked on his conversion as an object of such importance that solemn mass was sung on the occasion, and the body was followed to the grave not only by the ecclesiastics, but by the magistrates of the town. John McAnally and Luke Morgan, executed for burglary. These men were of that class who usually visit England during harvest from the sister kingdom, and who, if they possessed honesty, would prove most useful to the community of this country. It appears that in the year 1751, Mr. Porter, a farmer of great respectability, residing in Cheshire, had engaged a number of Irish people to assist in gathering his harvest, when on one evening of the month of August, he was alarmed, while sitting at supper, by hearing that they had attacked his house. Every effort was employed by him and his family to oppose the entry of their assailants, but their power being small, in the course of a few minutes the doors were burst in, and they found themselves surrounded by a gang whose ferocious demands for money or blood convinced them of the uselessness of resistance. Mr. Porter, however, for a while delayed meeting the demands which were made upon him, in the hope that some assistance might arrive but his ruffian assailants bound him with cords, and threatened instant destruction if his money and plate were not instantly brought forth. Miss Porter at this moment made her appearance, supplicating for the life of her parent, when she in turn was seized and bound, and was compelled to discover the chest in which the valuables were kept. In the confusion created by these proceedings, the youngest daughter, a girl of thirteen, whose presence of mind and courage were alike admirable, made her escape, and determined to procure some assistance to repel the attack which had been made, and, running into the stable, she got astride the bare back of a horse, with the halter only in its mouth, and galloping over hedges and ditches, so as to avoid the house, from which she might be seen by the villains, she rode to Pulford, a village at a short distance, to inform her eldest brother of the danger to which their relations at the farm were exposed. Young Porter, with a friend named Craven, whose conduct certainly was the very opposite of his name, immediately resolved upon attacking the villains in turn, and, with the girl, set off at full speed to render such aid as lay in their power. On their reaching the farm, they discovered a fellow on the watch, whom they instantly killed with so little noise as to create no alarm, and then proceeding to the parlour, they found four others in the very act of placing old Mr. Porter on the fire, having deprived him of his clothes, in order to extort from him a confession of the depository of his money his daughter being on her knees at their side, praying for his life. The appearance of two strangers was sufficient to induce the villains at once to desist from their horrid purpose, and, being now violently attacked, they were compelled to use their utmost exertions to defend themselves. A desperate conflict took place, but one of the robbers being felled senseless to the ground, and the others wounded and deprived of their arms, they jumped through the window and ran off. They were instantly pursued by the young men, and the alarm having by this time been given, McAnally and Morgan were secured on Chester Bridge, having a silver tankard in their possession which they had stolen from Mr. Porter's house. A fellow named Stanley, who turned out to be ringleader in this desperate attack, was subsequently apprehended on board a vessel bound for the West Indies at Liverpool, and with McAnally, Morgan, and a youth named Boyd, who had been left in the house, was committed to Chester Jail for trial. They were indicted at the ensuing assizes held in March 1752, and after a long investigation were found guilty and sentenced to death. But Boyd, in whose case some mitigating circumstances were proved, was respited, and his punishment eventually commuted to transportation for life. On the night before the execution, Stanley slipped his irons and got clear off from the jail, not without some suspicion that his escape was connived at by the keeper. On the 25th of May, 1752, McNelly and Morgan were brought out of prison in order to be hanged. Their behaviour was as decent as could be expected from persons of their station. They both declared that Stanley, who escaped, was the sole contriver of the robbery. 
they died in the Catholic faith and were attended by a priest of that persuasion. Elizabeth Jeffreys and John Swan, executed for murder. The case of these offenders is one of the greatest atrocity. It appears that the female was the niece of a gentleman of respectability residing at Walthamstow, who, having acquired an ample fortune, and having no children, adopted his brother's daughter, and made a will in her favour, bequeathing to her nearly his whole estate. The girl, however, returned her uncle's kindness with ingratitude, and having heard him declare that he would alter his will on account of her bad behaviour, she determined to prevent his carrying his design to her detriment into execution by murdering him. She soon discovered her inability to complete this project single-handed, and she gained the assistance of her accomplice in this crime, John Swan, who was in the employment of her uncle, and with whom there is good reason to believe she was on terms of intimacy. They endeavoured to suborn a simple fellow named Matthews to assist them, but although the promise of a large reward at first staggered him, his terrors eventually steeled him against the temptations held out to him. The night of the 3rd of July, 1751, was fixed upon for the completion of this villainy, and at the trial, which took place at Chelmsford, before Mr. Justice Wright, on the 11th of March, 1752, the following facts were proved. Matthews, having travelled from Yorkshire, was accidentally met in Epping Forest by Mr. Jeffreys, who gave him employment as an assistant to Swan, who was his gardener. After he had been at work only four days, he was sent upstairs by Miss Jeffreys to wipe a chest of drawers, and she followed him and asked him if he was willing to earn one hundred pounds. He answered that he was, in an honest way, on which she desired him to go to Swan. He accordingly joined him in the garden, and he offered him seven hundred pounds, to murder their master. He acquiesced, and on his being dismissed two days afterwards, Swan gave him half a guinea to buy a brace of pistols, but having spent the money given to him, he was ordered to meet Miss Jeffreys and Swan at Walthamstow on the Tuesday following, at ten o'clock at night, the object being then to carry out their intentions with respect to the murder. When he arrived he found the garden door on the latch, and going into the pantry he hid himself behind a tub till about eleven o'clock when Swan brought him some cold-boiled beef. About twelve Miss Jeffreys and Swan came to him, when the latter said, "'Now it is time to knock the old miser.' my master, on the head. But Matthews relented and said, I cannot find it in my heart to do it. Miss Jeffreys then immediately replied, You may be damned for a villain, for not performing your promise. And Swan, who was provided with pistols, also loudly abused him, and said he had a mind to blow his brains out for the refusal. Swan then produced a book, and insisted that Matthews should swear that he would not discover what had passed. And he did so with this reserve unless it was to save his own life. Soon after this Matthews heard the report of a pistol. When getting out of the house by the back way, he crossed the ferry and proceeded to Enfield Chase. Immediately afterwards Miss Jeffreys appeared at the door of the house, and called out for assistance, and some of the neighbours going in, they found Mr. Jeffreys dying, but they failed in discovering anything which would lead to the supposition of any person having quitted the house. Violent suspicions in consequence arose, and Miss Jeffreys was taken into custody, but no evidence arising to criminate her, she was discharged, and immediately administered to her uncle's estate, and took possession of his property. Renewed suspicions, however, were raised, and Matthews having been discovered, Jeffreys and Swan were apprehended. Upon this testimony a verdict of guilty was returned. After conviction, Elizabeth Jeffreys made the following confession. I, Elizabeth Jeffreys, do freely and voluntarily confess that I first enticed and persuaded John Swan and Thomas Matthews to undertake and perpetrate the murder of my deceased uncle, which they both consented to do the first opportunity, that on the third day of July, 1751, myself and John Swan, Matthews to my knowledge not being in the house, agreed to kill my said uncle, and accordingly, after the maid was gone to bed, I went into John Swan's room and called him and we went down together into the kitchen, and having assisted Swan in putting some pewter and other things into a sack, I said I could do no more, and then I went into my room, and afterwards Swan came up, as I believe, and went into my uncle's room and shot him, which done, he came to my door and rapped. Accordingly I went out in my shift, and John Swan opened the door and let me out. That done, I alarmed the neighbourhood and I do solemnly declare that I do not know that any person was concerned in the murder of my deceased uncle 
but myself and John Swan, for that Matthews did not come to my uncle's house the day before or night in which the murder was committed, as I know of. Elizabeth Jeffreys. Taken and acknowledged, March 12th, 1752. Swan for some time expressed great resentment at Miss Jeffreys' confession, but when he learned that he was to be hung in chains he began to relent, and seemed at length to behold his crime in its true light of enormity. On the day of the execution, the convicts left the prison at four in the morning, Miss Jeffreys being placed in a cart and Swan on a sledge. The unfortunate woman repeatedly fainted on her way to the gallows, and having fallen into a fit, had not recovered when she was turned off. The execution took place near the six-mile stone on Epping Forest on the 28th of March, 1752, and the body of Miss Jeffreys having been delivered to her friends for interment, the gibbet was removed to another part of the forest, where Swan was hung in chains. End of Part 21part twenty two of the chronicles of crime volume one by camden pelham this librivox recording is in the public domain part twenty two dr archibald cameron executed for high treason the scottish rebellion had been suppressed nearly eight years and england had during that time enjoyed internal peace when dr cameron fell a victim to his exertions in the cause of the pretender. Dr. Cameron was the brother of the chief of the Highland clan of the same name, and it appears that having studied successively at Glasgow, Edinburgh, Paris and Leyden, he returned to Scotland admirably qualified to practise the profession of medicine to which he had been brought up. Although educated in a manner which rendered him fit to mix in the best society of the day, he took up his residence in the district of Lochaba, where, in a short time, he was married to a lady of respectable family. Universally esteemed, and beloved by his neighbours for his zealous and effectual services in the civilization of the manners of his countrymen, and for his generous conduct in the attendance of the sick poor, he was residing in the bosom of his family when the rebellion of 1745 broke out, which laid waste the country and introduced misery and wretchedness to many a happy home. The chief of the Camerons was a zealous friend to Prince Charles, and although he firmly believed that any attempt at the restoration of the Stuart family to the throne of England must prove abortive, yet being pledged to assist his prince, he generously sacrificed his own feelings, and appeared in arms at the head of nearly twelve hundred men. Thus arrayed, he sent for his brother to undertake the medical charge of his troops, but although the doctor urged every argument which could be raised against so rash an undertaking as that which was proposed, he was at length compelled to forego all further resistance, and to attend the army in his professional capacity, although he absolutely refused to accept any commission. Thus circumstanced, Dr. Cameron was remarkable throughout the whole advance and retreat of the rebel army for the humanity and assiduity with which he attended all, whether friend or foe, who required his aid. And when the Battle of Culloden put an end to all the hopes of the pretender, he and his brother escaped to France in a vessel belonging to that kingdom. While in France the doctor was appointed physician to a French regiment, of which his brother obtained the command, but the latter, dying about two years afterwards, he joined Ogilvy's regiment in Flanders. In the meantime, proceedings had been taken against the rebel leaders in England, many of whom had forfeited their lives to the offended laws of their country, and by an act of attainder passed in the year 1746, for the effectual punishment of persons concerned in the rebellion, the life of Dr. Cameron was declared to be forfeited. In the years 1750 and 1752, subscriptions were entered into in Scotland for the support of those persons who had escaped into foreign countries, and Dr. Cameron, having already more than once visited his native country, finally, in the latter year, came over to Scotland for the purpose of procuring some permanent relief for himself and his suffering fellow countrymen abroad. Rumours were soon set afloat that he was in Scotland, and a detachment of Lord George Beaufort's regiment was sent in search of him. Being made acquainted with the vicinity of his hiding-place, and being unable for a considerable time to discover its exact locality, the soldiers were unable to secure their prisoner, but at length perceiving a little girl, who appeared to be acting as a scout, they followed her until she met a boy, who was evidently employed in a similar capacity, to whom they observed that she whispered something. They directly pursued the boy, but being unable to reach him, 
they presented their guns, threatening to shoot him if he did not immediately stop. Having then secured his person, they menaced him with instant death if he did not inform them of the hiding-place of Dr. Cameron. The boy pointed to the house where he was concealed, and the unfortunate gentleman was directly placed under arrest, and was then immediately sent to Edinburgh, and from thence subsequently to London, where he was placed in confinement in the Tower. Upon his examination before the Privy Council, he denied that he was the person mentioned in the Act of Attainder, but being brought to the bar of the Court of the King's Bench on the 17th of May, he acknowledged that he was the person who had been attained, on which Lord Chief Justice Lee pronounced sentence in the following terms. You, Archibald Cameron of Lochiel, in that part of Great Britain called Scotland, must be removed from hence to His Majesty's prison of the Tower of London, from whence you came, and on Thursday the 7th of June next, your body to be drawn on a sledge, to the place of execution, there to be hanged, but not till you are dead, your bowels to be taken out, your body quartered, your head cut off, and fixed at the King's disposal, and the Lord have mercy on your soul. After his commitment to the Tower he begged to see his wife, who was then at Lille, in Flanders, and on her arrival the meeting between them was inexpressibly affecting. The unfortunate lady wept incessantly, and on going to take her final leave of her husband on the morning of execution, she was attacked with fits, which left her only after grief had deprived her of her senses. On the morning of the 7th of June, 1753, the unhappy man was carried to Tyburn to be executed. He was dressed in a light-coloured coat, red waistcoat and breeches, and a new bag wig. He looked much at the spectators, in the houses and balconies, as well as those in the street, and bowed to several persons with whom he was acquainted. He was attended at the scaffold by a clergyman of the Church of England, and, before his being turned off, he declared that he was at peace with all men, and that he died firmly hoping for the forgiveness of his sins through the merits of his blessed Redeemer. When his body had hung during twenty minutes it was cut down, and the heart was taken out and burned, but the sentence was not further fulfilled. On the following Sunday his remains were interred in a large vault in the Savoy Chapel. Dr. Cameron, it appears, was the last person who suffered punishment on account of connection with the rebellion of Scotland, and of all those who were concerned in it, probably he least of all deserved the unhappy fate which befell him. The very small and apparently unwilling part which he took in the proceedings should have screened him from condign punishment, more especially at a period when all appearance of discontent having vanished, no further harm was to be apprehended. Captain John Lancy, executed for burning his ship. Captain Lancy was a native of Biddeford in Devonshire, and was respectably connected. At an early age he exhibited a predilection for a seafaring life, and having served his apprenticeship, he was employed as mate of a vessel belonging to Mr. Benson, a rich merchant of Biddeford, at that time MP for Barnstable. Having married a sister of Benson's, Lancy was soon advanced to the command of the vessel, and on his return from a voyage he was surprised at receiving an order from his employer to refit as soon as possible, Mr. Benson saying that he would insure the vessel for twice her value, and that Lancy should destroy her. The latter hesitated at first to assent to this extraordinary proposition, and for a time the suggestion was not again mentioned, but another opportunity being afforded to Benson on his brother-in-law dining with him, he plied him with wine, and having pointed out to him the poverty to which his family might be reduced in case of his refusal, by his being dismissed from employment, the unhappy man at length yielded to his persuasions. A ship was now fitted out and bound for Maryland. Goods to a large amount were shipped on board, but re-landed before the vessel sailed, and a lading of brickbats taken in by way of ballast, and the vessel had not been long at sea before a hole was bored in her side, and a cask of combustible ingredients set on fire, with a view to destroy her. The fire no sooner appeared than the captain called to some convicted transports, then in the hold, to inquire if they had fired the vessel, but this appears to have been only a feint to conceal the real design. The boat being hoisted out, all the crew got safely on shore, and then Lancy repaired immediately to Benson to inform him of what had passed. The latter instantly dispatched him to a proctor, before whom he swore that the ship had accidentally taken fire, and that it was impossible to prevent the consequences which followed. The crime was soon afterwards discovered, however, and Lancy was taken into custody. But, secure in his anticipation of protection from Benson, he did not express much concern at this situation, 
His employer, in the meantime, was perfectly aware of the consequences which would fall upon him, and fled to avoid them, and his unhappy dupe, being brought to trial, was capitally convicted, and received sentence of death. He subsequently lay in prison for about four months, during which time he pursued his devotional exercises with the utmost regularity, and was hanged on the 7th of June, 1754, at Execution Dock, in the 27th year of his age. Nicole Brown, executed for the murder of his wife. This malefactor appears to have suffered for a crime as savagely ferocious as it was deliberate. He was a native of Cramond, near Edinburgh, where he was decently educated, and was apprenticed to a butcher. But his taste tending towards a seafaring life, he entered on board a man-of-war as a sailor, and remained in that situation for four years. On his return he married the widow of a respectable butcher, who had left her a decent fortune. Taking to a habit of drinking, he seldom came home sober at night, and his wife following his example, he used frequently to beat her for copying his own crime. This conduct rendered both parties obnoxious to their acquaintance, and the following revolting anecdote of Brown will incontestably prove the unfeeling brutality of his nature. About a week after the execution of Norman Ross, already mentioned, for murder, Brown had been drinking with some company at Leith, till, in the height of their jollity, they boasted what extravagant actions they could perform. Brown swore that he would cut off a piece of flesh from the leg of the dead man and eat it. His companions, drunk as they were, appeared shocked at the very idea, while Brown, to prove that he was in earnest, procured a ladder which he carried to the gibbet, and cutting off a piece of flesh from the leg of the suspended body of Ross, brought it back, broiled, and ate it. The circumstances of the crime for which he was executed were as follow. After having been drinking at an ale-house, in the Canongate he went home at about eleven at night, in a high degree of intoxication. His wife was also much in liquor, but, though equally criminal himself, he was exasperated against her, and struck her so violently that she fell from her chair. The noise of her fall alarmed the neighbours, but, as frequent quarrels had happened between them, no immediate notice was taken of the affair. In about fifteen minutes the wife was heard to cry out, "'Murder! Help! Fire! The rogue is murdering me!' and the neighbours, now apprehending real danger, knocked at the door, but no person being in the house but Brown and his wife, admission was refused. The woman, meantime, was heard to groan most shockingly, and a person looking through the keyhole saw Brown holding his wife to the fire. He was called on to open the door, but he refused to do so, and, the candle being extinguished, and the woman still continuing her cries, the door was at length forced open. When the neighbours went in, they beheld her a most shocking spectacle, lying half-naked before the fire, and her flesh in part broiled. In the interim Brown had got into bed, pretending to be asleep, and when spoken to appeared ignorant of the transaction. The woman, though so dreadfully burnt, retained her senses, and accused her husband of the murder, and told in what manner it was perpetrated. She survived till the following morning, still continuing in the same tale, and then expired in the utmost agony. The murderer was now seized, and being lodged in the jail of Edinburgh, was brought to trial, and capitally convicted. On August 14, 1754, he was attended to the place of execution at Edinburgh by the Reverend Dr. Brown, but to the last he denied having been guilty of the crime for which he suffered. After execution he was hung in chains, but the body was stolen from the gibbet and thrown into a pond, where, being found, it was exposed as before. In a few days, however, it was again stolen, and though a reward was offered for its discovery, it was not again found. Edward Morgan, executed for murder. The circumstances which came out on the trial of Edward Morgan at the Assizes of Glamorgan were these. According to annual custom, he had been invited by Mr. Rees Morgan of Lanvabon, his cousin, to spend the Christmas holidays. He had partaken of the first day's festivity, and retired to bed along with a young man, apprentice to Mr. Rees Morgan. No sooner had he laid his head upon the pillow, to use his own expression, than the devil whispered him to get up and murder the whole family, and he determined to obey. He first made an attempt on the apprentice, his bedfellow, but he struggled so far as to effect his escape, and hid himself. The murderer then provided himself with a knife, which he sharpened on a stone as deliberately as a butcher uses his steel, and thus prepared he softly crept to the bedchamber of his host and hostess, and cut their throats in their sleep. 
he then proceeded to the bed of their beautiful daughter, with whom the monster had but an hour before been sporting and playing, and with equal expedition, and by the same means, robbed her of life. Not satisfied, however, with these deeds of blood, he seized a firebrand, and proceeded to the barn and outhouses, setting fire to them all, and to complete the sum of his crime, he fired the dwelling-house after plundering it of some articles. The Gloucester Journal, of the year 1757, describes the property consumed by fire on this melancholy occasion to have been the dwelling-house, a barn full of corn, a beast-house, with twelve head of cattle in it. It was at first conjectured that the unfortunate people had perished in the conflagration. Their murdered bodies, it is too true, were consumed to ashes, but the manner of their death was subsequently proved, partly by what the concealed apprentice overheard, but chiefly from the murderer's own confession. Morgan was executed at Glamorgan, April the 6th, 1757. End of part 22「23. Of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume 1. By Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 23. The Reverend John Grierson and the Reverend Mr. Wilkinson. Transported for unlawfully performing the marriage ceremony. Among the singular customs of our forefathers, arising in a great measure from their indifference to decorum, one of the most remarkable was matrimony. Solemnised, we were going to say, but the fittest word would be performed, by the parsons in the fleet prison, to which reference has already frequently been made. These clerical functionaries were disreputable and dissolute men, mostly prisoners for debt, who, to the great injury of public morals, dared to insult the dignity of their holy profession by marrying in the precincts of the fleet prison, at a minute's notice, any persons who might present themselves for that purpose. No questions were asked, no stipulations made, except as to the amount of the fee for the service, or the quantity of liquor to be drunk on the occasion. It not unfrequently happened, indeed, that the clergyman, the clerk, the bridegroom, and the bride were drunk at the very time the ceremony was performed. These disgraceful members of the sacred calling had their pliers, or barkers, who, if they caught sight of a man and woman walking together along the streets of the neighbourhood, pestered them, as the Jew clothesmen in the present day tease the passers-by in Hollywell Street, with solicitations not easily to be shaken off, as to whether they wanted a clergyman to marry them. Mr. Byrne, a gentleman who has recently published a curious work on the fleet registers, says he has in his possession an engraving, published about 1747, of a fleet wedding between a brisk young sailor and landlady's daughter at Redriff. The print, he adds, represents the old fleet market and prison, with the sailor, landlady, and daughter, just stepping from a hackney coach, while two fleet parsons in canonicals are contending for the job. The following verses are in the margin. Scarce had the coach discharged its trusty fare, but gaping crowds surround the amorous pair. The busy pliers make a mighty stir, and whispering cry, Do you want the parson, sir? Pray step this way, just to the pen in hand. The doctor's ready there at your command. This way, another cries, sir, I declare, the true and ancient register is here. The alarmed parsons quickly hear the din, and haste with soothing words to invite them in. In this confusion jostled to and fro, the enamoured couple know not where to go, till, slow advancing from the coach's side, the experienced matron came, an artful guide. She led the way without regarding either, and the first parson spliced them both together. One of the most notorious of these scandalous officials was a man of the name of George Keith, a Scotch minister, who, being in desperate circumstances, set up a marriage office in Mayfair, and subsequently in the fleet, and carried on the same trade which has since been practised in front of the blacksmith's anvil at Gretna Green. This man's wedding business was so extensive and so scandalous that the Bishop of London found it necessary to excommunicate him. It has been said of this person and his journeyman that one morning, during the Whitsun holidays, they united a greater number of couples than had been married at any ten churches within the bills of mortality. 
Keith lived till he was eighty-nine years of age and died in 1735. The Reverend Dr. Gaynham, another infamous functionary, was familiarly called the Bishop of Hell. Many of the early fleet weddings, observes Mr. Byrne, were really performed at the Chapel of the Fleet, but as the practice extended, it was found more convenient to have other places within the rules of the fleet, added to which the warden was forbidden, by Act of Parliament, to suffer them, and thereupon many of the fleet parsons and tavern-keepers in the neighbourhood fitted up a room in their respective lodgings or houses as a chapel. The parsons took the fees, allowing a portion to the pliers, etc., and the tavern-keepers, besides sharing in the money paid, derived a profit from the sale of liquors, which the wedding party drank. In some instances the tavern-keepers kept a parson on the establishment, at a weekly salary of twenty shillings. Most of the taverns near the fleet kept their own registers, in which, as well as in their own books, the parsons entered the weddings. Some of these scandalous members of the highest of all professions were in the habit of hanging signs out of their windows with the words, "'Weddings performed cheap here!' Keith, of whom we have already spoken, seems to have been a bare-faced profligate, but there is something exceedingly affecting in the stings of conscience and forlorn compunction of one Walter Wyatt, a fleet parson, in one of whose pocket-books of 1716 are the following secret, as he intended them to be, outpourings of remorse. Give to every man his due, and learn ye the way of truth. This advice cannot be taken by those that are concerned in ye fleet marriages, not so much as ye priests can do, ye thing, yet it is just and right there, unless he designs to starve, for by lying, bullying, and swearing, to extort money from the silly and unwary people, you advance your business, and get ye pelf, which always wastes like snow in sunshiny day. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the marrying in the fleet is the beginning of eternal woe. If a clerk or plier tells a lie, you must vouch it to be as true as ye gospel, and if disputed, you must affirm with an oath to ye truth of a downright damnable falsehood. Virtuous laudator et algeter. Footnote. On Saturday last a fleet parson was convicted before Sir Richard Brocas of forty-three oaths, on the information of a plier for weddings there, for which a warrant was granted to levy four pounds six shillings on the goods of the said parson but upon application to his worship he was pleased to remit one shillings per oath, upon which the plier swore he would swear no more against any man upon the like occasion, finding he could get nothing by it. Grub Street Journal, 20th of July, 1732. End of footnote. May God forgive me what is past, and give me grace to forsake such a wicked place, where truth and virtue can't take place unless you are resolved to starve. But this very man, whose sense of his own disgrace was so deep and apparently so contrite, was one of the most notorious, active, and money-making of all the fleet parsons. His practice was chiefly in taverns, and he has been known to earn nearly sixty pounds in less than a month. With such facilities for marriage, and such unprincipled ministers, it may easily be imagined that iniquitous schemes of all sorts were perpetrated under the name of fleet weddings. The parsons were ready for a bribe, to make false entries in their registers, to antedate weddings, to give fictitious certificates, and to marry persons who would declare only the initials of their names. Thus, if a spinster or widow in debt desired to cheat her creditors by pretending to have been married before the debt was contracted, she had only to present herself at one of the marriage houses in the fleet, and upon payment of a small additional fee to the clergyman, a man could instantly be found on the spot to act as bridegroom for a few shillings, and the worthless chaplain could find a blank place in his register for any year desired, so that there was no difficulty in making the necessary record. They would also, for a consideration, obliterate any given entry. The sham bridegrooms, under different names, were married over and over again, with the full knowledge of the clerical practitioners. If, in other instances, a libertine desired to possess himself of any young and unsuspecting woman who would not yield without being married, Nothing was easier than to get the service performed at the fleet without even the specification of names, so that the poor girl might, with impunity, be shaken off at pleasure. Or, if a parent found it necessary to legitimatise his natural children, a fleet parson, 
could be procured to give a marriage certificate at any required date. In fact, all manner of people presented themselves for marriage at the unholy dens in the fleet taverns, runaway sons and daughters of peers, Irish adventurers and foolish rich widows, clodhoppers and ladies from St. Giles, footmen and decayed beauties, soldiers and servant girls, boys in their teens and old women of seventy, discarded mistresses given away by their former admirers to pitiable and sordid bridegrooms, night wanderers and intoxicated apprentices, men and women having already wives and husbands, young heiresses conveyed thither by force, and compelled in terrorem to be the brides, and common labourers and female paupers dragged by parish officers to the profane altar, stained by the relics of drunken orgies, and reeking with the fumes of liquor and tobacco. Nay, it sometimes happened that the contracting parties would send from houses of vile repute for a fleet parson, who could readily be found to attend even in such places and under such circumstances, and there unite the couple in matrimony. Of what were called the parish weddings, it is impossible to speak in terms of sufficient reprobation. Many of the church wardens and overseers of that day were in the frequent practice of getting up marriages in order to throw their paupers on neighbouring parishes. For example, in the Daily Post of the 4th of July, 1741, is the following paragraph. On Saturday last, the church wardens for a certain parish in the city, in order to remove a load from their own shoulders, gave forty shillings and paid the expense of a fleet marriage to a miserable blind youth, known by the name of Ambrose Talley, who plays on the violin in Moorfields in order to make a settlement on the wife and future family in Shoreditch Parish. To secure their point they sent a parish officer to see the ceremony performed. One cannot but admire the ungenerous proceeding of this city parish, as well as their unjustifiable abetting and encouraging an irregularity so much and so justly complained of as these fleet matches. Invited and uninvited were a great number of poor wretches, in order to spend the bride's parish fortune. In the Grub Street Journal for 1735, the following letter, faithfully describing, says Mr. Byrne, the treachery and low habits of the fleet parsons. Sir, there is a very great evil in this town, and of dangerous consequence to our sex, that has never been suppressed, to the great prejudice and ruin of many hundreds of young people every year, which I beg some of your learned heads to consider of, and consult of proper ways and means to prevent for the future. I mean the ruinous marriages that are practised in the liberty of the fleet and thereabouts, by a set of drunken swearing parsons, with their myrmidons, that wear black coats and pretend to be clerks and registers to the fleet. These ministers of wickedness ply about Ludgate Hill, pulling and forcing people to some peddling alehouse or a brandy shop to be married, even on a Sunday stopping them as they go to church, and almost tearing their clothes off their backs, to confirm the truth of these facts I give you a case or two which lately happened. Since midsummer last a young lady of birth and fortune was deluded and forced from her friends, and by the assistance of a wry-necked swearing parson, married to an atheistical wretch, whose life is a continued practice of all manner of vice and debauchery. And since the ruin of my relation, another lady of my acquaintance had like to have been trepanned in the following manner. This lady had appointed to meet a gentlewoman at the old playhouse in Drury Lane, but extraordinary business prevented her coming. Being alone when the play was done, she bade a boy call a coach for the city. One, dressed like a gentleman, helps her into it, and jumps in after her. "'Madam,' says he, "'this coach was called for me, and since the weather is so bad, and there is no other, I beg leave to bear you company. I am going into the city, and will set you down wherever you please.' The lady begged to be excused, but he bade the coachman drive on. Being come to Ludgate Hill, he told her his sister, who waited his coming but five doors up the court, would go with her in two minutes. He went and returned with his pretended sister, who asked her to step in one minute, and she would wait upon her in the coach. Deluded with the assurance of having his sister's company, the poor lady foolishly followed her into the house, when instantly the sister vanished, and a tawny fellow in a black coat and black wig appeared. "'Madam, you are come in good time. The doctor was just a-going.' "'The doctor,' says she, horribly frightened, fearing it was a madhouse, 
"'What has the doctor to do with me?' "'To marry you to that gentleman. "'The doctor has waited for you these three hours, "'and will be paid by you or that gentleman before you go. "'That gentleman,' says she, recovering herself, "'is worthy a better fortune than mine, "'and begged hard to be gone. "'But Dr. Reinek swore she should be married, "'or if she would not, he would still have his fee, "'and register the marriage from that night. "'The lady, finding she could not escape without money or a pledge, "'told them she liked the gentleman so well she would certainly meet him to-morrow night, and gave him a ring as a pledge which, says she, was my mother's gift on her deathbed, enjoining that if ever I married it should be my wedding ring, by which cunning contrivance she was delivered from the black doctor and his tawny crew. Some time after this I went with this lady and her brother in a coach to Ludgate Hill in the daytime to see the manner of their picking up people to be married. As soon as our coach stopped near Fleet Bridge, up comes one of the Myrmidons, "'Madam,' says he, "'you want a parson?' "'Who are you?' says I. "'I am the clerk and register of the fleet. "'Show me the chapel.' "'At which comes a second, desiring me to go along with him. "'Says he, "'That fellow will carry you to a peddling alehouse.' "'Says a third, "'Go with me. "'He wilt carry you to a brandy shop. "'In the interim comes the doctor. "'Madam,' says he, "'I'll do your job for you presently.' "'Well, gentlemen,' says I, "'since you can't agree, and I can't be married quietly, "'I'll put it off till another time.' So drove away. "'Learned sirs, I wrote this in regard to the honour and safety of my own sex, "'and if, for our sakes, you will be so good as to publish it, "'correcting the errors of a woman's pen, "'you will oblige our whole sex, and none more than, sir, "'your constant reader and admirer, virtuous.' Such are but a few of the iniquities practised by the ministers of the fleet. Similar transactions were carried on at the chapel in Mayfair, the Mint in the Borough, the Savoy, and other places about London, until the public scandal became so great, especially in consequence of the marriage at the fleet of the Honourable Henry Fox, with Georgiana Caroline, eldest daughter of the Duke of Richmond, that at length, not however without much and zealous opposition, a marriage bill was passed enacting that any person solemnising matrimony in any other than a church or public chapel, without bans or licence, should on conviction be adjudged guilty of felony, and be transported for fourteen years, and that all such marriages should be void. This act was to take effect from the 25th of March, 1754. Upon the passing of this law, Keith, the parson who has already been alluded to, published a pamphlet entitled, observations on the act for preventing clandestine marriages to this he prefixed his portrait the following passages are highly characteristic of the man happy is the wooing that is not long a doing is an old proverb and a very true one but we shall have no occasion for it after the twenty-fifth day of march next when we are commanded to read it backwards and from that period fatal indeed to old england we must date the declension of the numbers of the inhabitants of england as I have married many thousands, and consequently have on those occasions seen the humour of the lower class of people, I have often asked the married pair how long they had been acquainted. They would reply, some more, some less, but the generality did not exceed the acquaintance of a week, some only of a day, half a day, etc. Another inconveniency which will rise from this act will be that the expense of being married will be so great that few of the lower class of people can afford for I have often heard a fleet parson say that many have come to be married when they have but had half a crown in their pockets and sixpence to buy a pot of beer, and for which they have pawned some of their clothes. I remember once on a time I was at a public house at Radcliffe, which was then full of sailors and their girls. There was fiddling, piping, jigging and eating. At length one of the tars starts up and says, "'Damn ye, Jack, I'll be married just now. I will have my partner, and—' The joke took, and in less than two hours ten couple set out for the fleet. I stayed their return. They returned in coaches. Five women in each coach, the tars, some running before, others riding on the coach-box, and others behind. The cavalcade being over, the couples went up into an upper room, where they concluded the evening with great jollity. The next time I went that way, I called on my landlord, and asked him concerning this marriage adventure. He at first stared at me, but recollecting, he said— those things were so frequent that he hardly took any notice of them, 
for, added he, it is a common thing, when a fleet comes in, to have two or three hundred marriages in a week's time among the sailors. He humorously concludes, if the present act in the form it now stands should, which I am sure is impossible, be of service to my country, I shall then have the satisfaction of having been the occasion of it, because the compilers thereof have done it with a pure design of suppressing my chapel, which makes me the most celebrated man in this kingdom, though not the greatest. The passing of the Marriage Act put a stop to marriages at Mayfair, but the day before the Act came into operation, Lady Day, 1754, sixty-one couple were married there. Footnote. In a letter to George Montague, Esquire, from Horace Walpole, is the following notice of Keith. Strawberry Hill, 11th June, 1753. I shall only tell you a bon mot of Keith's, the marriage broker, and conclude. God damn the bishops, said he. I beg Miss Montague's pardon. So they will hinder my marrying. Well, let em, but I'll be revenged. I'll buy two or three acres of ground, and by God I'll underbury them all. End of footnote. It would exceed the limits of this brief sketch were we to give the official history of the different scandalous ministers who thus disgraced themselves and impiously trifled with one of our most sacred institutions. That some of these wretched adventurers were merely pretend clergymen is certain, but it cannot be denied that many of them were actually in holy orders. Of this latter class were Grierson and Wilkinson, the subjects of our present notice, and notwithstanding the heavy penalties imposed by the statute, they were not to be deterred from continuing the dangerous and unlawful traffic in which they had been engaged. Wilkinson, who was the brother of a celebrated comedian of the day, it would appear was the owner of a chapel in the Savoy, and Grierson was his assistant, and their proceedings, having at length become too notorious to be passed over, proceedings were instituted against them. Grierson was first apprehended, and his employer sought safety in flight, but supposing that he could not be deemed guilty of any offence, as he had not actually performed the marriage ceremony, a duty which he left to his journeyman, he returned to his former haunts. It was not long before he was secured, however, and having been convicted with Grierson, they were shipped off as convicts together to the colonies in the year 1757. End of part 23「Twenty four of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume One, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part twenty four. William Page, executed for highway robbery. William Page was the son of a respectable farmer at Hampton, and being a lad of promising parts, he was sent to London to be educated under the care of his cousin, a haberdasher. His early life, by the superstitious believers of old sayings, would be adduced as proof positive of the truth of the old adage that a man who is born to be hanged will never be drowned. And although we cannot put much faith generally in such notions, we cannot help in this instance pointing out some peculiarities in the adventures of our hero, which might have been considered by him as a sufficient indication of his fate. The early chronicler of his life says that, during the hard frost in the winter of 1739, Page was sliding with other boys on the canal at St. James's Park when the ice broke under him and he sank, and the ice immediately closing over him, he must have perished. But just at this juncture the ice again broke with another boy near him, and Page arose precisely at the vacancy made by the latter, and was saved, although his companion was drowned. The second instance of the intervention of his good fortune occurred in the summer following this singular escape. Page was then trying to swim with corks in the Thames, when they slipped from under his arms, and he sank, but a waterman got him up, and he soon recovered. On the third occasion he was going up the river on a party of pleasure, about five years afterwards, with several other young fellows, when the boat overset with them in the Chelsea Reach, and every one in the boat was drowned except Page but his fourth and last escape from a watery grave was even more miraculous than any of those which preceded it. About eighteen months after that, which is last related, he was on a voyage to Scotland. The ship in which he sailed foundered in Yarmouth Roads, and most of the people on board perished, but another vessel, observing their distress, sent out a longboat, by the help of which Page and a few others saved their lives. 
To return, however, to the ordinary events of his life, it appears that his cousin, having given him employment in his shop, his vanity prevented him from bestowing that attention on his business to which it was entitled, and his extravagance being checked by his relation, who stopped his pocket-money in order to curb his refined notions, he had recourse to plunder to supply his necessities. Money being repeatedly missed from the till, and all attempts to discover the thief among the servants having failed, suspicion at length rested on our hero, and his guilt having been distinctly proved, he was dismissed from his situation forthwith. An effort which he made to conciliate his relation, after this, proved ineffectual, and his father, who had learned the nature of his irregularities, having refused to render him any assistance, he at length journeyed to York, and there joined a company of strolling players. His exertions in his new capacity were not unsuccessful, but at length, attempting to play Cato while in a state of intoxication, his character in the play and his condition of person were found to agree so badly that he was compelled to be carried from the stage, and was dismissed from his engagement. He afterwards went to Scarborough, where his necessities compelled him to accept a situation as livery servant with a gentleman, but his master having been robbed on his way to town, he formed a notion that highway robbery was an easy and profitable mode of living, and determined that, so soon as he should have the means of starting in the profession, he would become a gentleman of the road. Quitting his master, at the end of twelve months he became acquainted with a woman of abandoned character, in conjunction with whom he took lodgings near Charing Cross, and he then commenced highwayman. His first expedition was on the Kentish Road, and meeting the Canterbury stage near Shooter's Hill, he robbed the passengers of watches and money to the amount of about thirty pounds, and then riding through great part of Kent to take an observation of the crossroads, he returned to London. He now took lodgings near Grosvenor Square, and frequenting billiard-tables won a little money, which, added to his former stock, prevented his having to recourse to the highway again for a considerable time. But at length he met with a gambler, who was more expert than himself, and stripped him of all his money. He then again sought the road as a means of subsistence. His exertions were for some time fruitless, but at length, meeting with a handsome booty, he was emboldened by his success, and taking handsome lodgings he soon gained the friendship of some young men of fashion. His next object was to improve his mind and person, and having gained some knowledge by dint of impudence and through a pleasing exterior, he got introduced into decent society. By this time he had drawn, from his own observation and for his private use, a most curious map of the roads twenty miles round London, and, driving in a phaeton and pair, he was not suspected for a highwayman. In his excursions for robbery he used to dress in a laced or embroidered frock, and wear his hair tied behind, but when at a distance from London he would turn into some unfrequented place, and having disguised himself in other clothes, with a grizzle or black wig, and saddled one of his horses, he would ride to the main road and commit a robbery. This done, he hastened back to the carriage, resumed his former dress, and drove to town again. He was frequently cautioned to be on his guard against a highwayman who might meet and rob him. No, no, said he, he cannot do it a second time unless he robs me of my coat and shirt, for he has taken all my money already. He had once an escape of a very remarkable kind. Having robbed a gentleman near Putney, some persons came up at the juncture, and pursued him so closely that he was obliged to cross the Thames for his security. In the interim, some haymakers, crossing the field where Page's carriage was left, found and carried off his gay apparel, and the persons who had pursued him, meeting them, charged them with being accomplices in the robbery. A report of this affair being soon spread, Page heard of it, and throwing his clothes into a well, he went back almost naked, claimed the carriage as his own, and declared that the men had stripped him and had thrown him into a ditch. All the parties now went before a justice of the peace, and the maker of the carriage appearing, and declaring that it was the property of Mr. Page, the poor haymakers were committed for trial, but obtained their liberty after the next assizes, as Page did not appear to prosecute. After this he made no farther use of the phaeton as a disguise for his robberies, but it served him occasionally on parties of pleasure, which he sometimes took with a girl whom he had then in keeping. Page was passionately fond of play, and his practice this way was occasionally attended with good fortune. One night he went to the masquerade with only ten guineas, but joining a party at cards, he won above five hundred pounds, but this money was no sooner in his possession 
than a lady, most magnificently dressed, made some advances to him, on which he put the most favourable construction. After some conversation, she told him that her mother was a widow who would not admit of his visits, but that possibly he might prevail on her attendant, whose husband was a reputable tradesman, to give them admission to her house. Page, who had repeatedly heard the other address her by the title of My Lady, became very importunate with the good woman to grant this favour, and at length, all parties having agreed, the servants were called. Page handed the lady and her attendant into a coach, on which was the coronet of a viscountess. Two footmen with flambeau got up behind, and the coachman was ordered to drive home. The home, which they reached, however, was a brothel, and on the lady quitting him in the morning, he found that she had been dexterous enough to rob him of his pocket-book and its contents, which no doubt more than compensated her for the favour which she had bestowed upon him. The road and the gaming-table were now his only means of support, and he found a fitting companion in his proceedings in the person of an old schoolfellow named Darwell, in conjunction with whom, in the course of three years, he committed upwards of three hundred robberies. At length, however, their iniquitous proceedings caused an active search to be made for them, and Darwell, being apprehended, peached upon his companion, and disclosed the places where it was most likely that he would be found. The consequence was that Page was apprehended at the Golden Lion, near Hyde Park, when three loaded pistols were found on him, with powder-balls, a wig to disguise himself, and the correct map of the roads round London, which we have already mentioned. He was sent to Newgate, and an advertisement inserted in the papers, requesting such persons as had been robbed to attend his re-examination, but he denied all that was alleged against him, and, as he was always disguised when he committed any robbery, no person present could identify his person. He was tried at length on suspicion of robbing Mr. Webb in Belford Lane, but acquitted for want of evidence, and after this he was tried at Hartford, but again acquitted for like reason. From Hartford he was removed to Maidstone Jail, and being tried at Rochester for robbing Captain Farrington on Blackheath, he was capitally convicted, and received sentence of death. After conviction he acknowledged his guilt, yet exerted himself in the most strenuous manner to procure a pardon. He wrote to a nobleman with this view, and also sent a letter to a gentleman with whom he had lived as a servant, begging his interest that he might be sent to America as a foot-soldier. But his endeavours proved fruitless, and he was ordered for execution. This extraordinary malefactor suffered at Maidstone on the 6th of April, 1758. Eugene Aram, executed for murder. We are now arrived at that period which brings to our view perhaps the most remarkable trial in our whole calendar. The offender was a man of extraordinary endowments and of high education, and therefore little to be suspected of committing so foul a crime as that proved against him. Much has been written upon the subject of this murder, and attempts have been made even of late years to show the innocence of Aram. The contents of the publications upon the subject would be sufficient of themselves to fill our volumes, and it would be useless to republish arguments which, having had due circulation and due consideration, have failed in their object, which was to convince the world that this offender was the victim of prejudice, and fell an innocent sacrifice to the laws of his country. We shall therefore abstain from giving this case greater space in our calendar than that to which it is entitled, as well on account of the peculiarity of its nature, as of the great interest which its mention has always excited. The peculiarities of the case are twofold. First, the great talents of the offender, and secondly, the extraordinary discovery of the perpetration of the murder, and of the evidence which led to the conviction of the murderer. On the former point, indeed, some seem to have entertained a doubt, for about thirty years after his execution, his name being inserted among the literary characters of the country in the Biographia Britannica, and his high erudition being mentioned, a pamphlet was put forth complaining of this step on the part of the editors of that work, and accusing them of a want of impartiality in affording their need of praise to Aram, and withholding it from Bishop Atherton, who also met with an ignominious death. The charge was, however, answered more ably than it was made, and as it may prove interesting to our readers, we shall subjoin the refutation to the complaint, which appears distinctly to support Aram's right to the character which was originally given to him. It said, 
Objections are made to the admission of Eugene Aram to the Biographia Britannica and the exclusion of Bishop Atherton, but it appears to me that the remarks on this subject are far from being just. The insertion of Aram is objected to because he was a man of bad principles, and terminated his life on the gallows, but it should be remembered that it was never understood that in the Biographia Britannica the lives of virtuous men only were to be recorded. In the old edition are the lives of several persons who ended their days by the hands of the executioner. Bonner was not a virtuous man, and yet very properly inserted, as well as Henry Cuff, who was executed at Tyburn in the reign of Queen Elizabeth. As to Eugene Aram, it is truly said of him, in the Biographia Britannica, in the article objected to, that the progress he made in literature, allowing for the little instruction he had received, may justly be considered as astonishing, and that his powers of mind were uncommonly great, cannot reasonably be questioned. Eugene Aram possessed talents and acquisitions that might have classed him among the most respectable of human characters, if his moral qualities had been equal to his intellectual. It was certainly the extraordinary talents and acquirements of Eugene Aram which occasioned his introduction into the Biographia, and I know that by persons of undoubted taste and judgment the account of him in that work has been thought a curious and interesting article. His singular defence alone was well worthy of being preserved in such a work. With respect to Bishop Atherton, he never had the least claim to insertion in such a work as the Biographia Britannica, and was therefore very properly omitted in the new edition. He was not in the least distinguished for genius or learning, his merely being a bishop could give him no just pretensions, and still less the unnatural crime for which he suffered. The friends of Bishop Atherton say that his reputation was suspected to have been destroyed, and his catastrophe effected more by the contrivance of a party than by the aggravated guilt with which he was charged. If this were perfectly just, which, however, may be reasonably questioned, it would not give Bishop Atherton the least claim to insertion in the Biographia Britannica. Aram was inserted on account of his uncommon talents and learning, but Atherton, who was not distinguished for either, never had the least pretension to be recorded in such a work. The talents and abilities of this criminal, therefore, seem to be undoubted, but that a man possessing powers of intellect so great should have been guilty of such a crime as that which he committed seems most extraordinary. Within the second peculiarity of the case will very properly come the narrative of the life of its hero, as well as the circumstances attending the commission of the crime and the discovery of its perpetrator. A succinct description of the case will probably be more intelligible than a detail of all of the exceedingly minute circumstances by which it was surrounded. Eugene Aram was born in the village of Netherdale, in Yorkshire, in the year 1704, of an ancient and highly respectable family. But although it is shown by the chronicles that one of his ancestors served the office of High Sheriff in the reign of Edward III, it appears that at the time of the birth of Eugene, the vicissitudes of fortune had so far reduced its rank that his father was compelled to support himself and his children by working as a gardener in the house of Sir Edward Blackett although in that situation he was well employed and highly respected. In his infancy Aram's parents removed to the village of Shelton, near Newby, in the same county, and when about six years old his father, having saved a small sum of money out of his weekly earnings, purchased a small cottage at Bondgate near Ripon. The first indications of that singular genius, which afterwards displayed itself in so remarkable a manner in our hero, were given while his father was in the service of Sir Edward. Eugene was employed as an attendant upon that gentleman, and he early displayed a taste for literature, which was fostered and supported by his indulgent master. His disposition was solitary, and every leisure hour which presented itself to him was devoted to retirement and study, and in the employment which good fortune had bestowed upon him, ample opportunities were afforded him of following the bent of his inclinations. He applied himself chiefly to mathematics, and at the age of sixteen he had acquired a considerable proficiency in them, but his kind and indulgent master dying about this time, he was employed by his brother, Mr. Christopher Blackett, a merchant in London, who took him into his service as bookkeeper. This was an occupation ill-suited to his desires, and an attack of the smallpox 
having rendered his return to Yorkshire necessary, he did not afterwards resume his employment in London, but at the invitation of his father he remained at Newby to pursue his studies. He now found that the study of mathematics possessed but few charms, and the politer subjects of poetry, history, and antiquities next engaged his attention. Every day served to increase the store of knowledge which he possessed, and his fame as a scholar, having now extended to his native place, he was invited to take charge of a school there. The means of study and of profit appeared to him to be thus united, and he immediately accepted the offer which was made, and after a short time he married a young woman of the village, to whom he appeared tenderly attached. To this marriage, however, which proved unhappy, he attributed all his subsequent misfortunes, but whether with truth or not, the course of the narrative does not distinctly disclose. His deficiency in the learned languages now struck him, and he immediately set about conquering the difficulties which presented themselves in this new field of research, and so rapid was his progress, that ere a year had passed he was able to read with ease the less difficult of the Latin and Greek historians and poets. In the year 1734 an opportunity was afforded him of adding a knowledge of the Hebrew language to his list of acquirements, for in that year Mr. William Norton of Knaresborough, a gentleman of great talents, who had conceived a strong attachment towards him, invited him to his house, and afforded him the means necessary for pursuing its study. He continued in his situation in Yorkshire until the year 1745, when he again visited London, and accepted an engagement in the school of the Reverend Mr. Plainblank, in Piccadilly, as usher in Latin and writing, and with this gentleman's assistance he acquired the knowledge of the French language. He was afterwards employed as an usher and tutor in several different parts of England, in the course of which, through his own exertions, he became acquainted with heraldry and botany, and so great was his perseverance that he also learned the Chaldaic and Arabic languages. His next step was to investigate the Celtic in all its dialects, and having begun to form collections and make comparisons between the Celtic, the English, the Latin, the Greek, and the Hebrew, and found a great affinity between them, he resolved to proceed through all those languages, and to form a comparative lexicon. But amid these learned labours and inquiries, it appears that he committed a crime which could not naturally have been expected from a man of so studious a turn, as the inducement which led him to it was merely the gain of wealth, of which the scholar is seldom covetous. On the 8th of February, in 1745, in conjunction with a man named Richard Houseman, he committed the murder, for which his life was afterwards forfeited to the laws of his country. The object of this diabolical crime was Daniel Clark, a shoemaker, living at Knaresborough, and it appears that this unfortunate man, having lately married a woman of a good family, industriously circulated a report that his wife was entitled to a considerable fortune, which he should soon receive. Aram and Houseman, in consequence, conceiving hopes of procuring some advantage from this circumstance, persuaded Clark to make an ostentatious show of his own riches, in order to induce his wife's relations to give him that fortune of which he had boasted. It is not impossible that in giving their subsequent victim this advice, they may at the time have acted from a spirit of friendship, and any intention of committing that crime for which they afterwards received their reward, but the belief that the design was already formed receives equal confirmation from subsequent events. Clark, it seems, was easily induced to comply with a hint so agreeable to his own desires, and he borrowed and brought on credit a large quantity of silver plate with jewels, watches, rings, etc. He told the persons of whom he purchased that a merchant in London had sent him an order to buy such plate for exportation, and no doubt was entertained of his credit till his sudden disappearance in February 1745, when it was imagined that he had gone abroad, or at least to London, to dispose of his ill-acquired property. Whatever doubt may exist as to the original intention of the parties, their object at this time is perfectly clear, and there can be no hesitation in supposing that Aram and Houseman had at this time determined to murder their dupe, in order to share the booty. On the night of the 8th of February, 1745, they persuaded Clark to take a walk with them, in order to consult upon the proper method to dispose of the effects, and engaged in the discussion of this subject they turned into a field, at a small distance from the town, well known by the name of St. Robert's Cave. 
On arrival there, Aram and Clark went over a hedge towards the cave, and when they had got within six or seven yards of it, Houseman, by the light of the moon, saw Aram strike Clark several times, and at length beheld him fall, but never saw him afterwards. These were the facts immediately connected with the murder, which were proved at the trial by Houseman, who was admitted King's evidence, and whatever were the subsequent proceedings of the parties in respect of the body, they must remain a mystery. The murderers going home shared Clark's ill-gotten treasure, the half of which Houseman concealed in his garden for a twelve-month, and then took it to Scotland, where he sold it. In the meantime Aram carried his share to London, where he sold it to a Jew, and then returned to his engagement with Mr. Plainblank in Piccadilly. Fourteen years afterwards elapsed, and no tidings being received of Aram, it was concluded that he was dead, and these fourteen years had also elapsed without any clue being obtained to unravel the mystery of the sudden disappearance of Clark. The time at length came, however, at which all the doubts which existed upon both subjects were to be solved. In the year 1758, a labourer named Jones was employed to dig for stone in St. Robert's Cave, in order to supply a lime-kiln at a place called Thistle Hill, near Knaresborough, and having dug about two feet deep, he found the bones of a human body, still knit together by the ligaments of the joints. It had evidently been buried double, and there were indications about it which could not but lead to the supposition that some unfair means had been resorted to in order to deprive the living being of life. The incident afforded good grounds for general curiosity being raised, and general inquiry taking place, and hints were soon thrown out that it might be the body of Clark, whose unexpected disappearance was still fresh in the memory of many, and whose continued absence had been the subject of so much surprise. Suggestions of his murder, which had been thrown out by Aram's wife, were called to mind, and a coroner's inquest being held, she was summoned. By this time a general impression prevailed that the remains found were those of Clark, and the testimony of Mrs. Aram greatly confirmed the idea which had gone abroad. She deposed that she believed that Clark had been murdered by Houseman and her husband, and that they had acquired considerable booty for the crime, but she was unable to give any account of her husband, or to state whether he was still in existence or not. Inquiries being made, however, Houseman was soon found, and on his being brought forward to be examined, he exhibited the most utmost confusion. The coroner desired that he would take up one of the bones, probably with a view of seeing what effect such a proceeding would produce, and upon his doing so he showed still further terror, and exclaimed, "'This is no more Daniel Clark's bone than it is mine!' The suspicions which were already entertained of his guilt were, in a great measure, confirmed by this observation, and it was generally believed that he knew the precise spot where the real remains of the murdered man were deposited, even if he had not been a party to their interment. He was therefore strictly questioned, and after many attempts at evasion, he said that Clark was murdered by Eugene Aram, and that his body was buried in St. Robert's Cave, but that the head lay further to the right in the turn near the entrance of the cavern than the spot where the skeleton produced was found. Search was immediately made, and a skeleton was found, in a situation corresponding exactly with that which had been pointed out. In consequence of this confession, an inquiry was immediately set on foot for Aram, and after a considerable time he was discovered, occupying the situation of Usher, in a school at Lynn, in Norfolk. He was immediately apprehended and conveyed in custody to York Castle, and on the 13th of August, 1759, he was brought to trial at the Assizes before Mr. Justice Noel. The testimony of Houseman to the facts which we have described, and of the other witnesses, whose evidence was of a corroborative character, was then adduced, and from the proof which was given it appeared that the share of plunder derived by the prisoner did not exceed one hundred and fifty pounds. Aram's defence was both ingenious and able, and would not have disgraced any of the best lawyers of the day. It is a curious and interesting address, and we subjoin it, as affording the best criterion of the talents of the prisoner which can well be adduced. He thus addressed the court. My lord, I know not whether it is of right, or through some indulgence of your lordship, that I am allowed the liberty at this bar, and at this time, to attempt a defence, incapable and uninstructed as I am to speak. Since, while I see so many eyes upon me, so numerous and awful a concourse, fixed with attention and filled with I know not what expectancy, I labour not with guilt, my lord, but with perplexity 
for having never seen a court but this, being wholly unacquainted with law, the customs of the bar, and all judiciary proceedings, I fear I shall be so little capable of speaking with propriety in this place, that it exceeds my hope if I shall be able to speak at all. I have heard, my lord, the indictment read, wherein I find myself charged with the highest crime, with an enormity I am altogether incapable of, a fact to the commission of which there goes far more insensibility of heart, more profligacy of morals, than ever fell to my lot, and nothing possibly could have admitted a presumption of this nature, but a depravity not inferior to that imputed to me. However, as I stand indicted at your lordship's bar, and have heard what is called evidence adduced in support of such a charge, I very humbly solicit your lordship's patience, and beg the hearing of this respectable audience, while I, single and unskilful, destitute of friends, and unassisted by counsel, say something, perhaps like argument, in my defence. I shall consume but little of your lordship's time. What I have to say will be short, and this brevity, probably, will be the best part of it. However, it is offered with all possible regard, and the greatest submission to your lordship's consideration, and that of this honourable court. First, my lord, the whole tenor of my conduct in life contradicts every particular of the indictment. Yet, had I never said this, did not my present circumstances extort it from me, and seem to make it necessary? Permit me here, my lord, to call upon malignity itself, so long and cruelly busied in this prosecution, to charge upon me any immorality of which prejudice was not the author. No, my lord, I concerted no schemes of fraud, projected no violence, injured no man's person or property. My days were honestly laborious, my nights intensely studious, and I humbly conceive my notice of this, especially at this time, will not be thought impertinent or unseasonable, but at least deserving some attention, because, my lord, that any person, after a temperate use of life, a series of thinking and acting regularly, and without one single deviation from sobriety, should plunge into the very depth of profligacy precipitately and at once, is altogether improbable and unprecedented, and absolutely inconsistent with the course of things. Mankind is never corrupted at once. Villainy is always progressive, and declines from right, step by step, till every regard of probity is lost and every sense of all moral obligation totally perishes. Again, my lord, a suspicion of this kind, which nothing but malevolence could entertain, and ignorance propagate, is violently opposed by my very situation at that time with respect to health, for, but a little space before, I had been confined to my bed, and suffered under a very long and severe disorder, and was not able for half a year together so much as to walk. The distemper left me indeed, yet slowly, and in part, but so macerated, so enfeebled, that I was reduced to crutches, and so far from being well about the time I am charged with this fact, I have never, to this day, perfectly recovered. Could, then, a person in this condition take anything into his head so unlikely, so extravagant? I, past the vigour of my age, feeble and valetudinary, with no inducement to engage, no ability to accomplish, no weapon wherewith to perpetrate such a deed, without interest, without power, without motive, without means. Besides, it must needs occur to every one that an action of this atrocious nature is never heard of, but when its springs are laid open. It appears that it was to support some indolence, or supply some luxury, to satisfy some avarice, or oblige some malice, to prevent some real or imaginary want. Yet I lay not under the influence of these. Surely, my lord, I may consistently, with both truth and modesty, affirm thus much, and none who have any veracity and knew me will ever question this. In the second place, the disappearance of Clark is suggested as an argument of his being dead, but the uncertainty of such an inference from that, and the fallibility of all conclusions of such a sort from such a circumstance, are too obvious and too notorious to require instances, yet superseding many permit me to produce a very recent one, and that afforded by this castle. In June 1757, William Thompson, for all the vigilance of this place, in open daylight and double-ironed, made his escape, and notwithstanding an immediate inquiry set on foot, the strictest search, and all advertisement, was never heard of since. If, then, Thompson got off unseen, through all these difficulties, how very easy it was for Clark, 
when none of them opposed him. But what would be thought of a prosecution commenced against any one seen last with Thompson? Permit me, my lord, to observe a little upon the bones which have been discovered. It is said, which perhaps is saying very far, that these are the skeleton of a man. It is possible, indeed, it may, but is there any certain known criterion which incontestably distinguishes the sex in human bones? Let it be considered, my lord, whether the ascertaining of this point ought not to precede any attempt to identify them. The place of their depositum, too, claims much more attention than is commonly bestowed upon it, for of all the places in the world none could have mentioned any one wherein there was greater certainty of finding human bones than a hermitage, except he should point out a churchyard. Hermitages, in time past, being not only places of religious retirement, but of burial too, and it has scarce or never been heard of, but that every cell now known contains or contained these relics of humanity, some mutilated and some entire. I do not inform, but give me leave to remind your lordship, that here sat solitary sanctity, and here the hermit, or the anchoress, hoped that repose for their bones when dead they here enjoyed when living." All the while, my lord, I am sensible that this is known to your lordship, and many in this court, better than to me, but it seems necessary to my case that others, who have not at all, perhaps, adverted to things of this nature, and may have concern in my trial, should be made acquainted with it. Suffer me, then, my lord, to produce a few of many evidences that these cells were used as repositories of the dead, and to enumerate a few in which human bones have been found as it happened in this question, lest to some that the accident might seem extraordinary, and consequently occasion prejudice. One, the bones, as was supposed, of the Saxon saint Dubritius, were discovered buried in his cell at Guy's Cliff, near Warwick, as appears from the authority of Sir William Dugdale. Two, the bones, thought to be those of the anchoress Rosia, were but lately discovered in a cell at Royston, entire, fair, and undecayed, though they must have lain interred for several centuries, as is proved by Dr. Stukeley. Three, but my own country, nay, almost this neighbourhood, supplies another instance, for in January 1747 were found by Mr. Stovin, accompanied by a reverend gentleman, the bones in part of some recluse in the cell at Lindholm, near Hatfield. They were believed to be those of William of Lindholm, a hermit, who had long made this cave his habitation. 4. In February 1744, part of Woburn Abbey being pulled down, a large portion of corpse appeared, even with the flesh on, and which bore cutting with a knife, though it is certain that this had lain above two hundred years, and how much longer is doubtful, for this abbey was founded in 1145, and dissolved in 1538 or 1539. What would have been said, what believed, if this had been an accident to the bones in question? Father, my lord, it is not yet out of living memory, that at a little distance from Knaresborough, in a field, part of the manor of the worthy and patriot baronet, who does that borough the honour to represent it in Parliament, were found in digging for gravel, not one human skeleton only, but five or six, deposited side by side, with each an urn placed under its head, as your lordship knows, was usual in ancient interments. About the same time, and in another field, almost close to this borough, was discovered also in searching for gravel another human skeleton, but the piety of the same worthy gentleman ordered both pits to be filled up again, commendably unwilling to disturb the dead. Is the invention of these bones forgotten, then, or industriously concealed, that the discovery of those in question may appear more singular and extraordinary? whereas in fact there is nothing extraordinary in it. My lord, almost every place conceals such remains. In fields, in hills, in highway sides, in commons, lie frequent and unsuspected bones, and our present allotments for rest for the departed are but of some centuries. Another particular seems not to claim a little of your lordship's notice, and that of the gentlemen of the jury, which is that perhaps no example occurs of more than one skeleton being found in one cell, and in the cell in question was found but one, agreeable in this to the peculiarity of every other known cell in Britain. Not the invention of one skeleton, but of two, would have appeared suspicious and uncommon, 
but it seems another skeleton has been discovered by some labourer, which was full as confidently averred to be Clark's as this. My lord, must some of the living, if it promotes some interest, be made answerable for all the bones that earth has concealed and chance exposed? And might not a place where bones lay be mentioned by a person by chance, as well as found by a labourer by chance? Or is it more criminal accidentally to name where bones lie than accidentally to find where they lie? Here too is a human skull produced, which is fractured. But was this the cause, or was it the consequence of death? Was it owing to violence, or was it the effect of natural decay? If it was violence, was that violence before or after death? My lord, in May 1732 the remains of William, Lord Archbishop of this province, were taken up by permission in this cathedral, and the bones of the skull were found broken. Yet certainly he died by no violence offered to him alive that could occasion the fracture there. Let it be considered, my lord, that upon the dissolution of religious houses and the commencement of the Reformation, the ravages of those times affected both the living and the dead. In search after imaginary treasures, coffins were broken up, graves and vaults dug open, monuments ransacked, and shrines demolished, and it ceased about the beginning of the reign of Queen Elizabeth. I entreat your lordship, suffer not the violence, the depredations, and the iniquities of those times to be imputed to this. Moreover, what gentleman here is ignorant that Knaresborough had a castle, which, though now a ruin, was once considerable both for its strength and garrison? All know it was vigorously besieged by the arms of the Parliament, at which siege, in sallies, conflicts, fights, pursuits, many fell in all the places round it, and where they fell were buried. For every place, my lord, is burial earth in war, and many, questionless of these, rest yet unknown, whose bones futurity shall discover. I hope, with all imaginable submission, that what has been said will not be thought impertinent to this indictment, and that it will be far from the wisdom, the learning, and the integrity of this place, to impute to the living what zeal in its fury may have done, what nature may have taken off, and piety interred, or what war alone may have destroyed, alone deposited. As to the circumstances that have been raked together, I have nothing to observe but that all circumstances, whatever, are precarious, and have been but too frequently found lamentably fallible. Even the strongest have failed. They may rise to the utmost degree of probability, yet they are but probability still. Why need I name to your lordship the two Harrisons recorded by Dr. Howell, who both suffered upon circumstances because of the sudden disappearance of their lodger, who was in credit, had contracted debts, borrowed money, and went off unseen, and returned a great many years after their execution? Why name the intricate affair of Jacques de Moulin under King Charles the Second, related by a gentleman who was counsel for the Crown? And why the unhappy Coleman, who suffered innocently, though convicted upon positive evidence, and whose children perished for want, because the world uncharitably believed the father guilty? Why mention the perjury of Smith, incautiously admitted King's evidence, who, to screen himself, equally accused Faircloth and Loveday, of the murder of Dunn, the first of whom in 1749 was executed at Winchester, and Loveday was about to suffer at Reading, had not Smith been proved perjured to the satisfaction of the court by the governor of Gosport Hospital. Now, my lord, having endeavoured to show that the whole of this process is altogether repugnant to every part of my life, that it is inconsistent with my condition of health about that time, that no rational inference can be drawn that a person is dead who suddenly disappears, that hermitages are the constant depositories of the bones of a recluse, that the proofs of this are well authenticated, that the revolutions in religion or the fortunes of war have mangled or buried the dead, the conclusion remains, perhaps, no less reasonable than impatiently wished for. I, at last, after a year's confinement, equal to either fortune, put myself upon the justice, the candour, and the humanity of your lordship, and upon yours, my countrymen, gentlemen of the jury. The delivery of this address created a very considerable impression in court, but the learned judge having calmly, and with great perspicuity, summed up the evidence which had been produced, and having observed upon the prisoner's defence, which he declared to be one of the most ingenious pieces of reasoning that had ever fallen under his notice, the jury, with a little hesitation, returned a verdict of guilty. Sentence of death was then passed upon the prisoner, who received the intimation of his fate 
with becoming resignation. After his conviction, he confessed the justice of his sentence to two clergymen who were directed to attend him, a sufficient proof of the fruitlessness of the efforts to prove him innocent, which the morbid sentimentality of late writers has induced them to attempt. Upon an inquiry being made of him as to his reason for committing the crime, he declared that he had reason to suspect Clark of having had unlawful intercourse with his wife, and that at the time of his committing the murder he had thought that he was acting rightly, but that he had since thought that his crime could not be justified or excused. In the hopes of avoiding the ignominious death which he was doomed to suffer, on the night before his execution he attempted to commit suicide by cutting his arm in two places with a razor which he had concealed for that purpose. This attempt was not discovered until the morning, when the jailer came to lead him forth to the place of execution, and he was then found almost expiring from loss of blood. A surgeon was immediately sent for, who found that he had wounded himself severely on the left arm, above the elbow and near the wrist, but he had missed the artery, and his life was prolonged only in order that it might be taken away on the scaffold. When he was placed on the drop, he was perfectly sensible, but was too weak to be able to join in devotion with the clergyman who attended him. He was executed at York on the 16th of August, 1759, and his body was afterwards hung in chains in Knaresborough Forest. The following papers were afterwards found in his handwriting on the table in his cell. The first contained reasons for his attempt upon his life, and was as follows. What am I better than my father's? To die is natural and is necessary. Perfectly sensible of this, I fear no more to die than I did to be born. But the manner of it is something which should, in my opinion, be decent and manly. I think I have regarded both these points. Certainly no man has a better right to dispose of a man's life than himself and he, not others, should determine how. As for any indignities offered to my body, or silly reflections on my faith and morals, they are, as they always were, things indifferent to me. I think, though contrary to the common way of thinking, I wrong no man by this, and I hope it is not offensive to that eternal being that formed me and the world, and as by this I injure no man, no man can be reasonably offended. I solicitously recommend myself to that eternal and almighty being, the God of nature, if I have done amiss. But perhaps I have not, and I hope this thing will never be imputed to me. Though I am now stained by malevolence and suffer by prejudice, I hope to rise fair and unblemished. My life was not polluted, my morals irreproachable, and my opinions orthodox. I slept sound till three o'clock, awakened, and then writ these lines. Come, pleasing rest, eternal slumbers fall, Seal mine, that once must seal the eyes of all, Calm and compose my soul, her journey takes, No guilt that troubles, and no heart that aches. Adieu, thou sun, all bright, like her arise, Adieu, fair friends, and all that's good and wise. The second was in the form of a letter, addressed to a former companion, and was in the following terms. My dear friend, before this reaches you, I shall be no more a living man in this world, though at present in perfect bodily health, but who can describe the horrors of mind which I suffer at this instant? Guilt. The guilt of blood shed without any provocation, without any cause but that of filthy lucre, pierces my conscience with wounds that give the most poignant pains. Tis true the consciousness of my horrid guilt has given me frequent interruptions in the midst of my business or pleasures, but yet I have found means to stifle its clamours, and contrived a momentary remedy for the disturbance it gave me, by applying to the bottle, or the bowl, or diversions, or company, or business, sometimes one, and sometimes the other, as opportunity offered. But now all these, and all other amusements, are at an end, and I am left forlorn, helpless, and destitute of every comfort, for I have nothing now in view but the certain destruction, both of my soul and body, my conscience will now no longer suffer itself to be hoodwinked or browbeat. It has now got the mastery. It is my accuser, judge, and executioner, and the sentence it pronounceth against me is more dreadful than that I heard from the bench, which only condemned my body to the pains of death, which are soon over, but conscience tells me plainly that she will summon me before another tribunal, where I shall have neither power nor means to stifle the evidence she will there bring against me and that the sentence which will then be denounced will not only be irreversible, 
but will condemn my soul to torments that will know no end. Oh, had I but hearkened to the advice which dear broad experience has enabled me to give, I should not now have been plunged into that dreadful gulf of despair which I find it impossible to extricate myself from, and therefore my soul is filled with horror inconceivable. I see both God and man my enemies, and in a few hours shall be exposed a public spectacle for the world to gaze at. Can you conceive any condition more horrible than mine? Oh, no, it cannot be. I am determined, therefore, to put a short end to trouble I am no longer able to bear, and prevent the executioner by doing his business with my own hand, and shall by this means at least prevent the shame and disgrace of a public exposure, and leave the care of my soul in the hands of eternal mercy. Wishing you all health, happiness, and prosperity, I am to the last moment of my life yours, with the sincerest regard. Eugene Aram it is impossible to view the circumstances of this remarkable case without being struck with the extraordinary conduct of Aram. It is most singular that a man of his talents and mind should have leagued himself with a person like Houseman, who appears to have been utterly uneducated, in the commission of a murder, and with the hope only of gain, for whatever his declarations after his conviction may have been, as to his object being revenge only for the supposed injury which had been done him by his victim in the seduction of his wife his ready acquiescence of the plot with another, and his willing acceptance of the plunder which was obtained, distinctly show that that was not the only end which he sought to attain. If, indeed, his feelings were outraged, as he suggested, he would have selected some other mode of obtaining that satisfaction to which the injury alleged would have entitled him, and it is hardly to be supposed that he would have obtained the assistance of another to secure the object which he had in view, more particularly when it appears that it was he who absolutely committed the foul act, without the immediate aid of Houseman, a circumstance which clearly exemplifies the power which he possessed to dispose of his victim, and which would seem to show a desire on his part only to obtain the participation of another in a preconceived act, anticipating doubtless that some aid would be necessary in appropriating and disposing of the property which might be procured from the deceased, and also that some advice would be requisite in the event of suspicion attaching to him. But while these circumstances cannot but surprise us, how much more astonishing is the divine power of providence, which disclosed to human eyes, after so long a lapse of time, such evidence as in the result proved the commissions of the crime, and which secured the seizure of the criminal, who had up to that time remained unsuspected, and who even then was living in fancied security, free from all fear of discovery and apprehension. It is said that murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. And how truly is this observation of the most wonderful of poets exemplified by nearly every page of these records of crime? End of part 24 Part 25 of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume 1, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 25 William Andrew Horn, Esquire, Executed for Murder The short notice which we give of this man exhibits a human being reduced far below the level of a beast. The subject of the memoir was the eldest son of a gentleman of fortune in Nottinghamshire, who in vain strove to instil into the mind of his son any of those principles of rectitude without which a man cannot be considered to be humanised. The sports of the field, and all the dissipation which a country squire could at that time obtain, formed the amusements of this reckless youth. His passion for women was unbounded, but his love of gold surpassed all the other bad qualities which so peculiarly distinguished him. It was while his father yet lived that he committed that crime for which his life was eventually forfeited, and it appears to have occurred in the following manner. His passion for women led him to commit the most disgusting excesses, and at length so far he had carried his crimes that an incestuous connection took place between him and his sister, the result of which was the birth of a boy in the month of February 1724. Horn told his brother Charles of the circumstance three days afterwards, and at ten o'clock at night said that he must take a ride with him, 
he then put the new-born infant in a bag, and, mounting their horses, they rode to Annesley in Nottinghamshire, at the distance of five miles, carrying the child alternately. On their arrival near the village, William dismounted and inquired if the child was living, and, being answered in the affirmative, he took it and told his brother to wait till he came back. On his return, Charles demanded to know how he had disposed of the infant, to which he said he had placed it behind a haystack and covered it with hay. They then returned home, and it was afterwards learned that the child died in the course of the night from exposure to the cold, but in a short time afterwards a quarrel arising between the brothers, the whole transaction was communicated by Charles to his father. The latter enjoined him to the strictest secrecy, and this injunction was obeyed up to the time of the old man's death, which occurred in the year 1747, in the one hundred and second year of his age. The real estate of the family being entailed, then descended to the eldest son, but the father had previously made over his personal property by deed of gift to his son Charles. No sooner had the new squire assumed the government of the estate than he behaved with the utmost severity towards his brother as well as his tenants, and at length the former, rendered miserable by his participation in the horrid act, having some business to transact with Mr. Cook, an attorney at Derby, told him of the long-concealed affair and asked for his advice. The lawyer told him to go to a justice of the peace, and make a full discovery of the whole transaction, and he accordingly went to a magistrate, and acquainted him with what had happened. He hesitated to take cognizance of the matter, however saying that it might hang half the family, and, as it had passed so many years ago, advised that it might remain a secret. No further notice of the circumstance was then taken until the year 1754, when Charles, being suddenly seized with a severe fit of illness, called in a Mr. White of Ripley, to whom, in anticipation of his death, he disclosed all that had occurred. Mr. White declined to interfere, but his patient almost immediately recovered, declaring that he had been better ever since the weight of the transaction had been taken off his mind by his making the disclosure. The discovery, however, soon became a matter of notoriety, and William Horne, having quarrelled with a publican named Rowe, the latter called him an incestuous old dog. A suit in the ecclesiastical court at Lichfield was the consequence, and Rowe, being unsuccessful, was ordered to pay all the costs. The circumstance inflamed him with revenge, and having made such inquiries as persuaded him of the truth of the report which he had heard, he procured a warrant to be issued for the apprehension of his late opponent. A constable of Annesley, and he in consequence proceeded to the house of the squire at about eight o'clock in the evening, and after having experienced considerable difficulty, succeeded in obtaining admittance. A strict search was then commenced, but it was not until a long time had elapsed that they discovered the object of their inquiry concealed in a large box, which had been described as containing clean linen. He was immediately carried before two justices, who committed him to take his trial at the following assizes. On the 10th of August, 1759, he was brought to trial before Lord Chief Baron Parker, and after a hearing of about nine hours, the jury found him guilty, and sentence of death passed, of course. Horn, being convicted on a Saturday, was sentenced to die on the Monday following, but a number of gentlemen waited on the judge, intimating that he had been so long hardened in iniquity that a farther time would be necessary to prepare him for his awful change, and a respite of a month was in consequence granted. When this time was nearly expired, he received a reprieve during His Majesty's pleasure, so that he began to entertain hopes of obtaining a free pardon, and he employed a considerable part of his time in writing to his friends, to make interest to secure this object. He, however, confessed the justice of his conviction, but seemed little affected by the enormity of its crime, and frequently said, "'It was damned hard to suffer on the evidence of a brother for a crime committed so many years before.' He gave the following account of the transaction. He said he had no design of destroying the infant, but put it in a bag lined with wool, and made a hole in the bag that it might not be stifled. He added that the child was handsomely dressed, and he had intended to have left it at the door of Mr. Charworth, of Annesley. But the dog's barking, and there being a light in the house, he desisted from his first intention in the fear of a discovery. After some hesitation, he said, he resolved to place it under a warm haystack, in the hope that, when the servants came to fodder the cattle in the morning, it would be found. He acknowledged to a clergyman who assisted him in his devotions that he forgave all his enemies, even his brother Charles, but made the following strange addition to his speech, that, if at the day of judgment God Almighty should ask him how his brother behaved, he would not give him a good character. 
The hopes of a pardon which he had entertained soon proved unfounded, and an order arrived for his execution on the 11th of December, 1759, on which day he completed his 74th year, and terminated his life on a scaffold erected at Nottingham. Lawrence Earl Ferrers, executed for murder. Lawrence Earl Ferrers was a man of singular and most unhappy disposition. Descended of an ancient and noble family, he was doomed to expiate a crime of which he had been guilty at Tyburn. It would appear that the royal blood of the Plantagenets flowed in his veins, and the Earl gained his title in the following manner. The second baronet of the family, Sir Henry Shirley, married a daughter of the celebrated Earl of Essex, who was beheaded in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, and his son, Sir Robert Shirley, died in the Tower, where he was confined during the Protectorate, for his attachment to the cause of the Stuarts. Upon the Restoration, the second son of Sir Robert succeeded to the title and estates, and Charles, anxious to cement the bonds which attached his friends to him, summoned him to the Upper House of Parliament by the title of Lord Ferrers of Chartley, as the descendant of one of the co-heiresses of the Earl of Essex, the title, which had existed since the reign of Edward the Third, having been in abeyance since the death of that unfortunate nobleman. In the year 1711, Robert, Lord Ferrers, was created by Queen Anne, Viscount Tamworth, and Earl Ferrers, and it appears that, although the estates of the family were very great, they were vastly diminished by the provisions which the Earl thought proper to make for his numerous progeny, consisting of fifteen sons and twelve daughters, born to him by his two wives. At the death of the first Earl, his title descended to his second son, but he, dying without issue, it went in succession to the ninth son, who was childless, and the tenth son, who was the father of the Earl Lawrence, the subject of the present sketch. This nobleman was united in the year 1752 to the youngest daughter of Sir William Meredith, but although his general conduct when sober was not such as to be remarkable, yet his faculties were so much impaired by drink that when under the influence of intoxication he acted with all the wildness and brutality of a madman. For a time his wife perceived nothing which induced her to repent the step she had taken in being united to him, but he subsequently behaved to her with such unwarrantable cruelty that she was compelled to quit his protection, and rejoining her father's family to apply to Parliament for redress. An act was in consequence passed, allowing her a separate maintenance to be raised out of her husband's estate, and trustees being appointed, the unfortunate Mr. Johnson, who fell a sacrifice to the ungovernable passions of Lord Ferrers, having been bred up in the family from his youth, and being distinguished for the regular manner in which he kept his accounts, and his fidelity as a steward, was proposed as receiver of the rents for her use. He at first declined the office, but subsequently at the desire of the Earl himself, he consented to act, and continued in this employment for a considerable time. His lordship at this time lived at Stanton, a seat about two miles from Ashby de la Zouche in Leicestershire, and his family consisted of Mrs. Clifford, a lady who lived with him and her four natural daughters, besides five men-servants, exclusive of an old man and a boy, and three maids. Mr. Johnson lived at the house belonging to the farm, which he held under his lordship, called the Lount, about half a mile distant from Stanton. It appears that it was his custom to visit his noble master occasionally, to settle the accounts which were placed under his care, but his lordship gradually conceived a dislike for him. Grounded upon the prejudice raised in his mind on account of his being the receiver of the Countess's portion, and charged him with having combined with the trustees to prevent his receiving a coal contract. From this time he spoke of him in opprobrious terms, and said he had conspired with his enemies to injure him, and that he was a villain and with these sentiments he gave him warning to quit an advantageous farm which he held under his lordship. Finding, however, that the trustees under the act of separation had already granted him a lease of it, it having been promised to him by the earl or his relations, he was disappointed, and probably from that time he meditated a more cruel revenge. The circumstances immediately attending the transaction which terminated in the death of Johnson are as follows. On Sunday the 13th of January, 1760, my lord went to the Lount, and after some discourse with Mr. Johnson, ordered him to come to him at Stanton on the Friday following, the 18th, at three o'clock in the afternoon. His lordship's usual dinner hour was two o'clock, and soon after that meal was disposed of, on the Friday he went to Mrs. Clifford, who was in the still-house, 
and desired her to take the children for a walk. She accordingly prepared herself and her daughters, and with the permission of the Earl went to her father's at a short distance, being directed to return at half-past five. The men-servants were next dispatched on errands by their master, who was thus left in the house with the three females only. In a short time afterwards Mr. Johnson came according to his appointment, and was admitted by one of the maid-servants, named Elizabeth Bergland. He proceeded at once to his lordship's apartment, but was desired to wait in the still-house, and then, after the expiration of about ten minutes, the Earl, calling him into his own room, went in with him and locked the door. Being thus together, the Earl required him first to settle an account, and then charging him with the villainy which he attributed to him, ordered him to kneel down. The unfortunate man went down on one knee, upon which the Earl, in a tone of voice loud enough to be heard by the maid-servants, without, cried, "'Down on your other knee! Declare that you have acted against Lord Ferrers! Your time is come! You must die!' And then suddenly drawing a pistol from his pocket, which was loaded, he presented it, and immediately fired. The ball entered the body of the unfortunate man, but he rose up, and entreated that no farther violence might be done him and the female servants at that time, coming to the door, being alarmed by the report, his lordship quitted the room. A messenger was immediately dispatched for Mr. Kirkland, a surgeon, who lived at Ashby de la Zouche, and Johnson being put to bed, his lordship went to him and asked him how he felt. He answered that he was dying, and desired that his family might be sent for. Miss Johnson soon after arrived, and Lord Ferrers immediately followed her into the room where her father lay. He then pulled down the clothes, and applied a pledget, dipped in arquebusade water, to the wound, and soon after left him. From this time it appears that his lordship applied himself to his favourite amusement, drinking, until he became exceedingly violent, for at the time of the commission of the murder he is reported to have been sober, and on the arrival of Mr. Kirkland he told him that he had shot Johnson, but believed he was more frightened than hurt, that he had intended to shoot him dead, for that he was a villain and deserved to die. But, said he, now I have spared his life, I desire you would do what you can for him. His lordship at the same time desired that he would not suffer him to be seized, and declared that, if any one should attempt it, he would shoot him. Mr. Kirkland, who wisely determined to say, whatever might keep Lord Ferrers from any further outrages, told him that he should not be seized, and directly went to the wounded man. The patient complained of a violent pain in his bowels, and Mr. Kirkland, preparing to search the wound, my lord informed him of the direction of it, by showing him how he held the pistol when he fired it. Mr. Kirkland found the ball had lodged in the body, at which his lordship expressed great surprise, declaring that he had tried that pistol a few days before, and that it then carried a ball through a deal board, near an inch and a half thick. Mr. Kirkland then went downstairs to prepare some dressings, and my lord soon after left the room. From this time, in proportion as the liquor which he continued to drink took effect, his passions became more tumultuous, and the transient fit of compassion, mixed with fear for himself, which had excited him, gave way to starts of rage and the predominance of malice. He went up into the room where Johnson was dying, and pulled him by the wig, calling him villain, and threatening to shoot him through the head, and the last time he went to him, he was with great difficulty prevented from tearing the clothes off the bed that he might strike him. A proposal was made to him in the evening by Mrs. Clifford, that Mr. Johnson should be removed to his own house, but he replied, "'He shall not be removed. I will keep him here to plague the villain.' He afterwards spoke to Miss Johnson about her father, and told her that if he died he would take care of her and of the family, provided they did not prosecute. When his lordship went to bed, which was between eleven and twelve, he told Mr. Kirkland that he knew he could, if he would, set the affair in such a light as to prevent his being seized, desiring that he might see him before he went away in the morning, and declaring that he would rise at any hour. Mr. Kirkland, however, was very solicitous to get Mr. Johnson removed, and as soon as the Earl was gone he set about carrying his object into effect. He, in consequence, went to Lount, and having fitted up an easy chair with poles by way of a sedan, and procured a guard, he returned at about two o'clock and carried Mr. Johnson to his house, where he expired at about nine o'clock of the following morning. The neighbours now began to take measures to secure the murderer, and a few of them, having armed themselves, set out for Stanton, and as they entered the yard they saw his lordship partly undressed, going towards the stable, as if to take out a horse. One of them, named Springthorpe, then advancing towards his lordship with a pistol in his hand, required him to surrender, but the latter, putting his hand towards his pocket, 
His assailant, imagining that he was feeling for some weapon of offence, stopped short and allowed him to escape into the house. A great concourse of people by this time had come to the spot, and they cried out loudly that the Earl should come forth. Two hours elapsed, however, before anything was seen of him, and then he came to the garret window and called out, "'How is Johnson?' He was answered that he was dead, but he said it was a lie, and desired that the people should disperse but then he gave orders that they should be let in and be furnished with victuals and drink and finally he went away from the window swearing that no man should take him the mob still remained on the spot and in about two hours the earl was descried by a collier named curtis walking on the bowling green armed with a blunderbuss a brace of pistols and a dagger curtis however so far from being intimidated by his bold appearance walked up to him and his lordship struck with the resolution he displayed immediately surrendered himself and gave up his arms but directly afterwards declared that he had killed the villain and gloried in the act he was instantly conveyed in custody to a public house at ashby kept by a man named kinsey and a coroner's jury having brought in a verdict of wilful murder against him he was on the following monday committed to the custody of the keeper of the jail at leicester being entitled however by his rank to be tried before his peers he was in about a fortnight afterwards conveyed to london in his landau drawn by six horses under a strong guard and being carried before the house of lords he was committed to the custody of the black rod and ordered to the tower where he arrived at about six o'clock in the evening of the fourteenth of february he is reported to have behaved during the whole journey and at his commitment with great calmness and propriety he was confined in the round tower near the drawbridge two wardens were constantly in the room with him and one at the door two sentinels were posted at the bottom of the stairs and one upon the drawbridge with their bayonets fixed and from this time the gates were ordered to be shut an hour sooner than usual during his confinement he was moderate both in eating and drinking his breakfast was a half pint basin of tea with a small spoonful of brandy in it and a muffin with his dinner he generally drank a pint of wine and a pint of water and another pint of each with his supper in general his behaviour was decent and quiet except that he would sometimes suddenly start tear open his waistcoat and use other gestures which showed that his mind was disturbed mrs clifford and the four young ladies who had come up with him from leicestershire took a lodging in tower street and for some time a servant was continually passing with letters between them but afterwards this correspondence was permitted only once a day mrs clifford came three times to the tower to see him but was not admitted but his children were suffered to be with him some time on the 16th of April, having been a prisoner in the Tower two months and two days, he was brought to his trial, which continued till the 18th, before the House of Lords, assembled for that purpose, Lord Henley, Keeper of the Great Seal, having been created Lord High Steward upon the occasion. The murder was easily proved to have been committed in the manner we have described, and his Lordship then proceeded to enter upon his defence. He called several witnesses, the object of whose testimony was to show that the Earl was not of sound mind, but none of them proved such an insanity as made him not accountable for his conduct. His lordship managed this defence himself, in such a manner as showed an uncommon understanding. He mentioned the fact of his being reduced to the necessity of attempting to prove himself a lunatic, that he might not be deemed a murderer, with the most delicate and affecting sensibility. And when he found that his plea could not avail him, he confessed that he made it only to gratify his friends, that he was always averse to it himself, and that it had prevented what he had proposed, and what perhaps might have taken off the malignity, at least of the accusation. The peers, having in the usual form delivered their verdict of guilty, his lordship received sentence to be hanged on Monday 21st of April, and then to be anatomised. But in consideration of his rank, the execution of this sentence was respited till Monday the 5th of May. During this interval he made a will, by which he left one thousand three hundred pounds to mr johnson's children one thousand pounds to each of his four natural daughters and sixty pounds a year to mrs clifford for her life but this disposition of his property being made after his conviction was not valid although it was said at that time or nearly the same provision was afterwards made for the parties named in the meantime a scaffold was erected under the gallows at tyburn and part of it about a yard square was raised about eighteen inches above the rest of the floor with a contrivance to sink down upon a signal given in accordance with the plan now invariably adopted the whole being covered with black bays 
On the morning of the 5th of May, at about nine o'clock, his lordship's body was demanded of the keeper of the tower by the sheriffs of London and Middlesex, and his lordship, being informed of it, sent a message to the sheriffs, requesting that he might be permitted to be conveyed to the scaffold in his own landau, in preference to the mourning coach which was provided for him. This being granted, his landau, drawn by six horses, immediately drew up, and he entered it accompanied by Mr. Humphreys, the chaplain of the tower, who had been admitted to him on that morning for the first time. On the carriage reaching the outer gate, the Earl was delivered up to the sheriffs, and Mr. Sheriff Valent entered the vehicle with him, expressing his concern at having so melancholy a duty to perform, but his lordship said that he was much obliged to him, and took it kindly that he accompanied him. The Earl was attired in a white suit, richly embroidered with silver, and when he put it on said, This is the suit in which I was married, and in which I will die. The procession being now formed, moved forward slowly, the Landau being preceded by a considerable body of horse-grenadiers, and by a carriage containing Mr. Sheriff Errington, and his under-sheriff Mr. Jackson, and being followed by the carriage of Mr. Sheriff Valent, containing Mr. Nichols, his under-sheriff, a morning coach and six, containing some of his lordship's friends, a hearse and six for the conveyance of his body to the surgeon's hall after execution, and another body of military. The pace at which they proceeded, in consequence of the density of the mob, was so slow that his lordship was two hours and three quarters in his landau, but during that time he appeared perfectly easy and composed, though he often expressed his anxiety to have the whole affair over, saying, that the apparatus of death and the passing through such crowds were worse than death itself, and that he supposed so large a mob had been collected because the people had never seen a lord hanged before. He told the sheriff that he had written to the king to beg that he might suffer where his ancestor, the Earl of Essex, had been executed, and that he was in the greater hopes of obtaining that favour, as he had the honour of quartering part of the same arms, and of being allied to his majesty but that he had refused, and thought it hard that he must die at the place appointed for the execution of common felons. Mr. Humphreys took occasion to observe that the world would naturally be very inquisitive concerning the religion his lordship professed, and asked him if he chose to say anything upon that subject, and his lordship answered that he did not think himself accountable to the world for his sentiments on religion, but that he had always believed in and adored one God, the Maker of all things, that whatever his notions were, he had never propagated them, or endeavoured to gain any persons over to his persuasion, that all countries and nations had a form of religion by which the people were governed, and that he looked upon any one who disturbed them in it as an enemy to society, that he blamed very much my Lord Bolingbroke for permitting his sentiments on religion to be published to the world, that he never could believe what some sectaries teach, that faith alone will save mankind, so that if a man, just before he dies, should say only, I believe, that alone will save him. As to the crime for which he suffered, he declared that he was under particular circumstances, that he had met with so many crosses and vexations he scarce knew what he did, and he most solemnly protested that he had not the least malice against Mr. Johnson. When his lordship had got to that part of Holborn, which is near Drury Lane, he said, he was thirsty, and should be glad of a glass of wine and water, upon which the sheriffs remonstrating to him, that a stop for that purpose would necessarily draw a greater crowd about him, which might possibly disturb and incommode him, yet if his lordship still desired it, it should be done. He most readily answered, that's true, I say no more, let us by no means stop. When they approached near the place of execution, his lordship, pointing to Mrs. Clifford, told the sheriff, that there was a person waiting in a coach near there, for whom he had a very sincere regard, and of whom he should be glad to take his leave before he died. The sheriff answered that, if his lordship insisted upon it, it should be so, but that he wished his lordship for his own sake would decline it, lest the sight of a person for whom he had such a regard should unman him and disarm him of the fortitude he possessed. His lordship, without the least hesitation, replied, Sir, if you think I am wrong, I submit and upon the sheriff telling his lordship that if he had anything to deliver to the individual referred to, or any one else, he would faithfully do it, his lordship delivered to him a pocket-book, in which were a bank-note and a ring, and a purse with some guineas, which were afterwards handed over to the unhappy woman. 
The Landau now being advanced to the place of execution, his lordship alighted from it, and ascended the scaffold with the same composure and fortitude of mind he had exhibited from the time he left the tower. Soon after he had mounted the scaffold, Mr. Humphreys asked his lordship if he chose to say prayers, which he declined, but, upon his asking him if he did not choose to join him in the Lord's Prayer, he readily answered he would, for he always thought it a very fine prayer, upon which they knelt down together upon two cushions, covered with black bays, and his lordship, with an audible voice, very devoutly repeated the Lord's Prayer, and afterwards with great energy ejaculated, O oh God, forgive me all my errors, pardon all my sins. His lordship then rising took his leave of the sheriff and the chaplain, and after thanking them for their many civilities, presented his watch to Mr. Sheriff Valent, of which he desired his acceptance, and requested that his body might be buried at Breeden or Stanton in Leicestershire. The executioner now proceeded to do his duty, to which his lordship with great resignation submitted. His neckcloth being taken off, a white cap, which he had bought in his pocket being put upon his head, his arms secured by a black sash, and the cord put around his neck, he advanced by three steps to the elevated part of the scaffold, and standing under the cross-beam which went over it, which was also covered with black bays, he asked the executioner, Am I right? Then the cap was drawn over his face, and upon a signal given by the sheriff, for his lordship, upon being before asked, declined to give one himself, that part upon which he stood instantly sunk down from beneath his feet, and he was launched into eternity, May the 5th, 1760. From the time of his lordship's ascending upon the scaffold until his execution was about eight minutes, during which his countenance did not change nor his tongue falter. The accustomed time of one hour being passed, the coffin was raised up with the greatest decency to receive the body, and being deposited in the hearse was conveyed by the sheriffs with the same procession to Surgeon's Hall to undergo the remainder of the sentence. A large incision was then made from the neck to the bottom of the breast, and another across the throat. The lower part of the belly was laid open, and the bowels taken away. It was afterwards publicly exposed to view in a room up one pair of stairs at the hall, and on the evening of Thursday the 8th of May it was delivered to his friends for interment. The following verse is said to have been found in his apartment. In doubt I lived, in doubt I die, yet stand prepared the vast abyss to try, and undismayed expect eternity. End of part 25Part twenty six of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume One, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part twenty six Theodore Gardell, executed for murder. This delinquent was a native of Geneva, and besides being a man of good general education, was somewhat celebrated in his native city as a painter on enamel. Unhappy in his domestic concerns, in the year 1760 he repaired to London, and took lodgings in the house of a Mrs. King, who lived in Leicester Fields, and who was the unfortunate subject of his crime. The circumstances attending the murder were as follows. On Thursday, 19th February, 1761, the servant-girl got up at about seven o'clock in the morning, and being presently called by Gardell, who occupied an upper apartment, was desired to go on some errands for him. The girl took the messages, and went to her mistress, who was still in her bedroom, which was at the back parlour, telling her what Gardell had desired her to do, to which her mistress replied, "'Nanny, you can't go, for there's nobody to answer at the street door.' The girl, being willing to oblige Gardell, answered, "'That Mr. Gardell would come down, and sit in the parlour, until she came back.' And then she went again to Gardell, who, in obedience to her wish, proceeded into the front room on the ground floor." The girl went out, taking the key of the street door with her to let herself in again, Gardell then having entered the room next to Mrs. King's apartment. Immediately after she was gone out, Mrs. King, hearing the tread of somebody in the parlour, called out, "'Who is there?' and at the same time opened her chamber door, and saw Gardell at a table very near the door, who had just then taken up a book that lay upon it. He had some time before drawn Mrs. King's picture, which she wanted to have made very handsome and had teased him so much about it that the effect was just contrary, and it happened, unfortunately, that the first thing she said to him, when she saw him walking about in the room, 
was something reproachful about this picture. Provoked at the insult, as he spoke English very imperfectly, for want of a better expression, he told her, with some warmth, that she was an impertinent woman. The detail of the whole of the circumstances immediately attending this part of the transaction, of necessity, could not fall within the knowledge or observation of any witness, and it is therefore derived from a statement drawn up by Gardell while in custody. But having stated the facts already mentioned, he says that this insult threw Mrs. King into a transport of rage, and she gave him a blow with her fist on the breast, so violent that he could not have thought it could have been given by a woman. As soon as the blow was struck, she drew a little back, and at the same instant he laid his hand on her shoulder, and pushed her from him rather in contempt than anger, or with a design to hurt her, but her foot happening to catch in the floor-cloth she fell backwards, and her head came with great force against the corner of the bedstead. The blood immediately gushed from her mouth, not in a continued stream, but as if by different strokes of a pump, and he instantly ran to her, expressing his concern at the accident, but she pushed him away and threatened, though in a feeble and interrupted voice, to punish him for what he had done. He was terrified at the thought of being condemned for a criminal act upon her accusation, and again attempted to assist her by raising her up, as the blood still flowed from her mouth in great quantities, but she exerted all her strength to keep him off, and still cried out, mixing threats with her screams. He then seized an ivory comb, with a sharp taper point, continued from the back for adjusting the curls of the hair which lay upon her toilet, and threatened her in his turn to prevent her crying out. But she still continuing to scream, though with a voice still fainter and fainter, he struck her with this instrument, probably in the throat, upon which the blood poured from her mouth in yet greater quantities, and her voice was quite stopped. Then he drew the bedclothes over her to prevent her blood from spreading on the floor, and to hide her from his sight, and he stood some time motionless by her, and then fell down by her side in a swoon. When he came to himself he perceived the maid was come in, and he therefore went out of the room, without examining the body to see if the unhappy woman was quite dead, and his confusion was then so great that he staggered against the wainscot, and hit his head so as to raise a bump over his eye. It appears that he subsequently sent the girl away, informing her that he had her mistress's orders to dismiss her, and paid ten shillings for her wages, and the latter having been unable to find either her mistress or Gadell on her first returning to the house, and knowing the former to be a woman of light character, concluded that they must have been in bed together, and that her mistress being ashamed to meet her determined to get rid of her. Her suspicions were not at all raised, therefore, and she went away, informing Gardell that Mr. Wright, who lodged in the house, but had been out of town, would return that evening with his servant. On her departure, the first thing that Gardell did was to go into the chamber to Mrs. King, whom, upon examination, he found quite dead. He therefore took off the blankets and sheets with which he had covered her, and stripped off the shift, and laid the body quite naked upon the bed. Before this, he said, his linen was not stained, but it was much discoloured by his removing of the body. He then took the two blankets, the sheets, the coverlet, and one of the curtains, and put them into the water-tub in the back wash-house to soak, they being all much stained with blood. A shift he carried upstairs, and putting it into a bag, concealed it under his bed. His own shirt, now bloody, he pulled off, and locked it up in a drawer of his bureau. When all this was done, he went and sat down in the parlour, and soon after, it being about nine o'clock, Mr. Wright's servant, whose name was Pelsey, came in without his master, who had changed his mind, and was gone to a gentleman's house in Castle Street. He went up to his room, the garret, and sat there till about eleven o'clock, when he came down, and finding Gardell still in the parlour, he asked if Mrs. King was come home, and who must sit up for her. Gardell said she was not come home, but that he would sit up for her. In the morning, Friday, when Pelsey came downstairs, he again asked if Mrs. King was come home, and Gardell told him that she had been at home, but was gone again, and he subsequently said that she was gone to Bath or Bristol. The demeanour of Gardell was soon observed by Pelsey to be much changed, and fancying that it was in consequence of the absence of Mrs. King, he went into the haymarket, and procured a girl of unfortunate character, named Walker, to go and stay in the house with him. A Mrs. Pritchard was also engaged as charwoman, and still no suspicions being entertained, all the parties continued to live in the house. On the Saturday morning, Gardell first took steps to dispose of the body of the deceased woman, and no plan struck him as being so readily to be carried out as that of a gradual destruction of its members by fire. 
he accordingly proceeded to light a fire in the garret, whither he carried the bones, from which he had previously scraped the flesh, and burned them. All went on well till the Tuesday morning, when Pelsey, who was going up to his master's room, smelt something offensive, and asked Gardell, who was pushing up the sash of the window on the staircase, what it was. Gardell replied, somebody had put a bone in the fire. At night Pelsey renewed his inquiries after Mrs. King, and Gardell answered, with seeming impatience, "'Me not know of Mrs. King. She gave me a great deal of trouble, but me shall hear of her on Wednesday or Thursday.' On Tuesday night he told Walker he would sit up till Mrs. King came home, though he had before told her she was out of town, and desired her to go to bed, and as soon as she was gone he renewed his horrid employment of cutting the body to pieces, and disposing of it in different places. The bowels he threw down the necessary, and the flesh of the body and limbs cut to pieces he scattered about in the cock-loft, where he supposed they would dry and perish without putrefaction. Wednesday passed like the preceding days, and on Thursday he told his female companion that he expected Mrs. King home in the evening, and therefore desired that she would provide herself a lodging, giving her at the same time two of Mrs. King's shifts, and being thus dismissed, she went away. Pritchard, the charwoman, still continued in her office, and through her means the murder was discovered. The water having failed in the cistern on the Tuesday, she had recourse to that in the water-tub in the back kitchen. Upon pulling out the spigot a little water ran out, but as there appeared to be more in, she got upon a ledge, and putting her hand in, she felt something soft. She then fetched a poker, and pressing down the contents of the tub, she got water in a pail. She informed Pelsey of the circumstance, and they agreed the first opportunity to see what the things in the water-tub were. Yet so languid was their curiosity, and so careless were they of the event, that it was Thursday before the tub was examined. They found in it the blankets, sheets, and coverlet that Gardell had put in to soak, and after spreading, shaking, and looking at them, they put them again into the tub, and the next morning, when Pelsey came down, he saw the curtain hanging on the banisters of the kitchen stairs. Upon looking down, he saw Gardell just come out of the wash-house door, where the tub stood. When Pritchard the charwoman came, he asked her if she had been taking the curtains out of the tub, and she said, No. She then went and looked in the tub, and found the sheets had been wrung out. Upon this the first step was taken toward inquiring after the unhappy woman, who had now lain dead more than a week in the house. Pelsey found out the maid whom Gardell had dismissed, and suspicions being excited that Mrs. King had been unfairly dealt with, the aid of the police was obtained. Gardell was then apprehended, and his answers to the questions put to him, being of a very equivocal nature, a search was made in the house, and the remains of the body being discovered, disposed of, as we have already mentioned, as well as the linen of the deceased, and of the prisoner stained with blood, his guilt was considered to be fully established, and he was committed to Newgate for trial. While in that prison he made two attempts to destroy himself by taking laudanum, and by swallowing halfpence to the number of twelve, but although he was considerably injured by the latter attempt he failed in securing his object. He afterwards showed strong marks of penitence and contrition, and behaved with great humility, openness, and courtesy to those who visited him. On Thursday the 2nd of April he was tried at the Old Bailey, and in his defence he insisted only that he had no malice of the deceased, and that her death was the consequence of the fall. He was convicted and sentenced to be executed on Saturday the 4th of the same month. The account which he wrote in prison, and which is mentioned in this narrative, is dated the 28th of March, though he did not communicate it till after his trial. The night after his condemnation his behaviour was extravagant and outrageous, but the next morning he was composed and quiet, and said he had slept three or four hours in the night. When he was asked why he did not make his escape, he answered that he feared some innocent person might then suffer in his stead. He was executed April the 4th, 1761, amidst the shouts and hisses of an indignant populace in the Haymarket near Panton Street, to which he was led by Mrs. King's house, where the cart made a stop. His body was hung in chains upon Hounslow Heath. John McNaughton, Esquire, executed for murder. John McNaughton, Esquire, was the son of a merchant at Derry, whose father had been an alderman of Dublin. He was educated at Trinity College, Dublin, and on his coming of age he entered into a landed estate of six hundred pounds a year in the county of Tyrone, which was left to him by Dr. McNaughton, his uncle. The first vice he fell into was that of gaming, by which he very soon did great injury to his fortune, 
and though he continued, as most novices do who play with sharpers, in a constant run of ill luck, and was soon obliged to mortgage his property, yet his losses made no visible alteration in his temper. Although he was of a most passionate disposition, his pride kept him within due bounds there, or was placid with the polite MacNaughton, and he lost his money to the very last with that graceful composure that became the man who had a plentiful fortune to support it. But strong as his passion this way might be, it was not powerful enough to secure him against the attacks of love, and becoming attached to a young lady, he very speedily married her. The reader may well suppose that the expenses of a wife and family in Dublin must soon increase his difficulties and introduce a new scene of troubles, and it did so in a manner and with an effect which was most unhappy for Mr. McNaughton. It appears that a writ having been issued against him at the suit of one of his creditors, the sheriff's officer obtained access to his house by a stratagem of which he flew into a rage, and calling out for pistols, he frighted his poor listening wife to such a degree that premature labour followed, and she died in childbed. The feelings of the unfortunate husband upon the occurrence of this melancholy event were most distressing, and he made repeated attempts upon his life. But a change of scene being recommended, he was conveyed to the country, where every attention was paid to his health, while his fortune was also nursed with equal care. On his return to the gaiety of the Irish metropolis, he soon resumed that worst of passions, gaming, and again became the dupe of others, while his property was once more seriously diminished. At this time he made secret advances to Miss Knox, the beautiful and accomplished daughter of Richard Knox, Esquire, of Proen, in the county of Derry, who was possessed of a handsome fortune, and whose promise of marriage he obtained, in the event of her father's consent being given. On that consent being requested, however, it was at once refused, on account of the youth of the young lady, whose age did not exceed sixteen years, and Mr. Knox was so resolute in his refusal that he forbade the suitor for his daughter's hand ever to enter the house again. Mr. McNaughton begged that this latter injunction might be withdrawn, urging that it would appear strange to the world that his friendship with a family, with which he had been so intimate, should be so suddenly broken off, and upon his promising upon his honour that the subject of the marriage should not again be mentioned, and declaring that he had not previously spoken of it to the young lady herself, his visits were allowed to be repeated. In the meantime he continued his addresses to the young lady, and informed her that he had obtained the consent of her father, but that the marriage must be postponed for a year or two, when some material business would be settled, which was required to be decided first. And under this assurance she no longer withheld the confession that the passion of her admirer was returned, and appeared to delight most in the company of the man whom she looked upon as her future husband. All her hopes were, however, soon doomed to be blasted. One day being in company with Mr. McNaughton, and a little boy in a retired room in the house, he pressed her to marry him, protesting he never could be happy till he was sure of her, and with an air of sprightly raillery, pulling out a prayer-book he began to read the marriage service, and insisted on the young lady making the responses, which she did, but to every one she always added, provided her father consented. Some short time after this, Miss Knox, going to a friend's house on a week's visit, Mr. McNaughton, being also an intimate there, soon followed her, and here he fixed his scene for action. After a day or two he claimed her, and, calling her his wife, insisted on consummation. But the young lady absolutely refused to comply, and leaving the house, went directly, and informed her uncle of the whole affair. On this Mr. Knox wrote a letter to Mr. McNaughton, telling him what a base, dishonourable villain he was, and bade him avoid his sight for ever. But upon the receipt of this letter, McNaughton advertised his marriage in the public newspapers, cautioning every other man not to marry his lawful wife. This vile attack was answered by a very spirited and proper advertisement from the father, with an affidavit of the whole affair from the daughter annexed, and Mr. Knox, having commenced a suit in the prerogative court, the marriage was declared invalid. Mr. McNaughton, having absconded to avoid his debts, could not now appeal to the Court of Delegates, and the original decree was confirmed. Judge Scott, in consequence, issued his warrant for the apprehension of the defendant, who was liable to pay costs, and McNaughton, hearing of this, wrote a most impudent, threatening letter to the judge, and, it is said, lay in wait to have him murdered, but missed him by the judge's taking another road. 
Upon this the judge applied to the Lord Chief Justice, who issued another writ against him, which drove him to England. In the summer of 1761 Mr. McNaughton returned to Ireland, and by constantly hovering round Mr. Knox's house, obliged the family to be upon their guard, and the young lady to live like a recluse. About the middle of the summer, however, she ventured to a place called Swaddling Bar, to drink the mineral waters there for her health. But even thither this unhappy man followed her, and he was seen in a beggar's habit, dogging her footsteps. Thus disguised he was detected, and when warned never to appear there again, he swore, in the presence of several, that he would murder the whole family if he did not get possession of his wife, a threat which he subsequently attempted to carry out. Notwithstanding his violence, it appears that he was permitted again to escape to London, and he remained there until the month of October in the same year. At the beginning of November, he was again seen in Ireland, and having approached the residence of the Knoxes, he was known to sleep with three of his accomplices at the house of a hearth-money collector, very nearly adjoining the abode of his intended victim. The tenth was the day fixed upon by him for the attack, and on that morning McNaughton with his companions went to a cabin on the roadside with a sack full of firearms, in order to await the passing of Mr. Knox's coach, in which it was known the family were about to proceed to Dublin. One of the men was dispatched to ascertain the moment of the coming of the vehicle, and when it appeared in sight, having obtained the information requisite for its identification, he hurried back to desire the projector of the scheme to prepare. It appears that the only persons in the carriage were Mr. Knox and his wife, their daughter and a maid-servant, and they were attended only by one livery-servant and a faithful fellow, a smith, who was foster-father to Miss Knox, and whom no bribe could ever purchase although most of the other servants had been tampered with. As soon as the coach came near the cabin, two of the villains armed with guns presented themselves to the postillion and coachman, and stopped the horses, while McNaughton fired at the smith with a blunderbuss. The latter escaped being wounded, and presented his piece in return, but it unfortunately missed fire, and McNaughton and one of his companions seizing the opportunity again fired, and both of them wounded him. Mr. Knox at this time drew up the blinds of the carriage, and McNaughton, observing this, ran round to the other side, and firing in at the window obliquely with a gun loaded with five balls, shot Miss Knox, all the balls taking effect in her body. The maid-servant now let down the window, screaming that her mistress was murdered, and the livery-servant, on hearing this, came from behind a peat-stack where he had concealed himself for safety, and firing at McNaughton wounded him in the back, and about the same time Mr. Knox from the coach discharged a pistol, which was the last of eight shots fired on this strange and dreadful occasion. The murderer and his accomplices now immediately fled, and Miss Knox, being carried into the cabin, died in about three hours. An attack so bold and so diabolical in its nature excited the greatest degree of interest, and large rewards were instantly offered for the apprehension of the perpetrator of the murder. For a considerable time all search proved fruitless, but at length a corporal of Sir James Caldwell's company of light horse secured him under the following circumstances. It appears that the corporal had received instructions to search the house and offices of one Wenslow, a farmer, and had examined every place without success, when he bethought himself of a stratagem by which to obtain the requisite information of the murderer's hiding-place. Observing a fellow digging potatoes in a piece of ground behind the stables, he remarked in his hearing that it was a great pity that McNaughton could not be found, for that the person who discovered his retreat would be sure of a reward of three hundred pounds. The bait took, and the peasant pointed to a barn, and thither the corporal and his assistants immediately proceeded. The door was fast, but at length they forced it open, and there they found the object of their search, standing with a gun at his shoulder, apparently determined to resist all efforts made to secure him. On the appearance of the corporal he fired at him, but without wounding him, and a shot from the corporal's gun striking him on the wrist, he was compelled to surrender. He was immediately secured and carried to Lifford Jail, where he remained in the closest confinement until the 8th of December 1761, when he was put upon his trial, with an accomplice named Dunlap before Mr. Baron Mountney and Mr. Justice Scott, on a special commission. McNaughton, still suffering from the effects of the wounds which he had received, was brought into a court on a bier, rolled in a blanket, and wearing the shirt in which he was taken, still smeared with blood. His beard had grown to an enormous length, and his head was wrapped in a greasy woollen nightcap. In that condition he made a long speech, pointedly and sensibly, 
and complained in the most pathetic manner of the hard usage he had met with since his confinement. He said they had treated him like a man under sentence, and not like a man that was to be tried. He declared with tears in his eyes that he never intended to kill his dear wife, but that he only designed to take her away. The case lasted five days, a considerable portion of the first day being occupied in pleadings to postpone the trial, and the reply of the counsel for the Crown. During these debates McNaughton often spoke with most amazing spirit and judgment, but the result was that he was ordered to prepare his affidavit, which the court would take into consideration. Accordingly, on the ninth, he was brought into court again, and his affidavit read, in which he swore that some material witnesses for him were not to be had, particularly one Owens, who, he said, was present all the time. But the court were of opinion that no sufficient reason for the application was shown, and the trial in consequence proceeded. During the whole proceedings, McNaughton took his notes as regularly as any of the lawyers, and cross-examined all the witnesses with the greatest accuracy, and he was observed to behave with uncommon resolution. His chief defence was founded on a letter he produced, as written to him by Miss Knox, in which she desired him to intercept her on the road to Dublin, and take her away. But this letter was proved a forgery of his own, which, after condemnation, he confessed. He took great pains to exculpate himself from the least design to murder any one, much less his dear wife, as he always called her. He declared solemnly that his intent was only to take her out of the coach and carry her off, but as he received the first wound from the first shot that was fired, the anguish of that wound, and the prospect of his ill success in his design, so distracted him that, being wholly involved in confusion and despair, he fired he knew not at what or whom, and had the misfortune to kill the only person in the world that was dear to him, that he gave the court that trouble, and laboured thus not to save his life, for death was now his choice, but to clear his character from such horrid guilt as that which was ascribed to him. The jury, however, found both prisoners guilty, and McNaughton received the intimation without any concern, declaring that they had acquitted themselves with justice to the country. Mr. Baron Mountney then pronounced upon both prisoners the awful sentence which the law directed, and although the court were visibly affected by the manner in which this painful duty was performed, McNaughton remained unconcerned. He prayed to the court to have mercy upon Dunlap, alleging that he was his tenant, and had been compelled by him to participate with him in the transaction under pain of losing a lease, which he hoped to be renewed, but he declared that life was not worth asking for himself, for that his wife being dead, the better half of himself was gone, and he had nothing to remain for in this world. Tuesday, 15th of December, 1761, was fixed upon for the execution of these criminals, but it appears that some difficulty was experienced in carrying the sentence into effect. For a long time no carpenter could be found to make the gallows, and the sheriff looked out for a tree proper for the purpose, and the execution must have been performed on it, had not the uncle of the young lady, and some other gentleman, made the gallows and put it up. The sheriff was afterwards obliged to take a party of soldiers and force a smith to take off the prisoner's bolts, otherwise he must have been obliged, contrary to law, to execute them with their bolts on. The time for the execution having arrived, McNaughton, attended by his fellow prisoner, walked to the place of execution, but being weak of his wounds, was supported between two men. The former was dressed in a white flannel waistcoat, trimmed with black buttons and holes, a diaper nightcap tied with a black ribbon, white stockings, morning buckles, and a crape tied on his arm. He desired the executioner to be speedy, and the fellow pointing to the ladder, he mounted with great spirit. The moment he was tied up, he jumped from it with such vehemence as snapped the rope, and he fell to the ground, but without dislocating his neck or doing himself much injury. When they had raised him on his legs again, he soon recovered his senses, and the executioner, borrowing the rope from Dunlap and fixing it round McNaughton's neck, he went up the ladder a second time, and, tying the rope himself to the gallows, he jumped from it again with the same force, and appeared dead in a minute. The spectators who saw him drop when the rope broke looked upon it as some contrivance for his escape, which they favoured all they could by running away from the place and leaving it open. Dunlap was afterwards turned off, in the usual manner, in sight of the dangling body of his accomplice and master. End of part 26 Part 27 of the Chronicles of Crime 
Volume One, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Twenty Seven, John Smith and Robert Maine, executed for a mutiny on board the King George. On the trial of these men, with five more of the crew, it appeared that disputes arose on board the King George, a fine privateer of thirty-two guns and two hundred men, commanded by Captain Reed and cruising against the enemies of the country, concerning some prize wine which was stowed in the hold, some of the crew insisting on its being hoisted up to be used for the whole ship's company. This would have been attended, in their situation, with both difficulty and danger, and was consequently opposed by Captain Reed and his officers, and, being disappointed, a factious discontented set endeavoured to corrupt the remainder, and soon gained over so formidable a party that they determined to seize the ship, and turn pirates in the Indian seas. In order to effect this, off Cape Orchigal, the mutineers demanded the keys of the arms-chest, and on the refusal of their request they drove the captain and the officers into the cabin. They then placed a guard at the door, and brought a nine-pounder carriage-gun, loaded with round and grape-shot, to fire among the officers, but were prevailed upon to desist by the entreaties of Mr. Gardner, the sailing-master. They then offered the latter the command of the ship, acquainting him with their intention of steering for the East Indies, but on his refusal they put him under a guard, and took the ship into their own care, until they had, for want of skill, nearly lost her. They then released Mr. Gardner, and gave him the helm, when he steered into Camarinas in Spain, where most of the mutineers took to the boats and made their escape. Such as were apprehended were brought to trial and though two more, viz. Thomas Baldwin and Lawrence Tierman, were found guilty, yet Smith and Maine, who were the ringleaders of the mutiny, only were hanged. They suffered at execution dock, May the 10th, 1762. They were both Irishmen and Roman Catholics, and were attended by a priest of that religion. A few years after this affair, a mutiny broke out among the crew of the Namur of ninety guns. Fifteen were tried, found guilty, and ordered to be hanged and they were taken for execution on board the Royal Anne, with halters round their necks. While waiting for the fatal gun being fired, however, they were told that His Majesty had pardoned fourteen of them, but one of them must die, and they were ordered to cast lots. How exquisite must have been the feelings of these miserable men at the awful moment of deciding on the fate of one! The fatal lot fell upon the second man that drew, Matthew McCann, who was soon run up to the yard-arm, where the body hung, nearly an hour. The pardoned seamen were turned over to the Grafton and the Sunderland, under sailing orders for the East Indies. Hannah Dago, executed for robbery. There is so much eccentricity in the mode which this unhappy wretch terminated her existence, that although the circumstances of the robbery for which she was convicted are not of an interesting nature, we cannot forbear mentioning her case. We have adduced many instances of hardness of heart, and contempt of the commandments of God, in men who have undergone the last sentence of the law, but we are of opinion that, in this woman, will be found a more relentless heart, in her last moments, than any criminal whom we have yet recorded. Hannah Dago was born in Ireland, and was one of that numerous class of women who ply at Covent Garden Market as a basket woman. In the pursuit of her vocation she became acquainted with a poor and industrious woman of the name of Eleanor Hussey, who lived by herself in a small apartment, in which was some creditable household furniture, the remains of the worldly goods of her deceased husband. Seizing an opportunity, when the owner was from home, this daring woman broke into Hussey's room, and stripped it of every article which it contained. For this burglary and robbery she was brought to trial at the Old Bailey, found guilty, and sentenced to death. She was a strong, masculine woman, the terror of her fellow prisoners, and actually stabbed one of the men who had given evidence against her, but the wound happened not to prove dangerous. On the road to Tyburn she showed little concern at her miserable state, and paid no attention to the exhortations of the Romish priest who attended her. When the cart, in which she was bound, was drawn under the gallows, she got her hands and arms loose seized the executioner, struggled with him, and gave him so violent a blow on the breast as nearly knocked him down. She dared him to hang her, and in order to revenge herself upon him, and cheat him of his dues, she took off her hat, cloak, and other parts of her dress, and disposed of them among the crowd. After much resistance he got the rope around her neck, which she had no sooner found accomplished 
than pulling out a handkerchief she bound it round her head over her face and threw herself out of the cart before the signal given with such violence that she broke her neck and died instantly this extraordinary and unprecedented scene occurred on the fourth of may seventeen sixty three barney carroll and william king executed for cutting and maiming these men had served their country as soldiers and it is remarkable that having in that capacity conducted themselves with great bravery and earned for themselves well-merited rewards they should afterwards have resorted to such atrocious means of procuring a livelihood as from this case it will appear they adopted having returned to england from the havana where their regiment had been stationed they obtained their discharge and determined to commence robbers on a plan of the most infamous cruelty this consisted in their procuring two young thieves named byfield and matthews to go before them and to pick pockets and in case of their being detected and seized their villainous employers would run up and by maiming the persons holding the boys generally by cutting him across the eyes would procure their release the offence for which they were executed was committed on the seventeenth of june seventeen sixty five and it appears that a gentleman named kirby was selected by the gang as a fit object for attack mr kirby however detected byfield in picking his pocket and before he could withdraw his hand he seized him and threatened to carry him before the magistrates his intention was not to pursue this threat but in order to terrify the boy he dragged him a considerable distance through the strand where the circumstance had occurred carroll soon came up to him and demanded the boy's release but byfield guessing that he would be permitted to escape told him to keep off for that the gentleman would let him go the answer given by the ruffian was damn him but i will cut him and instantly drawing his knife he gave mr kirby a severe cut over the face a mr carr at the moment came up to the assistance of mr kirby and seized carroll's arm and at this instant kirby letting go the boy struck at carroll but the blow happening to fall on mr carr's hand the villain made his escape the rogues then ran off towards st clement's church and escaped through an alley into witch street though closely pursued by the gentleman mr kirby now felt great pain but had no idea that he had been wounded by any sharp instrument but putting his hand to his face he found that it streamed with blood going to the crown and anchor tavern in the strand mr ingram a surgeon of eminence almost immediately attended him and although the utmost expedition was used in calling in the assistance of that gentleman mr kirby had lost near two quarts of blood in the short interval on examination it appeared that the wound was given in a transverse direction from the right eye to the left temple that two large vessels were divided by it that there was a cut across the nose which left the bone visible and that the eyeballs must have been divided by the slightest deviation from the stroke the abominable assassins were very soon apprehended and found guilty under the coventry act and hanged at tyburn july thirty first seventeen sixty five amid the execrations of an enraged multitude the coventry act is a statute of the twenty second and twenty third charles the second its provision in respect of this crime is to the following effect if any person on purpose and by malice aforethought and by laying in wait shall unlawfully cut or disable the tongue put out an eye slit the nose cut off a nose or lip or cut off or disable any limb or member of any subject with intention in so doing to maim or disfigure him the person so offending his counsellors aiders abettors knowing of and privy to the offence shall be guilty of felony without benefit of clergy it is called the coventry act because it was passed on sir john coventry being assaulted and having his nose slit in the street and the following anecdote is related of the circumstances under which this outrage was committed in the committee of ways and means in the house of commons it had been resolved that towards the supply every one that resorts to any of the playhouses who sits in the boxes shall pay one shilling every one who sits in the pit shall pay sixpence every other person threepence this resolution to which the house disagreed upon the report was opposed in the committee by the courtiers who gave for a reason that the players were the king's servants and a part of his pleasure to this sir john coventry one of the members by way of reply asked whether the king's pleasure lay among the men or among the women players this being reported at court it was highly resented and a resolution was privately taken to set a mark on sir john to prevent others from taking the like liberties 
December the 20th was the night that the House of Commons adjourned for the Christmas holidays. On the 25th, one of the Duke of Monmouth's troop of lifeguards, and some few foot, lay in wait from ten at night till two in the morning by Suffolk Street, and as Sir John returned from the tavern where he supped, to his own house, they threw him down, and with a knife, cut the end of his nose almost off. But company coming made them fearful to finish it. The debates which this affair occasioned in the House of Commons ran very high, and one of the members emphatically called the attack on Coventry a horrid un-English act. The result was that the statute in question was passed. Peter McKinley, George Gidley, Andrew Zeckerman, and Richard St. Quentin, executed for murder. This case exhibits a remarkable series of adventures which occurred to the unfortunate man who, after having survived many engagements and imprisonments, was doomed to become one of the victims of a horrid and piratical scheme. The unfortunate Captain Glass was the son of a minister of the Church of Scotland, who obtained some notice from his writings, in which he opposed the practice of religion according to particular forms, and was the founder of a sect called Glassites. At an early period of his life, young Glass exhibited talents of no ordinary character, and having taken a degree of Master of Arts at one of the Scotch universities, he applied himself to the study of medicine. He made rapid progress in this new line of learning, and after he had taken the necessary degrees, was employed as a surgeon on board a trading vessel bound for the coast of Guinea, and in that capacity he afterwards made several voyages to America. His superior qualifications gained him a distinguished place in the esteem of several merchants, who entrusted him the command of a vessel in the Guinea trade, and his conduct proved highly to the advantage of his owners and equally honourable to himself. When the war against France was declared, Captain Glass found himself in possession of a very considerable sum, a great part of which he determined to venture on board a privateer, and he in consequence caused a vessel to be fitted out with all possible expedition, and took the command on himself. In about ten days after they had commenced this voyage, they made a prize of a ship richly laden, belonging to France, which they carried into port at the West Indies, but soon afterwards being obliged to engage two vessels of war, after an obstinate contest, they were compelled to submit to the superior power of the enemy and strike, but not until Captain Glass had been severely wounded and most of his men slain. The captain, being conveyed to France, was there consigned to a prison, but an interchange of prisoners taking place, he once more trod on British ground. Nothing daunted by the unsuccessful termination of his first venture, he tried a second expedition of a similar character, in which he was equally unfortunate, and was once again consigned to the keeping of a French jailer, in whose custody he remained until the termination of the war. He next conceived a design of sailing in search of discoveries, and in pursuance of this plan he purchased a vessel adapted to this purpose, and having carefully made every necessary preparation for the prosecution of his object, he directed his course towards the coast of Africa. Between the river Senegal and Cape de Verde, he discovered a commodious harbour, from which he entertained the reasonable expectation that very great commercial advantages might be derived, and he returned to England, and communicated his discovery to the government, who granted him an exclusive trade to the harbour for the space of twenty years. That he might be able to pursue his project with greater advantage, he now engaged in partnership with two or three gentlemen of fortune, and a vessel furnished with all necessary articles being again prepared, he sailed for the newly discovered harbour, and arrived at it in safety. He soon found, however, that the habits of the natives would not permit any friendly intercourse to be maintained between them, and being in great distress for provisions, the captain and three men proceeded in an open boat to the Canary Islands. During their absence the natives made an attack upon the vessel, but were repulsed, and the first mate, who had been left in command of her, thought fit to sheer off, and having in vain sought his captain, at length returned to England. Glass and his companions, meanwhile, had arrived at one of the Canary Islands, and having landed, with a view of petitioning to be allowed to purchase provisions, was instantly seized by order of the governor, and conveyed to a dungeon as a spy. In this situation he remained for six months, but at length he made one of his countrymen, a sailor, acquainted with his condition by writing his name and the nature of his miseries on a biscuit with a piece of charcoal, and throwing it to him through his prison window when he was passing beneath. The sailor immediately conveyed it to his commander, but the latter, 
on making application for his release, was himself seized and subjected to treatment of similar severity. The news of this circumstance was, however, directly carried to England by a vessel which was on the point of sailing, and speedy complaint being made to the Spanish government, the liberty of the two captains was soon obtained. At about this time the wife and daughter of Captain Glass had arrived at the Canaries in consequence of the reports which had reached them of his captivity, and the first joy of again meeting being passed, they all embarked on the board a ship bound for London, commanded by a Captain Cochrane. Miss Glass at this time was a young lady of about twelve years of age, and ill-deserving the fate which awaited her as well as her parents. It appears that while the ship lay at the Canaries, a plot was concerted between Peter McKinley, the boatswain, a native of Ireland, George Gidley, the cook, born in the west of Yorkshire, Richard St. Quintin, a native of the same county, and Andrew Zeckerman, a Dutchman, for murdering all the other persons on board and seizing the treasure, which, including what Captain Glass had shipped in behalf of himself and his partners, amounted to a hundred thousand pounds in dollars. The villains made three attempts on different nights to carry their horrid plan into execution, but were prevented through the circumspection of their commander. At length, however, the conspirators were appointed to the night watch on the 13th of November, when the ship had reached the British Channel, and about midnight, the captain going upon the quarter-deck to see that all things were disposed in proper order, upon his return he was seized by the boatswain, who held him, while Gidley struck him with an iron bar and fractured his skull. Two of the seamen, who were not concerned in the conspiracy, hearing the captain's groans, came upon deck and were immediately murdered, and, with their captain, were thrown overboard. Captain Glass, being alarmed, went up the gangway, and, judging that a mutiny had arisen, returned to fetch his sword. McKinley, guessing his design, followed him down the steps leading to the cabin, and waited in the dark till he returned with a drawn sword in his hand, when, getting unperceived behind him, he seized both his arms, and then called to his accomplices to murder him. Captain Glass, being a very powerful man, had nearly disengaged himself from the ruffian when Zeckerman came up and attacked him. The captain wounded him in the arm, but before he could recover his sword he was overpowered, and the other villains soon joined their associates. The unhappy man was no sooner disarmed than he was many times run through the body, and he was then immediately thrown overboard. Mrs. Glass and her daughter, terrified by the outcry, now came on deck, and falling on their knees supplicated for mercy, but they found the villains utterly destitute of the tender feelings of humanity, and Zeckerman, telling them to prepare for death, they embraced each other in a most affectionate manner, and were then forced from each other's arms, and thrown into the sea. Having now put all the crew to death, excepting a boy who attended Captain Glass, and another boy who was an apprentice on board the ship, the murderers steered towards the Irish coast, and on the 3rd of December found themselves within ten leagues of the harbour of Ross. They then hoisted out the longboat, and put into it dollars to the amount of two tons, and after knocking out the windows of the ballast ports, rowed towards the shore, leaving the two boys to sink with the vessel. Captain Glass's boy could not swim, and was therefore soon drowned, but the other lad swam to the boat when Zuckerman struck him a violent blow on the breast, which caused him immediately to sink. Having thus massacred eight innocent persons, the villains proceeded to the mouth of the river Ross, but thinking it would be dangerous to go up the river with so much riches, they buried two hundred and fifty bags of dollars in the sand, and conveyed as much treasure as they could possibly bear about their persons to a village called Fishertown, where they stopped for refreshment. On the following day they went to Ross, and there sold twelve hundred dollars, and having purchased each a pair of pistols and hired horses for themselves and two guides, they rode to Dublin and took up their residence at the Black Bull in Thomas Street. The wreck of the ship was driven on shore on the day of their leaving Ross, and the manner in which the villains had lived in Fishertown and Ross, their general behaviour and other circumstances, being understood as grounds for suspicion of their being pirates, an express was dispatched by two gentlemen to the Lords of the Regency at Dublin, exhibiting the several causes of suspicion, and giving him particular description of the supposed delinquents. On examining the wreck a sampler worked by Miss Glass was found, from which it appeared that a part of the work was done on her birthday, which afterwards turned out to be the day preceding that on which the murders were perpetrated, and the sampler proved a principal means of leading to a discovery of the guilt of these abominable villains. The gentlemen who were commissioned to attend the Lords of the Regency had no sooner communicated their business than the Lord Mayor and Sheriffs were sent for, 
and proper instructions being given them, they on the same night caused McKinley and Zekerman to be taken into custody. The prisoners were separately examined, and they both confessed the particulars of their guilt, and that their accomplices had that morning hired a post-chaise for Cork, where they meant to embark on board a vessel bound for England. Gidley and St. Quintin were then on the next day secured at an inn on the road to Cork, and they followed the example of the other prisoners in acknowledging themselves guilty. The Sheriff of Ross took possession of the effects found in the wreck, and the bags of dollars that the villains had buried in the sand, and deposited the whole in the treasury of Dublin for the benefit of the proprietors. The prisoners being brought to trial, they confessed themselves guilty of the charges alleged in the indictment, and they were condemned and suffered death on the 19th of December, 1765, after which their bodies were hung in chains in the neighbourhood of Dublin. End of part 27「Twenty eight of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume One, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part twenty eight. Father Sheeby, James Buxton, and James Farrell, otherwise called Buck Farrell, executed for murder. About the year seventeen sixty six, Ireland was first visited by an atrocious gang calling themselves White Boys, who committed numerous atrocities in armed bodies, but whose deeds of blood at this time were only a prelude to those scenes of horror which have continued to be enacted even up to the present day. They were encouraged, it was reported, by a number of disaffected Roman Catholic priests, who seduced various misguided men of property of their persuasion to connive at and assist them in their nefarious practices. In the present instance, Father Sheeby, a Romish priest, persuaded Mr. Buxton, a gentleman of great property, and Mr. Farrell, a gay, thoughtless youth, of good family, and many others, to murder several Protestants who opposed the depredations of the white boys. On the 28th of October, 1764, this gang of murderers met on the lands of Shanhalli, where they were sworn by Father Sheeby to murder J. Bridge, Esquire, J. Bagnall, Esquire, the Reverend Dr. Hewitson, and, in fine, every person who might oppose them. He also swore them to be true to the French king, and to assist him to conquer Ireland, whereby they might completely establish the Roman Catholic religion. Thus prepared, these enthusiasts sallied out in pursuit of the blood of their fellow creatures. They soon seized Mr. Bridge, accused him of giving information against the white boys, and insisted that he should contradict upon oath all that he had said in his information and on his refusing to do so, Edward Meacham, one of the gang, whom, however, we do not find brought to punishment, cleft his skull in two with a bill-hook, and he instantly expired in the presence of the remainder of the gang. The persons whose names are mentioned above, having been apprehended on suspicion of being concerned in this cruel murder, were tried at Clonmel, and being found guilty, were executed in 1766. William Guest executed for diminishing the coin of the realm. Guest was the son of a clergyman of unblemished character of the city of Worcester, who placed him apprentice to a genteel business. He passed the term of apprenticeship to the satisfaction of his master, and then came to London and took a shop at Holborn, where he carried on business some years with the usual success of trade. His father's good name assisted him in procuring a clerkship in the Bank of England, and there he pursued a system of fraud which procured his execution for a crime amounting to high treason, that of diminishing the gold coin of the realm. He took a house in Broad Street Buildings, in a room in the upper part of which he used to work. Having procured a curious machine for milling guineas, not unlike that made use of by mathematical instrument makers, he used to take guineas from his drawer at the bank, file them and return them to the bank, and take out guineas of full weight in their stead. Of the filings he made ingots, which he sold to Anasea, who, on his trial, deposed that they were of the same standard as our guineas. About three years before his conviction he became a teller at the bank, and Mr. Leach, who was also a teller there, observing him picking out new guineas from the old ones, and having some suspicion watched him, to discover whether this was a frequent practice, and finding that it was, he communicated his suspicions to some others. On the 4th of July, 1766, Mr. Guest, paid thirty guineas to Richard Still, a servant to Mr. Corner, a dyer at Bankside, Southwark, and Leach, observing him take some gold out of a bag in the drawer, and put it among the rest of the table, went after Still, 
and asked him if his money was right, and begged he would walk with him into the pay-office and let him tell it over. The man consented, and Leach found three guineas that appeared to have been newly filed, which he took away, giving still other guineas for them. He then carried the light guineas into the hall, and showed them to Mr. Robert Bell, another teller, who carried them to Mr. Race, the principal cashier. The latter weighed them, and found that they wanted from ten pence to about fourteen pence of weight each, and he then, having examined the edges, delivered them to Leach. It is a custom at the bank for the cashier, in waiting, to take the teller's bags every night and lock them up, and Mr. Race, after these suspicious circumstances had appeared against the guest, ordered his bags to be examined after they were taken away. This was done by Mr. Thompson, one of the under-cashiers, and Kemp and Lucas, two indoor tellers, who found the whole sum they contained to be £1,800, 16 shillings and sixpence, and they found in one bag 40 guineas, which appeared to have been filed on the edges, and each of which was found to be deficient in weight, from eight pence to fourteen pence. In consequence of this discourse, Mr. Suallis and Mr. Humberton, servants to the bank, went with the proper officers to search Mr. Guest's house in Broad Street buildings, and in a room up two pairs of stairs they found a mahogany nest of drawers, which, being broken open, was discovered to contain a vice, files, an instrument proper for milling the edges of guineas, two bags of gold filings, and one hundred guineas. The nest of drawers had a flap before to let down, and a skin was found lying at the bottom, fastened to the back part of the flap, with a hole in the front part, to fasten to a button on the waistcoat, in the manner used by jewellers. Mr. Guest was then apprehended, and being brought to trial was found guilty, and sentenced to be executed. He subsequently zealously applied himself to the only duty which remained for him in this life to perform, that of making his peace with God, and was hanged on the 14th of October, 1767. Elizabeth Brownrigg, executed for murder. The case of this most notorious criminal is too well remembered to render any introduction to it necessary. The long scene of torture, in which the inhuman wretch kept the innocent object of her remorseless cruelty, ere she completed the long premeditated murder, requires no comment, engaging as it did the interest, and exciting the horror of all ranks of people, and rousing the indignation of the populace more than the case of any criminal whose offences it is our duty to record in the whole course of our melancholy narratives. The wretched subject of this memoir passed the early part of her life in the service of many respectable families in London, but at length being addressed by James Brownrigg, a plumber at Greenwich, she consented to marry him, and they were accordingly united in that town. After having resided at Greenwich during about seven years, they determined to remove to London, and they in consequence rented a house in Flower de Luce, Fleur de Lis, Court, Fleet Street, where Brownrigg carried on his trade, with so much success that he was enabled to hire a small house at Islington as a summer retreat. Their means, however, declining as their family increased to the number of sixteen, Mrs. Brownrigg applied to the overseers of the parish of St. Dunstan to be employed in the capacity of midwife to the workhouse, and testimonials having been produced of her ability, for she had already practised midwifery to a considerable extent, she was duly appointed. Her services were found to give entire satisfaction to the parish officers, and she now hit upon a new mode of adding to her income. She, in the year 1765, opened a house in which she advertised her readiness to receive women to lie in privately, but finding that the expense of keeping servants would be very great, she applied to the officers of the precinct of Whitefriars and of the Foundling Hospital for Girls to be apprenticed to her, to learn the duties of household servants. Two girls, named Mary Mitchell and Mary Jones, were immediately placed with her, the former from Whitefriars, and the latter from the Foundling Hospital, and it would appear that at first the poor orphans were treated with some degree of consideration and attention, but as soon as they became familiar with their mistress and their situation, the slightest inattention was sufficient to call down upon them the most severe chastisement. The first girl who experienced this brutal treatment was Jones, and it appears that her mistress would frequently, upon the smallest possible provocation, lay her down across two chairs in the kitchen, and there whip her until she was compelled, from mere weariness, to desist. The usual termination of this scene, of disgusting inhumanity, was that the mistress would throw water over her victim, or dip her head into a bucket of water, and then dismiss her to her own apartment. The room appointed for the girl to sleep in adjoined the passage leading to the street door. 
and after she had suffered this maltreatment for a considerable time, as she had received many wounds on her head, shoulders, and various parts of her body, she determined not to bear such usage any longer, if she could secure her liberty. Observing that the key was left in the street door when the family went to bed, therefore she opened it cautiously one morning, and escaped into the street. Thus freed from her horrid confinement, she repeatedly inquired her way to the foundling hospital, until she found it, and was admitted after describing in what manner she had been treated, and showing the bruises she had received. The child, having been examined by a surgeon, who found her wounds to be of a most alarming nature, the governors of the hospital ordered Mr. Plumtree, their solicitor, to write to James Brownrigg, threatening a prosecution, if he did not give a proper reason for the severities exercised towards the child, but no notice of this having been taken, the governors of the hospital, thinking it imprudent to indict at common law, the girl was discharged, in consequence of an application to the Chamberlain of London. The other girl, Mary Mitchell, continued with her mistress for the space of a year, during which she was treated with equal cruelty, and she also at length resolved to quit her service. An opportunity soon presented itself which favoured her design, but having escaped from the house, she was met in the street by the younger son of Brownrigg, who forced her to return home where her sufferings were greatly aggravated on account of her elopement in the interim mrs brownrigg found it necessary to fill up the place occupied by her late apprentice mary jones and she applied again to the overseers of the precinct of whitefriars who having learned nothing of the ill behaviour of the woman bound a girl named mary clifford to her who was doomed to fall a victim to her brutality and to be the cause of her eventual execution it was not long before the new apprentice experienced equal, if not greater, cruelties than those inflicted upon the other unfortunate girls. She was frequently tied up naked and beaten with a hearth-broom, a horsewhip, or a cane, till she was absolutely speechless, and the poor girl, having a natural infirmity, her mistress would not permit her to lie in a bed, but placed her on a mat in a coal-hole that was remarkably cold. After some time, however, a sack and a quantity of straw formed her bed, instead of the mat, but during her confinement in this wretched situation she had nothing to subsist on but bread and water, and her covering during the night consisted only of her own clothes, so that she sometimes lay almost perished with cold. On a particular occasion when she was almost starving with hunger she broke open a cupboard in search of food, but found it empty, and on another day being parched with thirst she tore down some boards in order to procure a draught of water these acts of what were deemed daring atrocity by her inhuman mistress immediately pointed her out as a proper mark for the most rigorous treatment and having been stripped to the skin she was kept naked during the whole day and repeatedly beaten with the butt-end of a whip in the course of this barbarous conduct mrs brownrigg fastened a jack-chain around her neck so tight as almost to strangle her and confined her by its means to the yard door in order to prevent her escape in case of her mistress's strength reviving, so as to enable her to renew the severities which she was inflicting on her, and a day having passed in the exercise of these most atrocious cruelties, the miserable girl was remanded to her cellar, her hands being tied behind her, and the chain being still round her neck, to be ready for a renewal of the cruelties on the following day. Determined then upon pursuing the wretched girl still further, Mrs. Brownrigg tied her hands together with a cord, and fixing a rope to her wrists, she drew her up to a water-pipe, which ran across the kitchen ceiling, and commenced a most unmerciful castigation. But the pipe giving way in the midst of it, she caused her husband to fix a hook in the beam, and then again hoisting up her miserable victim, she horsewhipped her until she was weary, the blood flowing at nearly every stroke. Nor was Mrs. Brownrigg the only tormentor of this wretched being, for her elder son having one day ordered her to put up a half-tester bedstead, her strength was so far gone that she was unable to obey him, on which he whipped her until she sunk insensible under the lash. At length the unhappy girl, being unable any longer to bear these unheard-of cruelties, complained to a French lady who lodged at the house, and entreated her interference to procure some remission of the frightful barbarities which had been practised upon her. The good-natured foreigner appealed to Mrs. Brownrigg, showing to her the inhumanity of her behaviour, but the only effect produced was a volley of abuse levelled at the person who interposed, and an attempt on the part of the monster to cut out the tongue of her apprentice with a pair of scissors, in the course of which she wounded her in two places. 
The close of this prolonged tragedy, however, now approached, when the disgusting barbarity of Mrs. Brownrigg, at which the heart recoils and sickens, was to be discovered and punished. In the month of July, the stepmother of Clifford, who had been living out of town, came to London for the purpose of inquiring after her daughter, and learning from the parish officers that she was in the service of Mrs. Brownrigg, she immediately proceeded to her house, and requested to be allowed to see her. She was, however, refused admittance by Mr. Brownrigg, who even threatened to carry her before the Lord Mayor if she came there to make further disturbances, and upon this she was going away, when Mrs. Deacon, the wife of Mr. Deacon, baker, at the adjoining house, called her in, and informed her that she and her family had often heard moanings and groans issue from Brownrigg's house, and that she suspected the apprentices were treated with unwarrantable severity. The suspicions of the neighbourhood, being thus raised, every means was employed to procure the unravelment of the truth, and the proceedings of the guilty parties themselves obtained the discovery of all their wickedness. At this juncture Mr. Brownrigg, going to Hampstead on business, bought a hog which he sent home, and the animal being put into a covered yard, having a skylight, it was thought necessary to remove the window in order to give it air. As soon as it was known that the skylight was removed, Mr. Deacon ordered his servants to watch, in order, if possible, to discover the girls. Accordingly, one of the maids, looking from the window, saw one of them stooping down. She immediately called her mistress, who procured the attendance of some of the neighbours, and having all of them been witness to the shocking scene which presented itself, some men got upon the leads, and dropped bits of dirt, in order to induce the girl to speak to them, but she seemed wholly incapable. Mrs. Deacon then sent to Clifford's mother-in-law, who immediately called upon Mr. Grundy, one of the overseers of St. Dunstan's, and represented the case. Mr. Grundy and the rest of the overseers, with the women, went and demanded the sight of Mary Clifford, but Brownrigg, who had nicknamed her Nan, told them that he knew no such person, but if they wanted to see Mary, meaning Mary Mitchell, they might, and she accordingly produced her. Upon this Mr. Deacon's servant declared that Mary Mitchell was not the girl they wanted, and Mr. Grundy now sent for a constable to search the house. An examination took place, but the girl being concealed, she was not found and the officers, notwithstanding the threats of Brownrigg, took Mitchell away. On their arriving at the workhouse, she was found to be in a most wretched state. Her body was covered with ulcerated sores, and on her taking off her leathern bodice, it stuck so fast to her wounds that she shrieked with the pain. But on being treated with great humanity, and told that she would not be sent back to Brownrigg's, she gave an account of the cruelties which she had undergone, which she described even more terrible than we have ventured to paint them. She also stated that she had met her fellow apprentice on the stairs immediately before the parish officers entered the house, and added that Mrs. Brownrigg had concealed her, so that she should not be found. Upon this Mr. Grundy and the others went back to Brownrigg's, and in spite of his threats of prosecution, proceeded to take him into custody. He then promised to produce the girl if he were allowed his liberty, and this being consented to, she was brought out of a cupboard under a beaufet in the dining-room. Words cannot adequately describe the condition of misery in which the unfortunate girl was found to be on her being examined. Medical assistance was immediately obtained, and she was pronounced to be in considerable danger, and Brownrigg was in consequence taken into custody, and conveyed to Wood Street Compter. His wife and son, alarmed at this proceeding, absconded, carrying with them some articles of value for their support, and Brownrigg subsequently, being carried before Mr. Alderman Crosby, was fully committed for trial upon the charge of having been guilty of violent assaults. The melancholy death of the girl Clifford, however, which took place in St. Bartholomew's Hospital a few days afterwards, altered the complexion of the offence, and a coroner's inquest having been summoned, a verdict of willful murder was returned against the three brown rigs, father, mother, and son. The two latter, in the meantime, had shifted about from place to place in London, and had taken every means in their power to disguise themselves, but at length they removed to Wandsworth, determined to await there the result of the trial of their relation. It so happened, however, that they took lodging in the house of a Mr. Dunbar, a chandler, and that person, having some suspicion of his guests, watched them narrowly, and seeing an advertisement which described their persons exactly, as being participators in the murder which had been committed, he caused their apprehension. At the ensuing session at the Old Bailey, the three prisoners were brought to trial and, after an investigation of eleven hours' duration, Mrs. Brownrigg was capitally convicted, but her husband and son were found not guilty of the offence imputed to them. Mrs. Brownrigg was immediately sentenced to undergo the extreme penalty of the law, while the participators in her guilt were detained for trial on the minor charge of misdemeanour, 
of which they were eventually convicted, and were sentenced to six months' imprisonment. After sentence had been pronounced, the unfortunate woman addressed herself to the Almighty, and being attended by the ordinary of the jail, she confessed to him the enormity of her guilt, and that the punishment which awaited her was a just one. The parting between her and her husband and son is described to have been one which exhibited the strongest affection to exist, and which appeared to call up all those better feelings of the heart in the breast of this wretched woman, which must have lain dormant during the whole course of the maltreatment to which she subjected her wretched apprentices. On her way to the scaffold she was assailed by the mob, who expressed the most unmitigated disgust for her crime and before the termination of her existence she appeared to be fully sensible of the awful situation in which she stood, and prayed the ordinary to acquaint the people that she confessed her crime, and acknowledged the justice of the sentence. After her execution, which took place at Tyburn, September the 14th, 1767, her body was put into a hackney coach, and conveyed to Surgeon's Hall, where it was dissected, and her skeleton hung up. End of part 28。part 29。of the chronicles of crime。volume 1。by camden pelham。this librivox recording is in the public domain。part 29。john williamson。executed for murder。the case of this criminal is a fit companion for that of the wretched being。whose fate we last described。Williamson was the son of people in but indifferent circumstances, who put him apprentice to a shoemaker. When he came to be a journeyman, he pursued his business with industry, and in a short time he married an honest and sober woman, by whom he had three children. His wife dying, he continued some time a widower, maintaining himself and his children in a decent manner. At length he contracted an acquaintance with a young woman, deficient in point of intellect, to whom he made proposals of marriage, in the anticipation of receiving a small sum of money which her relations had left her for her maintenance. The woman was nothing loath, and notwithstanding the opposition of her guardians, Williamson having procured a licence, the marriage was solemnised, and he in consequence received the money which he expected. Within three weeks after the marriage, his ill-treatment of his unhappy wife commenced, and having frequently beaten her in the most barbarous manner, he at length fastened the miserable creature's hands behind her with handcuffs, and, by means of a rope, passed through a staple in the ceiling of a closet where she was confined, drew them so tight above her head that only the tips of her toes touched the ground. On one side of the closet was now and then put a small piece of bread and butter, so that she could just touch it with her mouth, and she was daily allowed a small portion of water. She once remained a whole month without being released from this miserable condition, but during that time she occasionally received assistance from a female lodger in the house, and a little girl, Williamson's daughter by his former wife. The girl having once released the poor sufferer, the inhuman villain beat her with great severity. But when the father was abroad, the child frequently gave the unhappy woman a stool to stand upon, by which means her pain was in some degree abated. On the Sunday preceding the day on which she died, Williamson released his wife, and at dinner-time cut her some meat, of which, however, she ate only a very small quantity, her hands being greatly swelled through the coldness of the weather, and the pain occasioned by the handcuffs, she begged to be permitted to go near the fire, and the daughter joining in her request, Williamson complied, but when she had sat a few minutes, her husband, observing her throwing the vermin that swarmed upon her clothes into the fire, ordered her to return to her kennel. She immediately went back to the closet, the door of which was locked till the next day and she was then found to be in a delirious state, in which she continued till the time of her death, which happened about two o'clock on the Tuesday morning. The coroner's jury being summoned to sit on the body, Mr. Barton, a surgeon of Red Cross Street, who had opened it, declared that he was of the opinion that the deceased had perished through the want of the common necessaries of life, and other evidence being adduced to criminate Williamson, he was committed to Newgate. At the ensuing sessions at the Old Bailey, he was brought to trial before Lord Chief Baron Parker, and the principal witnesses against him were his daughter, Mrs. Cole, and Mr. Barton, the surgeon who opened the body of the deceased. The prisoner's defence was exceedingly frivolous. He said his wife had provoked him by treading upon a kitten and killing it, and then turning up the whites of her eyes. 
He had the effrontery also to declare to the court that he had not abridged his wife of any of the necessaries of life, and after sentence of death was pronounced, he reflected upon his daughter as being the cause of his destruction. Being put into the cells, he sent for a clergyman, and acknowledged that he had treated his wife in the cruel manner represented upon the trial, adding, however, that he had no design of depriving her of life, and he afterwards behaved in a decent and penitent manner. He was conveyed to the place of execution in a cart, attended by two clergymen and a Methodist preacher. The gallows was placed on the rising ground opposite Chiswell Street, in Moorfields, and after he had sung a psalm and prayed some time with an appearance of great devotion, he was turned off January 19th, 1767, amidst an amazing concourse of people. His body was conveyed to Surgeon's Hall for dissection, and his children were placed in Cripplegate Workhouse. Sarah Metyard and Sarah Morgan Metyard Executed for the murders of parish apprentices A single year had not elapsed since the public example made of Elizabeth Brownrigg, to which public indignation was yet alive, when these two, if possible more cruel women, were found guilty of torturing their apprentices to death. Sarah Metyard was a milliner, and her daughter her assistant, in Bruton Street, Hanover Square, London. In the year 1758, the mother had five apprentice girls bound to her from different parish workhouses, among whom were Anne Naylor and her sister. Anne Naylor, being of a sickly constitution, was not able to do so much work as the other apprentices, and she therefore became the more immediate object of the fury of her mistress. The ill-treatment which she experienced at length induced the unhappy girl to abscond, but being pursued, she was brought back and confined in an upper apartment where her food consisted of a small piece of bread and a draught of water only each day. Seizing an opportunity, she again attempted to escape, but a young mistress was in time to see her run out, and following her and seizing her by the neck, she brought her back, and with great violence thrust her into an upper room. The old woman then interfered, and catching the girl, she threw her on the bed, while her daughter beat her unmercifully with a hearth-brush. This done, they put her in the back room, and fixing a cord round her waist, they tied her hands behind her, and fastened her to the handle of the door, so as to prevent her sitting or lying down. And in order that the example of her punishment might intimidate her fellow apprentices, they were ordered to work in the adjoining apartment, strict injunctions, however, being given to them to afford the prisoner no relief whatever. In this condition, without the smallest nourishment of any kind, the wretched girl remained for three days and two nights, when, having been let loose in order that she might go to bed, she crept up to the garret in a state of great exhaustion. On the fourth day she faltered in her speech, but was nevertheless again conveyed to what was worse than her condemned cell, and there in the course of a very short time she expired, her body being suspended by the cords which had again been placed round her person. The other girls, seeing that her whole weight was thus supported, cried out that she did not move, and the younger Metyard, coming up, said, "'If she does not move soon, I'll make her,' and immediately beat her on the head with the heel of a shoe, but finding that, in truth, she was senseless, she sent for her mother to come and assist her. The body was then released from its bonds, and efforts were made to restore animation, but without effect, and Mrs. Metchard, being convinced that the child was dead, removed her remains into the garret. On the return of the other children, who had been sent out of the way, they were informed that the girl had been in a fit, but was perfectly recovered, and it was added that she was now locked in a garret, in order that she should not run away and to strengthen the effect of this story, a plate of meat was sent up to the room where the body lay in the middle of the day for her dinner. On the fourth day a design was formed to follow up the tale which had been related, and the body of the deceased, having been locked in a box, the garret door and the street door were left open, and one of the apprentices was desired to call Nanny down to dinner, and to tell her that, if she would promise to behave well in the future, she would no longer be confined. Upon the return of the child, she said, Nanny was not above stairs, and after a great parade in searching every part of the house, the Metyards reflected upon her as being of an untractable disposition, and pretended that she had run away. The sister of the deceased, who was apprenticed to the same mistress, mentioned to a lodger in the house that she was persuaded her sister was dead, observing that it was not probable she had gone away, since her shoes, shift, and other parts of her apparel still remained in the garret and the suspicions of this girl coming to the knowledge of the inhuman wretches, they, with a view of preventing discovery, cruelly murdered her, and secreted the body. The body of Anne remained in the box two months, during which time the garret door was kept locked, 
lest the offensive smell should lead to a discovery, but the stench at length becoming very powerful, they judged it prudent to remove the remains of the unhappy victim of their barbarity, and therefore in the evening of the 25th of December they cut the body in pieces, and tied the head and trunk up in one cloth and the limbs in another, excepting one hand, a finger belonging to which had been amputated before death, which they resolved to burn. When the apprentices were gone to bed, the old woman put the hand into the fire, saying, The fire tells no tales. But fearing that the consumption of the whole body would create an unpleasant smell, they determined to dispose of its parts by throwing them into the common sewer in Chick Lane. Being unable to effect this, however, they left them among the mud and water that was collected before the grate of the sewer, and some pieces of the body being discovered about twelve o'clock by the watchman, he mentioned the circumstance to the constable of the night. The constable applied to one of the overseers of the parish, by whose direction the parts of the body were collected and taken to the watch-house. On the following day the matter was communicated to Mr. Umfreville, the coroner, who examined the pieces found by the watchman, but supposing them to be parts of a corpse taken from a churchyard for the use of some surgeon, he declined summoning a jury. Four years elapsed before the discovery of these horrid murders, but at length the dissensions which frequently occurred between their wretched perpetrators procured their apprehension and conviction. It appears that the mother was in the habit of treating her daughter with a brutality almost equal to that which she had exhibited to her apprentices, and about two years after the murders a gentleman of the name of Rooker took lodgings in the house of Metchard, where he lived about three months, during which time he had frequent opportunities of observing the severity which she suffered. He afterwards hired a house in Hill Street, and influenced by compassion for her sufferings, and being desirous of relieving her from the tyranny of her mother, he invited the girl to live in his family in the capacity of a servant, which offer she cheerfully embraced, though her mother had many times violently opposed her desire of going to service. The girl had no sooner removed to Mr. Rooker's house than the old woman became perfectly outrageous, and it was almost her daily practice to create disturbances in Mr. Rooker's neighbourhood by venting the most bitter execrations against the girl, and branding her with the most opprobrious epithets. Mr. Rooker subsequently removed to Ealing to reside on a little estate bequeathed him by a relation, and having by this time seduced the girl, she accompanied him, and lived with him professedly in the character of his mistress. The old woman's visits were not less frequent at Ealing than they had been at Mr. Rooker's house in London, nor was her behaviour less outrageous. On the ninth of June, 1768, being admitted to the house, she beat her daughter in a terrible manner, and during the contention many expressions were uttered by both parties that gave great uneasiness to Mr. Rooker. The mother called Mr. Rooker the old perfumed tea-dog, and the girl resorted by saying, "'Remember, mother, you are the perfumer. You are the chick-lane ghost.' The mother, having retired, Mr. Rooker urged the girl to explain what was meant to be insinuated by the indirect accusations introduced by both parties in the course of the dispute, and bursting into tears, she confessed the particulars of the murders, begging that a secret so materially affecting her mother might never be divulged. Mr. Rooker imagined that the daughter could not be rendered amenable to the law, as she performed her share in the murders by the direction of her mother, and he wrote to the overseers of the parish of Tottenham, acquainting them with what he had learned. The elder Metyard was in consequence taken into custody, and the evidence against her being conclusive, she was fully committed for trial. Some circumstances, however, having come out which served to criminate her daughter, she was also secured, and with her mother was sent to Newgate to abide her trial. When arraigned upon the indictment preferred against them at the ensuing Old Bailey sessions, they bitterly reproached one another, with the part each had taken in the affair, and if any evidence of their guilt had been wanting, their own declarations at this time would have been sufficient to secure their conviction. The jury immediately found them guilty, and they were sentenced to undergo the severest penalty of the law. The younger prisoner pleaded that she was pregnant on being called up to receive judgment, but a jury of matrons being assembled, they declared her plea false, and she was sentenced immediately. On the day fixed for their execution, the elder prisoner was found to be in a state of utter insensibility, and in that condition she was carried to the scaffold, and, all efforts to restore her having failed, was turned off. Her daughter prayed for a few minutes with the ordinary who attended her, but was in almost as melancholy a condition as her mother. They were executed at Tyburn on the 19th of July, 1768, and their bodies were afterwards dissected at Surgeon's Hall. Frederick Lord Baltimore, Elizabeth Griffenberg, and Anne Harvey. 
tried for the commission of a rape, the females, as accessories before the fact. Although the trial of these persons was not followed by a conviction, the extraordinary nature of the transactions described by the prosecutrix in the case renders it our duty to state the facts alleged as they appeared at the trial. The title which was inherited by Lord Baltimore, who was a peer of Ireland, was originally granted by James I to Mr. Calvert, from whom he was lineally descended, together with a large tract of land in America, now called Maryland. His lordship is related to have exhibited a taste for knowledge in early life, and was sent from Epsom, where he was born, to Eton, where he soon gained a considerable acquaintance with the classics. His father, dying before he was of age, left him an ample fortune, and he is said to have shown at this time the existence of that passion which subsequently brought him into the difficulty from which he was compelled to extricate himself before a jury of his country. In obedience to the custom of the times, the young lord proceeded to perform the grand tour, and it is reported that having sailed from Naples to Constantinople, he there imbibed so great an admiration for the manners of the Turks, that on his return to England in 1766, he caused a portion of his family mansion to be taken down and to be rebuilt in the form of a harem. His lordship was not long in completing his new establishment, and, like the persons whose customs he imitated, he gave to its inmates certain rules, by which he directed that their conduct and demeanour should be regulated. The disgusting passions of his lordship, however, knew no bounds, and agents were employed in London, whose duty it was to select new objects for the gratification of his lustful desires. Amongst others who were thus engaged in this degrading office were the women Griffenberg, who was a native of Germany, and the wife of a doctor Griffenberg, and Harvey, whose names appear at the head of this article. They were both women of low education, and their duty was to discover and point out persons who might be deemed worthy of the attentions of their employer, and in case of necessity to aid him in securing the end which he had in view. In the course of their brutal and inhuman searches in this occupation, they unfortunately discovered a young woman of considerable personal attractions, and of some respectability, named Woodcock, who kept a milliner's shop in Tower Hill, and Mrs. Harvey acquainting his lordship with her residence. In November 1767, he directly proceeded to the spot for the purpose of pursuing his diabolical designs. Calling at Miss Woodcock's shop, he purchased some articles of trifling value, with a view of making an acquaintance with her, and then, having succeeded in opening a conversation with her, he invited her to accompany him to the theatre. Miss Woodcock declined the offer, saying that her religious opinions taught her to believe that theatrical entertainments were incompatible with the due exercise of the worship of the Almighty, and his lordship, finding all his efforts to attain his object vain, retired, but only to put his agent, Mrs. Harvey, to work. Introducing herself as a customer, this infamous woman called repeatedly at the shop of her intended victim, and purchased ruffles and other articles of millinery. On the 14th of December, however, she proceeded to take active measures in her plot, and then ordering a pair of lace ruffles to be made by the following day, she directed Miss Woodcock to take them herself to her residence in the Curtain Road, Shoreditch, declaring that they were for a lady of rank and fortune, who was desirous of encouraging her in her business, and who, if the order was punctually obeyed, would without doubt become an excellent customer. The ruffles were finished and carried home at the appointed time, and then Miss Woodcock, being invited in, was received politely by Mrs. Harvey, who pressed her to stay for tea. She declined the invitation on the ground that it would be dark before she could reach home if she remained, but at this moment a man named Isaacs came in, who said he was going to the theatre, and Mrs. Harvey expressing a desire at once to convey the goods which had been brought to her to the lady for whom they were ordered, it was eventually agreed, after some objections on the part of Miss Woodcock as to her dress, that as Isaacs must hire a coach, they should all go together. At this time Lord Baltimore's carriage was waiting in the neighbourhood, and the Jew going out called it up, and all three got into it, Miss Woodcock making no remark as to whether it was a private or hired conveyance. The coachman drove at a great pace, and after they had traversed many streets, the vehicle was driven into the courtyard of a house, which appeared to be that of a person of consideration. Mrs. Harvey and Miss Woodcock then alighted, and being ushered into the house, they were conducted through several apartments, until they reached one in which an elderly gentleman, afterwards known as Dr. Griffenberg, was seated, and he immediately retired, saying that he would acquaint the lady of the house with their arrival. 
Lord Baltimore soon afterwards entered, and Miss Woodcock was alarmed to find that he was the person who had visited her shop. He bid her rest quiet, however, saying that he was only the steward of the lady whom she was to see, and then quitted the room, but soon afterwards returned with Mrs. Griffenberg, who conversed with her as if she had expected her coming, and was the lady of the house. Orders were afterwards given for tea, and on the equipage being removed from the table, Lord Baltimore presented some trinkets to Miss Woodcock, which he said he had purchased for her. As the evening advanced, she became anxious to return, and expressed her fears that her relatives would be surprised at her long absence. But his lordship, in order to divert her from this purpose, took her to view the apartments in the house, and at length, on her becoming still more importunate, insisted that she should stay for supper. Private orders having been given for the preparation of the meal, and Mrs. Griffenberg having retired, his lordship began taking liberties of an indecent character with the young lady. But on her exclaiming against this treatment, Mrs. Harvey and Dr. Griffenberg appeared, as if to aid in opposing her escape in the event of her attempting to obtain her liberty. Supper was soon afterwards served, but it does not appear that any idea was entertained by Miss Woodcock of an intention to detain her forcibly until after this meal, when Lord Baltimore told her that there were no coaches to be had then, and that she must remain for the night. Mrs. Griffenberg and Mrs. Harvey now endeavoured to prevail on the young lady to go to bed, but she declared that she would never sleep in that house, and although they conducted her to a room in which they went to rest, she continued walking about till the morning and lamenting her unhappy fate. Looking out of the window at about eight o'clock, she observed a young woman passing, to whom she threw out her handkerchief, which was then heavy with tears, intending to attract her attention and send to her father for assistance. But the two women, jumping out of bed, prevented the possibility of her holding any communication with her, and upbraided her for what they called the rejection of her good fortune, declaring their wishes that they were in her happy situation. The women now quitting the room, Lord Baltimore and Dr. Griffenberg came in soon afterwards, when the former said that he was astonished at her outrageous behaviour, as he had promised that she should go home at twelve o'clock, but she replied that they had no right to detain her, and that she would go home directly, as her sister, and particularly her father, would be inexpressibly anxious on occasion of her absence. To this no answer was made, but Lord Baltimore conducted her downstairs, and ordered breakfast. She refused, however, to eat, and having wept incessantly till twelve o'clock, at that hour she once more demanded her liberty. His lordship then said that he loved her to excess, that he could not part with her, but that he did not intend any injury to her, and would write to her father, and on this he wrote a letter, on which the following is a copy, and in it sent a bank-note of two hundred pounds. Your daughter Sally sends you the enclosed, and desires you will not be uneasy on her account, because everything will turn out well, with a little patience and prudence. She is at a friend's house, safe and well, in all honesty and honour, nothing else is meant, you may depend on it, and, sir, as your presence and consent are necessary, we beg of you to come in a private manner to Mr. Richard Smith's in Broad Street Buildings. Having addressed this to her father, he showed it to her, and desired that she would write a few words at the bottom, signifying her compliance with its terms, and terrified by her condition, she wrote, Dear father, this is true, and should be glad you would come this afternoon, your dutiful daughter. From the statement of the young lady, it appears that after this she conjured her lordship to give her her liberty, pointing out to him in the most striking manner the degradation to which she was subjected. But all her arguments were in vain, and she was again compelled to pass the night, as before, in the room with Mrs. Griffenberg and Mrs. Harvey. In the morning, by permission of his lordship, she wrote a letter to her father, desiring him to come to her immediate assistance, but saying that she had been treated with as much honour as she could expect. But still she declined holding any conversation with his lordship, and used all her efforts to make her situation known to the passers-by. In this, however, she was checked by his lordship and the women, who threatened to throw her out of the window in the event of her making any disturbance. Towards the middle of the day she was told that her father had called at Mr. Smith's, but had refused to wait until she was sent for. But at midnight Mr. Broughton, his lordship's steward, brought intelligence that Isaacs, the Jew, having offered a letter to Miss Woodcock's father, was stopped till he should give an account of where the young lady was secreted. Lord Baltimore was, or affected to be, in a violent passion, and vowed vengeance against the father, but in the interim the Jew entered and delivered a letter which he pretended to have received from Miss Woodcock's sister, and she took it to read, but she had wept so much that her eyes were sore, 
and of all she read she could only recollect this passage, only pleased to appoint a place where and when we may meet with you. The hour of retirement being now arrived, Miss Woodcock refused to go upstairs, unless she might be assured of not receiving any insult from his lordship. She had not taken any sustenance since she entered the house, and on this night she lay down in her clothes on a bed in which Mrs. Harvey reposed herself. She then asked this woman if she had ever been in love, and acknowledged that she herself was addressed by a young fellow, who appeared very fond of her, and that they were to settle in business as soon as the marriage should take place, and she desired Mrs. Harvey to show her the way out of the house that had been so obnoxious to her, but the answer of the latter was, that though she had lived in the house several years, she did not herself know the way out of it. On the following morning, when Miss Woodcock went downstairs, she pleaded earnestly with Lord Baltimore for her liberty, on which he became most violently enraged, called her by the vilest names, and said that if she spoke to him on the subject any more, he would either throw her out of the window, or send her home in a wheelbarrow with her petticoats tied over her head, and turning to Isaacs the Jew, he said, "'Take the slut to a mean house like herself.' which greatly terrified her, as she presumed he meant her house of ill fame. The suffering she had undergone, having by this time made her extremely ill, Lord Baltimore mixed a draught for her which he insisted on her drinking, and in the afternoon he compelled her to sit by his side to hear him converse upon the subjects of religion, in the course of which, however, he ridiculed everything sacred, and denied the existence of a soul. After supper he made six several attempts to ravish her within two hours, but she repulsed him in such a determined manner that he failed in accomplishing his dishonourable purpose. On that night she lay with Mrs. Harvey, but could get no rest, as she was in fear of renewed insults from his lordship. On the Monday morning she was told that she should see her father, and having been supplied with a change of linen by Mrs. Griffenberg, she was about midday hurried into a coach with Lord Baltimore, Dr. Griffenberg, and the two women and with them conveyed to Epsom, where, as we have already said, his lordship had a country seat. Here she was told that resistance was useless, and that whatever objection she might make to submit to his lordship's desires, force would be used if her consent was not given. At supper she partook of some refreshment, and immediately afterwards she was conducted to a bedchamber, accompanied by the two women who began to undress her. From weakness she was unable to make much resistance, and from the same cause she was prevented from opposing Lord Baltimore, who, it turned out, was in a bed which was in the apartment, and who, in spite of her cries and entreaties, twice effected his horrid purpose. In the morning Mrs. Harvey came to her, and she told her what had passed, but the only answer which was given was a desire that she should make no more fuss, for that she had made noise enough already. It would appear that after this the proceedings of his lordship were, to a certain extent, acquiesced in by Miss Woodcock, but it was not until several days had elapsed that she ascertained the name of the person who had dishonoured her. On the afternoon of which she made this discovery, the whole party returned to London, and Miss Woodcock was there introduced to Madame Saunier, the governess of his lordship's illegitimate children. On the next day his lordship gave her some money, and, when night advanced, directed that she should repair to his bed. Having been permitted on the night before to sleep by herself, she requested that the same favour might again be granted to her, but his lordship's commands being positive that she should share his couch, she consented on certain terms, which were fulfilled, while, according to her statement, a crime of a still more atrocious nature was committed. It may now be inquired whether no steps were taken by Miss Woodcock's friends in order to procure her discovery, and the return to the roof of her parents, and it appears that some circumstances having been learned which induced them to guess the real place of her concealment, Davis, her lover, proceeded to Southampton Row, Bloomsbury, where his lordship's house was situated, and while watching there he saw her at the window. He immediately communicated the discovery which he had made to her father, and the advice of Mr. Watts, an attorney, having been taken, a writ of habeas corpus was obtained. These proceedings, however, were heard of by his lordship, and he conversed with Miss Woodcock on the subject, and, as she alleged, extorted from her a promise to declare that she had remained at his house voluntarily, and of her own free will, promising to recompense her by settling upon her an annuity for life. She, in consequence, wrote a letter to her father to that effect, which was delivered by one of his lordship's servants, and on Mr. Watts proceeding to the house to serve the writ of habeas corpus, she made a declaration to him having the same tendency. 
Lord Baltimore then said that it was necessary that she should go before Lord Mansfield and make a similar statement, and she was accordingly conveyed to his lordship's house in Bloomsbury Square. They were there shown into different apartments, and Miss Woodcock's friends, having heard of the proceeding, were also in attendance in an antechamber where they awaited the result of the conference. The young lady, on being examined by Lord Mansfield, expressed her willingness to remain with Lord Baltimore, but desired to see her friends first. She was then conducted to the room where her father was awaiting the conclusion of her examination, and there the first question which she asked was, Who is Lord Mansfield? Having been satisfied upon this head, and also that he had the power to set her at liberty, she desired to see him again, and then said she wished to go home with her father, and that she would no longer remain with Lord Baltimore. On Miss Woodcock's discharge, Mr. K., a baker in Whitecross Street, to whom her father had delivered the two hundred pound banknote, which had been enclosed in the letter by Lord Baltimore, conveyed the young lady to Sir John Fielding, before whom she swore to the actual commission of the rape by his lordship. The two women, the coadjutors of his lordship, had been already taken into custody on the charge of decoying away the girl, and a warrant was now issued for the apprehension of Lord Baltimore. His lordship, however, secreted himself for the present, but surrendered himself to the court of the King's Bench on the last day of Hillary term, 1768, when the two women being brought thither by habeas corpus, they were all admitted to bail, in order for a trial at Kingston in Surrey, because the crime was alleged to have been committed at his lordship's seat at Epsom. In the interim, Miss Woodcock went to the house of a Mr. K. in Whitecross Street, but not being properly accommodated there, she proceeded to the house of a friend where she lived in great privacy and retirement till the time arrived for the trial of the offending parties. Bills of indictment being found against Lord Baltimore and the two women, they were all brought to the trial before Lord Chief Baron Smythe, and after the evidence against them had been given, in substance as may be collected from the preceding narrative, Lord Baltimore made the following defence, which was read in court by Mr. Hammersley, solicitor to his lordship. My lords and gentlemen, I have put myself upon my country, in hopes that prejudice and clamour will avail nothing in this place, where it is the privilege of the meanest of the king's subjects, to be presumed innocent until his guilt has been made appear by legal evidence. I wish I could say that I had been treated abroad with the same candour. I have been loaded with obloquy, the most malignant libels have been circulated, and every other method which malice could devise has been taken to create general prejudice against me. I thank God that, under such circumstances, I have had firmness and resolution enough to meet my accusers face to face, and provoke an inquiry into my conduct. Hic murus aheneus esto, nil conscire sibi. The charge against me, and against these poor people who are involved with me because they might otherwise have been just witnesses of my innocence, is in its nature very easy to be made, and hard to be disproved. The accuser has the advantage of supporting it by a direct and positive oath, the defence can only be collected from circumstances. My defence is composed, then, of a variety of circumstances, all tending to show the falsity of this charge, the absurdity of it, the improbability that it could be true. It will be laid before the jury, under the direction of my counsel, and I have the confidence of an innocent man, that it will be manifest to your lordship, the jury, and the whole world, that the story told by this woman is a perversion of truth in every particular. What could induce her to make such a charge, I can only suspect. Very soon after she came to my house, upon a representation to me that her father was distressed, I sent him a considerable sum of money. Whether the ease with which that money was obtained from me might suggest the idea, as a means of obtaining a larger sum of money, or whether it was thought necessary to destroy me in order to establish the character of the girl to the world, I know not. But I do aver, upon the word of a man of honour, that there is no truth in anything which has been said or sworn of my having offered violence to this girl. I ever held such brutality in abhorrence. I am totally against all force, and for me to have forced this woman, considering my weak state of health and my strength, is not only a moral but a physical impossibility. She is, as to bodily strength, stronger than I am. Strange opinions upon subjects foreign to this charge have been falsely imputed to me to inflame this accusation. Libertine, as I am represented, I hold no such opinions. Much has been said against me, that I seduce this girl from her parents. Seduction is not the point of this charge, but I do assure your lordship and the jury, this part of the case has been aggravated exceedingly beyond the truth. If I have been in any degree to blame, 
I am sure I have sufficiently atoned for every indiscretion which a weak attachment to this unworthy woman may have led me into by having suffered the disgrace of being exposed as a criminal at the bar in the county which my father had the honour to represent in Parliament, and where I had some pretensions to have attained the same honour, had that sort of an active life been my object. I will take up no more of your lordship's time than to add that, if I had been conscious of the guilt now imputed to me, I would have kept myself and my fortune out of the reach of the laws of this country. I am a citizen of the world. I could have lived anywhere, but I love my own country, and submit to its laws. Resolving that my innocence should be justified by the laws, I now, by my own voluntary act, by surrendering myself to the court of King's Bench, stake, upon the verdict of twelve men, my life, my fortune, and what is dearer to me, my honour. Baltimore, March 25th, 1768 the substance of the defence of Mrs. Griffenberg and Mrs. Harvey consisted principally in alleging that Miss Woodcock had consented to all that had passed, and that no force had been used towards her either by Lord Baltimore or themselves. The whole of the case having now been heard, Lord Chief Baron Smythe, in a clear and lucid manner, proceeded to sum up the case to the jury. Having pointed out to them the law of the case, as it affected the charge against the prisoners, and their defence, his lordship proceeded to recapitulate the evidence which had been produced, in doing which he was occupied during a period of three hours. He concluded by saying, In point of law, the fact is fully proved on my lord and the two other prisoners, if you believe the evidence of Sarah Woodcock. It is a crime which in its nature can only be proved by the woman on whom it was committed, for she only can tell whether she consented or no. It is, as my lord observes, very easy to be made, and hard to be disproved, and the defence can only be collected from circumstances. From these you must judge whether her evidence is or is not to be believed. Lord Hale, in his History of the Pleas of the Crown, lays down the rules. 1. If complaint is not made soon after the injury is supposed to be received. 2. If it is not followed by a recent prosecution, a strong presumption arises that the complaint is malicious she has owned the injury was received december twenty second the complaint was not made until december twenty ninth but she has accounted for it in the manner you have heard the strong part of the case on behalf of the prisoners is her not complaining when she was at lord mansfield's the supreme magistrate of the kingdom in criminal matters you have heard how she has explained and accounted for her conduct in that particular which you will judge of Upon the whole, if you believe that she made the discovery as soon as she knew she had an opportunity of doing it, and that her account is true, you will find all the prisoners guilty. If you believe that she did not make the discovery as soon as she had an opportunity, and from thence or other circumstances are not satisfied her account is true, you will find them all not guilty. For if he is not guilty, they cannot be so, for they cannot be accessory to a crime which was never committed." After an absence of an hour and twenty minutes, the jury returned with a verdict that the prisoners were not guilty. This singular affair was tried at Kingston in Surrey on the 26th of March, 1768. It would be useless to offer any observations upon this extraordinary case. From the verdict returned by the jury, there ought to exist no doubt of the innocence of the persons charged of the offence imputed to them, but although Lord Baltimore and his companions were acquitted of the charge of rape, there can be little doubt that the ruin of the unfortunate girl Woodcock, even if what was admitted by his lordship were only true, was the effect of a vile conspiracy among the prisoners to sacrifice her to the libertine passions of his lordship. End of part 29《of the Chronicles of Crime》Volume 1 by Camden Pelham This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 30 John Wilkes, Esquire, Convicted of Sedition and Blasphemy The year 1768 will ever be memorable in the annals of English history on account of the murders and mischief committed by a deluded mob stimulated by the writings and opposition to the government of John Wilkes, Esquire, an alderman of London and Member of Parliament for Aylesbury. The most scandalous and offensive of his writings were in a periodical publication called The North Britain, 
number 45, and a pamphlet entitled An Essay on Woman. Footnote. The Essay on Woman was a parody on Pope's sublime work called An Essay on Man. A learned divine, the Reverend Mr. Kidgel, thus writes on the works of Wilkes. On the title page is an obscene print with a Greek inscription signifying the Saviour of the World. We shall, the poison of the publication being long eradicated, merely quote a commentator on the subject. In this work, An Essay on Woman, the lewdest thoughts are expressed in terms of the greatest obscenity, the most horrid impurity is minutely represented, the sex is vilified and insulted, and the whole is scurrilous, impudent and impious, to an incredible degree. In the variations and notes, the inspired writings are perverted into the gross ideas of a libidinous blasphemer, with an invention new, wonderful and horrid. The most solemn and important passages of the Gospel are tortured into the oblique obscenity of double meanings, worthy only of him who is at once the enemy of God and man. End of footnote. The North Britain was of a political nature, the other a piece of obscenity, the one calculated to set the people against the government, the other to corrupt their morals. Amongst the ministers who found themselves more personally attacked in the North Britain was Samuel Martin, Esquire, member for Camelford. This gentleman found his character as Secretary to the Treasury so vilified that he called the writer to the field. He had before been engaged in a duel with Lord Talbot, and had then escaped unhurt, but Mr. Martin shot him, and the wound proved so dangerous that he lay uncertain of recovering during several days, and was confined to his house for some weeks. His sufferings, however, did not end here, for the Attorney-General filed informations against him as author of the North Britain, number 45, and the pamphlet entitled An Essay on Woman. Footnote. The paper entitled The North Britain was ordered to be burnt by the common executioner at the Royal Exchange. Mr. Alderman Harley, one of the sheriffs of London, attending in his official capacity to see this carried into execution, was assaulted and wounded by the mob. A man of the name of John Franklin was seized as one of the offenders, and committed to Newgate. On the day of the conviction of Wilkes he was tried for this outrage at the Old Bailey, and found guilty. When the trial was ended, the worthy alderman addressed the court in behalf of the prisoner. He said that, for his part, he had forgiven the affront offered to his own person, that justice required a prosecution. It had been, by the conviction of the offender, in part satisfied, and therefore he hoped the court would mitigate his punishment. The court complied with the prosecutor's humane request, and sentenced the prisoner to a short imprisonment, to pay a fine of six shillings and eight pence, and to find security for his good behaviour for one year. End of footnote. On these charges he was apprehended, and his papers having been seized and inspected, he was committed prisoner to the Tower, but was soon admitted to bail. Before his trial came on, Mr. Wilkes fled to France, under the pretext of restoring his health, which had suffered from his wound, and the harassing measures taken against him by the Secretaries of State, Lord Egremont and Lord Halifax, and no sooner was he out of the kingdom than the ministers proceeded to outlawry, dismissed him from his command as Colonel of the Buckinghamshire Militia, and expelled him from his seat in Parliament. While in Paris, he was challenged to fight by Captain Forbes, on account of the reflections which he had cast upon the birthplace of the gallant Captain, Scotland, but he declined the invitation, alleging that he had still an affair to settle with Lord Egremont, before he could venture to take any other duel upon his hands. The death of that noble lord, however, left him free to fight, but on his writing to accept the challenge, his antagonist was not to be found. Mr. Wilkes subsequently returned to London, and gave notice that he should appear to answer the charges preferred against him on a certain day, and then, having appeared in his place as an alderman in Guildhall, on his return the mob took the horses from his carriage and dragged it to his house, crying, Wilkes and Liberty! On the 21st of February, 1764, the trial of Mr. Wilkes, upon the accusations alleged against him, came on before Lord Mansfield, and he was found guilty on both charges, subject to arguments upon certain points as to the validity of his apprehension, the seizure of his papers, and the judgment of outlawry which had been obtained against him. The discussions preliminary to these arguments occupied the courts at various times during a space of two years, and in the meantime the popularity of Mr. Wilkes and the outrages of the mob increased daily. At length, on the 27th of April, 1768, Mr. Wilkes, having been served with a writ of capias utlegatum, 
was brought to the floor of the court of King's Bench in the custody of the proper officer, in order that the question of his being admitted to bail might be considered. A long argument took place, but it terminated in favour of the Crown, and Mr. Wilkes was conveyed to the King's Bench prison. On his way thither, the mob seized the coach, in which he was carried, and taking the horses from it, dragged him to a public house in Spitalfields, where they permitted him to alight, but at about eleven o'clock at night he effected his escape from his overzealous friends, and, proceeding to the prison, immediately surrendered himself unto the lawful custody. On the following day he was visited by many of his friends, and a vast mob having collected outside the prison, it was feared that some outrage would be committed. All remained quiet, however, until night, when the rails by which the prison wall was surrounded were pulled up and burned as a bonfire, and the inhabitants of Southwark were compelled to illuminate their houses. But upon the arrival of a captain's guard of soldiers, the crowd dispersed without doing any further mischief. On the 28th of April the case of outlawry was determined, and Mr. Sergeant Glynn, having appeared on the part of Mr. Wilkes, and the Attorney-General for the Crown, a learned and lengthy argument was heard, the result of which was a unanimous expression on the part of the court that the outlawry must be reversed. The general warrant on which the accused had been apprehended was next considered and declared illegal, but the counsel for the Crown then immediately moved that judgment might be passed upon Mr. Wilkes upon the several convictions which had taken place. This was answered by a motion on his part in arrest of judgment, and the following Thursday was fixed upon for the hearing the point argued. In the meantime a mob had remained assembled around the prison, whom no efforts of the civil force could disperse, but at length the justices appeared, followed by a troop of soldiers, determined at once to put an end to the alarming nuisance which had so long existed. All attempts to procure the separation of the crowd by fair means having failed, the riot act was read, and this also having no effect, the soldiers were ordered to fire. The command was instantly obeyed, and many persons were killed and dangerously wounded, some of whom were passing at a distance from the scene of confusion. At length the day arrived on which the last effort was to be made to get rid of the charges against Mr. Wilkes, but the arguments for an arrest of judgment, though carried on with great ingenuity, would not hold, and he was found to have been legally convicted of writing the libels. For that, in the North Britain, he was fined five hundred pounds, and sentenced to two years' imprisonment in the King's Bench prison, and for the essay on a woman, five hundred pounds more, a further imprisonment of twelve months, and to find security for his good behaviour for seven years. Previously to his imprisonment, Mr. Wilkes had been elected Member of Parliament for Middlesex, when the address which he published to his constituents contained the following passages. In the whole progress of ministerial vengeance against me for several years, I have shown, to the conviction of all mankind, that my enemies have trampled on the laws, and have been actuated by the spirit of tyranny and arbitrary power. The general warrant under which I was first apprehended has been judged illegal. The seizure of my papers was condemned judicially. The outlawry, so long the topic of violent abuse, is at last declared to have been contrary to law, and on the ground first taken by my friend Mr. Sergeant Glynn is formally reversed. The mob, after the election, proceeded to the commission of the most violent outrages. They broke the windows of Lord Bute, the Prime Minister, and of the Mansion House, including even those of the Lady Mayoress's bedchamber, and forced the inhabitants of the metropolis to illuminate their houses, crying out Wilkes and Liberty, and all who refused to echo it back were knocked down. A stone was thrown by this daring mob at the Polish Count Rowotsky, which he dexterously caught in his hand, the windows of his carriage in which he sat being fortunately down, and his lordship looking out and smiling, he received no other violence. The outrages of the populace were too many to be enumerated, several innocent people were killed, and vast numbers wounded. They broke windows without number, destroyed furniture, and even insulted royalty itself. These disgraceful tumults were not confined to the metropolis, and the lenity, or, as some did not hesitate to assert, the timidity, of the government spread disaffection into all classes of mechanics, who, thinking the time at hand when they might exact what wages they pleased, perhaps even beyond their master's profits, struck work. The sailors, following the example of the landsmen, went in a body of many thousands, with drums beating and colours flying, to St. James's Palace, and presented a petition to the King, praying a relief of grievances. Two days afterwards they assembled in much greater numbers, and proceeded as far as Palace Yard, in order to petition Parliament for an increase of wages, when they were addressed by two gentlemen standing on the top of a hackney coach, 
who told them that their petition could not be immediately attended to, but that it would be considered and answered in due time, whereupon the Tars gave three cheers, and for a while dispersed. A short time afterwards, however, they reassembled at Limehouse, and boarding several outward-bound vessels, seized their crews, pretending that they would not suffer any ships to sail until their wages were increased. The watermen, the Spitalfields weavers, the sawyers, the hatters, and the labouring classes in the country, all combined in the attempt to procure their wages to be raised. But while in London the confusion was nearly universal, in the country its effects were confined to a few districts, where some interested persons managed to excite the peaceably disposed people to acts of outrage. They soon discovered the error into which they had fallen, however, and a few of them having suffered execution, and others some severe imprisonments, they returned to their duty. The folly of popular commotion was never better exemplified than in the case of Wilkes, whose patriotism was accidental and mercenary, for his letters to his daughter clearly show the contempt with which he regarded the enthusiasm in his favour, and the object he had in view in exciting hatred against the government. Many of the deluded people who shouted Wilkes and Liberty were severely injured in the riots, and others were subsequently punished by the outraged laws of the country. In a short time the commotion subsided, and the author of them sunk into comparative obscurity, in which he continued until his death in 1797, at the age of seventy years. Mungo Campbell, convicted of the murder of the Earl of Eglinton. This melancholy case arose out of the existing system of game laws. The lamented Mr. Campbell was descended from a noble family of Argyle, and was born at Eyre in Scotland. His father was an eminent merchant, he had been mayor of the town, and a justice of the peace, but having no less than twenty-four children, and meeting with many losses in his commercial transactions, it was impossible for him to make any adequate provision for his family, so that on his death the relations took care of the children, and educated them in the liberal manner which is customary in Scotland. The unhappy subject of this narrative was protected by an uncle, who gave him a learned education, but this generous friend, dying when the youth was about eighteen years of age, left him sixty pounds a year, and earnestly recommended him to the care of his other relations. The young man was a finished scholar, but seemed averse to make choice of any of the learned professions. His attachment appeared to be the military life, in which many of his ancestors had distinguished themselves. He soon followed the bent of his inclinations, and entered as a cadet in the Royal Regiment of Scots Greys, then commanded by his relation General Campbell, and served during two campaigns at his own expense. Being disappointed in obtaining promotion, however, he returned to Scotland in the year 1745, and Lord Loudon, to whom he was distantly related, having the command of the loyal Highlanders, who exhibited so much bravery in their opposition to the rebellion, Mr. Campbell joined that regiment, and his exertions were equally creditable to his loyalty and his courage. After the Battle of Culloden, he was appointed, through the instrumentality of Lord Loudon, to fill the situation of an officer of excise in Ayrshire, and notwithstanding the unpleasant nature of his employment, he succeeded by his courtesy in obtaining the good will of all his neighbours, all of whom, with the exception of the Earl of Eglinton, gave him permission to kill game on their estates. It was his misfortune to live immediately adjoining the property of his lordship, and it would appear that the noble Earl, having once detected him in killing a hare, warned him not to commit a similar offence again. Mr. Campbell apologised for the trespass of which he had been guilty, and excused himself by stating that he was in search of smugglers, and that having suddenly started the hare, he was surprised, and without thinking he shot it. The ill-will which was raised in his lordship's mind by this circumstance was in no wise removed by some proceedings which Mr. Campbell was compelled to take against Bartley Moore, one of his servants, for smuggling, and it appears that his lordship's death was eventually attributable to the steps which he took at the instigation of this very person. About ten in the morning of the 24th of October, 1769, Campbell took his gun and went out with another officer with a view to detect smugglers. Mr. Campbell took with him a licence for shooting, which had been given him by Dr. Hunter, though they had no particular design of killing any game, but he intended to shoot a woodcock if they should see one. They crossed a small part of Lord Eglinton's estate in order to reach the seashore, where they intended to walk, but when they arrived at this spot it was near noon, and Lord Eglinton came up in his coach, attended by Mr. Wilson, a carpenter, who was working for him, and followed by four servants on horseback. 
on approaching the coast, his lordship met Bartley Moore, who told him that there were some poachers at a distance. Mr. Wilson would have endeavoured to draw off his lordship's notice from such business, but Bartley Moore saying that Campbell was among the poachers, Lord Ecklington quitted his coach and mounted a led horse, rode to the spot where he saw Campbell and the other officer, whose name was Brown, his lordship said, Mr. Campbell, I did not expect to have found you so soon again on my grounds, after your promise when you shot the hare. I must desire that you will give me your gun. Mr. Campbell refused to deliver up his property, because he said that he was not employing it in an unlawful manner, on which Lord Eglinton rode towards him, apparently with the intention of taking it from him. Mr. Campbell on this raised his gun, and retreating, presented it at his lordship's body but the latter still followed him, and smiling, asked him if he meant to shoot him. He said that he would if he did not keep off, and then Lord Eglinton desired that his gun should be brought up to him from the carriage. In the interim his lordship dismounted, and going close to Mr. Campbell, again required that he should deliver up the weapon which he carried, but the latter declared that he had a right to carry it, and that he would deliver it to no man, and repeated that his lordship must therefore keep off, unless he wished to be shot. Bartley Moore now interfered, and Mr. Campbell, stumbling against a stone, fell, and Lord Eglinton then advanced as if to seize him. In a moment, however, Mr. Campbell raised himself on his elbow and lodged the contents of his piece in the noble Earl's left breast. His lordship directly cried out that he was killed, and Mr. Campbell was seized, but his lordship desired that no violence should be used towards him. Lord Eglinton's seat was about three miles from the place where this fatal event happened, and his servants put him into the carriage to convey him home. In the meantime, Campbell's hands were tied behind him, and he was conducted to the town of Saltcoats, the place of his former station as an exciseman. His lordship, after languishing for ten hours, died, and Mr. Campbell was then committed to the jail of air to await his trial. Upon his being arraigned, upon the indictment preferred against him, various arguments were urged in his favour. It was said that the gun went off by accident, and therefore it could be no more than casual homicide. Secondly, that supposing it had been fired with an intention to kill, yet the act was altogether justifiable, because of the violent provocation he had received, and he was doing no more than defending his life and property. Thirdly, it could not be murder, because it could not be supposed that Mr. Campbell had any malice against his lordship, and the action itself was too sudden to admit of deliberation. The counsel for the prosecution urged in answer, in the first place, that it was certain malice was implied, in consequence of Campbell's presenting the gun to his lordship, and telling him that, unless he kept off, he would shoot him. Secondly, that there was no provocation given by the Earl besides the words, and words could not be construed a provocation in law. Thirdly, the Earl had a right to seize his gun, in virtue of several Acts of Parliament, which were the established laws of the land to which every subject is obliged to be obedient. After repeated debates between the lawyers of Scotland, a day was at length appointed for the trial, which commenced on the 27th of February 1770, before the High Court of Justiciary, and the jury having found Mr. Campbell guilty, he was sentenced to die. The Lord Justice Clerk, before he pronounced the solemn sentence, addressed himself to the convict, advising him to make the most devout preparation for death, as all hopes of pardon would be precluded from the nature of his offence. The prisoner conducted himself throughout the whole proceedings with utmost calmness, and took leave of his friends in the evening with great apparent cheerfulness, and retiring to his apartment he begged the favour of a visit from them on the following day. In the morning of the 28th of February, 1770, however, he was found dead, hanging to the end of a form which he had set upright, and a silk handkerchief fastened around his neck. The following lines were found upon the floor close to the body. Farewell, vain world, I've had enough of thee, and now am careless what thou sayest of me. Thy smiles I court not, nor thy frowns I fear, my cares are past, my heart lies easy here. What faults they find in me take care to shun, and look at home, enough is to be done. End of part 30Part 31 of The Chronicles of Crime, Volume 1, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 31 James Attaway and Richard Bailey, executed for burglary. 
The crime for which these men so justly suffered was committed in a manner most artful and daring. About nine o'clock in the evening they went to the house of Thomas Lemur, Esquire, in Bedford Row, London, a public and genteel street. They had received information that Mr. Lemur was in the country, and on their knocking at the door it was opened by a footman, who was alone in the house, to whom Bailey delivered a letter, saying it was for his master. Before the servant could answer, they rushed in, shut the street door, and stabbed him in the belly with a dagger. They then drew cords from their pockets, tied the bleeding man's hands behind his back, and dragged him downstairs into the kitchen, and there, bringing the rope about his neck and across his face, in such a manner that it went through his mouth, which kept it open, and making it fast behind, thus bound, they forced him into a cellar, and bolted him in. In a few minutes one of the villains returned, asking if he was fast, and being answered, as well as the poor man could speak, that he was secure enough, they broke open the pantry where the plate-chest was kept, forced the lock, and deliberately packed up its contents. In the meantime, however, the wounded man gnawed the rope in his mouth, and soon liberated himself. He then forced open the door which confined him, and got into the area over which was a skylight, and, apprehensive that he was bleeding to death, he made an effort by climbing up a pipe to get through it and give an alarm. In effecting this he stuck by the middle, and near his wound, a considerable time, but was not heard by the thieves, who were busy employed in securing their plunder. Making a last exertion, he succeeded in raising himself up, and dragging the rope after him, he got to the stables behind the house, and called for help as loud as his almost exhausted strength would permit. Five or six grooms immediately came to his assistance, and learning of the cause of his alarm, they seized the robbers as they were coming out of the house, thus fortunately saving the poor fellow's life and Mr. Lemur's property. On this evidence the prisoners were subsequently found guilty, the wounded man being able to appear in court against them, and were executed at Tyburn, July 4th, 1770. Levi Weil, Asher Weil, Jacob Lazarus and Solomon Porter, executed for the murder of John Slow. This daring violation of the law, which long roused the public indignation against the whole Jewish people, happened in the house of Mrs. Hutchings in the King's Road, Chelsea, who was a farmer's widow, left by her husband in good circumstances, and with three children, two boys and a girl. On a Saturday evening, just as the Jewish Sabbath was ended, a numerous gang of Jews assembled in Chelsea Fields, and having lurked about there until ten o'clock, at that hour went to the house of Mrs. Hutchings, and demanded admittance. The family had all retired to rest, with the exception of Mrs. Hutchings and her two female servants, and being alarmed by the unseasonable request of the applicants, they proceeded in a body to know their business. The door was no sooner opened, however, than a number of fellows, all of whom had the appearance of Jews, rushed in, and seizing the terrified females, threatened them with instant death in the event of their offering any resistance. Mrs. Hutchings, being a woman of considerable muscular strength, for a time opposed them, but her antagonists, having soon overpowered her, they tied her petticoats over her head, and proceeded to secure the servants. The girls, having been tied back to back, five of the fellows proceeded to ransack the house, while the remainder of the gang remained below to guard the prisoners. Having visited the rooms, occupied by the children of Mrs. Hutchings in turn, the ruffians proceeded to the apartment in which two men, employed as labourers on the farm, named John Slow and William Stone, were lying undisturbed by the outcry which had been raised below. It was soon determined that these men were likely to prove mischievous, and that they must be murdered, and Levi Weil, a Jewish physician, who was one of the party, and who was the most sanguinary villain of his gang, aimed a blow at the breast of Stone, intended for his death, but which only stunned him. Slow started up, and the villains cried, "'Shoot him! Shoot him!' and a pistol was instantly fired at him, and he fell, exclaiming, "'Lord, have mercy on me! I am murdered!' They dragged the wounded man out of the room to the head of the stairs, but in the meantime Stone, recovering his senses, jumped out of bed, and escaped to the roof of the house through the window. The thieves now descended, and plundered the house of all the plate they could discover, but finding no money they went to Mrs. Hutchings, and threatened to murder her if she did not disclose the place of its concealment. She gave them her watch, and was afterwards compelled to give up a purse, containing sixty-five pounds, with which they immediately retired. Mrs. Hutchings now directly set her female servants at liberty, and having gone in search of the men, she found Slow, who declared he was dying, and dropped insensible on the floor. He languished until the following afternoon, 
and then died of the wounds which he had received. It was a considerable time before the perpetrators of this most diabolical outrage were discovered, but they were at length given up to justice by one of their accomplices, named Isaacs, who was a German Jew, and who, reduced to the greatest necessity, was tempted by the prospect of reward to impeach his fellows. It then turned out that the gang consisted of eight persons, who were headed by the physician before mentioned. Dr. Weil had been educated in a superior manner. He had studied physic in the University of Leyden, where he was admitted to the degree of doctor in that faculty, and then, coming to England, he practised in London, with no inconsiderable degree of success, and was always known by the name of Dr. Weil. But so destitute was he of all principle, and such was the depravity of his heart, that he determined to engage in the dangerous practice of a robbery and having formed this fatal resolution, he wrote to Amsterdam to some poor Jews to come to England and assist him in his intended depredations on the public, and at the same time inform them that in England large sums were to be acquired by the practice of theft. The inconsiderate men no sooner received Dr. Weil's letter than they procured a passport from the English consul, and, embarking in the Harwich packet-boat, arrived in England. They lost no time in repairing to London, and immediately attending Dr. Weil, he informed them that his plan was that they should go out in the daytime, and minutely survey such houses near London as might probably afford a good booty, and then attack them at night. At the sessions held at the Old Bailey in the month of December 1771, Levi Weil, Asher Weil, Marcus Hartag, Jacob Lazarus, Solomon Porter, and Lazarus Harry, were indicted for the felony and murder above mentioned when the two of the name of Weil, with Jacob Lazarus and Solomon Porter, were capitally convicted, while Marcus Hartag and Lazarus Harry were acquitted for want of evidence. These men, as is customary, in all cases of murder, when it can be made convenient to the court, were tried on a Friday, and on the following day they were anathematized in the synagogue. As their execution was to take place on the Monday following, one of the rabbis went to them in the press yard of Newgate, and delivered to each of them a Hebrew book, but declined attending them to the place of death, nor even prayed with them at the time of his visit. They were attended to Tyburn, the place of execution, by immense crowds of people, who were anxious to witness the exit of wretches whose crimes had been so much the object of public notice. Having prayed together and sung a hymn in the Hebrew language, they were launched into eternity, December ninth, 1771. After the bodies had hung the customary time, they were conveyed to Surgeon's Hall to be dissected. James Bolland, executed for forgery. The adventures of this fellow exhibit him to have been a person of a most profligate disposition. By means of his employment as a bailiff, he obtained the custody of great numbers of unfortunate debtors whom it became his entire occupation to fleece of any small property which might be left in their possession at the time of their incarceration. Bailiffs at the present day are not much esteemed as persons of respectable character, or whose mode of life is at all calculated to raise them in the opinions of their fellows. But, judging from the case of Bolland, the race appears to have much improved since the year 1772. Bolland was the son of a butcher in Whitechapel, and having been brought up to his father's trade, he opened a shop on his own account, almost immediately on the termination of his apprenticeship. His ideas of life, however, did not permit him to pay that attention to his business which it demanded, and having spent no small portion of his time and money in the society of bailiffs, thief-takers, and blacklegs, he at length found himself tottering on the eve of bankruptcy. To avoid a catastrophe which might have damaged him in the estimation of his companions, he now sold off his effects, and, in order to indulge a taste which he appeared to have imbibed from his recent associations, he procured himself to be appointed one of the officers of the Sheriff of Surrey, and opened a sponging house, or receptacle, for newly arrested debtors, at the bottom of Falcon Court, near St. George's Church, Southwark. The sponging houses of the last century, as it may well be supposed, had no better qualities to recommend them than those of the present day, and that of Mr. Bolland, appeared to outvie its fellows in the wretchedness and poverty of its equipments. It was, however, speedily inhabited by a number of wretched debtors, and now came the opportunity for its proprietor to execute his power of discrimination between those who were unable to contribute to his benefit, and those whose purses even yet afforded the possibility of his squeezing from them a few golden drops. 
Those whose money was all spent were not long permitted to remain in his establishment, but were sent off to the county prison as soon as the discovery of their poverty was made. But those who could afford to pay for their accommodations, and besides to enter with him into the amusements of cards and dice, were welcomed as honoured visitors so long as their money lasted, until, in order to avoid further imposition, they demanded to be conveyed to prison, or until the exigency of the writs upon which they had been arrested rendered their removal necessary. It may be readily imagined that no occasion was allowed by Bolland to slip, on which, either by the exercise of fraud or artifice, he could procure money from his unfortunate guests, and, situated as he was, the master of the house, all efforts to oppose his will were of course unavailing, so long as his dupes remained under his roof. But while his frauds at home were carried on with the most daring effrontery, he was no less active abroad, in endeavouring to raise the wind. He became a horse-dealer and a bill-discounter, and in both of these professions ample opportunities for the exercise of all sorts of chicanery were afforded. At length, however, his name and his infamous practices became so notorious that his business forsook him, his employers justly imagining that when his conduct was so villainous they might be justly reflected upon for encouraging him, and with his business the means of meeting his numerous and very heavy expenses declined. His creditors became clamorous, and a commission of bankruptcy was sued out by a friend, but not until he had managed to gull the public to a large extent, and to secrete a very considerable quantity of valuable effects. Having been whitewashed of his old debts, upon his discharge from prison, he managed once again to enter into business, and having procured new bondsmen, he was appointed an officer to the Sheriff of Middlesex, and opened a sponging-house in the Savoy. His success in the new avocation were by no means so great as those which he had experienced in his late employment in Surrey, but he managed to eke out the means of existence between his house and his successes at play in the various billiard-rooms in the vicinity of his dwelling. At length, however, having by his fraudulent schemes involved himself in almost innumerable difficulties, he determined upon once more passing the court to get rid of his liabilities, and the necessary proceedings were taken to procure a second commission of bankruptcy. During his sojourn in the fleet prison, whither, like many of his late victims, he was now obliged to go, he formed acquaintances by no means calculated to improve his character for respectability, nor to induce him to adopt any new mode of life. On his discharge, through the instrumentality of some of his prison friends, he procured himself once again to be appointed a sheriff's officer of Middlesex, and he now commenced business in Great Shire Lane, Fleet Street. If his exertions as a bailiff in the Savoy had failed in procuring for him those returns which his situation might lead him to expect, he had now no reason to complain of want of patronage. His acquaintance among the sharp practice attorneys had been lately increasing, and he was soon almost fully employed by them. His house was again rendered the means of procuring for him the most extravagant returns for his outlay on behalf of his prisoners, and his ingenuity and impudence supplied any deficiency which might have before appeared in his income. One or two instances of the devices to which he had recourse may prove interesting. Having been employed by a gentleman to arrest a person who was his debtor to the amount of three hundred pounds on a bill of exchange, and who held the situation of captain of an East Indiaman, Bolland immediately proceeded to make the necessary inquiries respecting his prey. He learned that his vessel was about to sail in the course of a very few days, but, determined to be beforehand with him, he caused him to be immediately arrested and carried to his lock-up house. His employer, in the meantime, had gone out of town, and therefore looked for no immediate account from the officer, but the latter, having procured the debt and costs from his prisoner, suffered him immediately to depart. Some months elapsed before the plaintiff in the suit returned to London, and then he demanded to know what success the bailiff had had in procuring the payment of the debt, but he was assured by him that the vessel had sailed before the writ was lodged in his hands, and that all his efforts to procure the money had been unavailing. He then tendered a charge of the costs which had been incurred, and the amount having been paid, he walked off. His cheat was soon destined to be discovered, however, for the captain, having returned, a writ was lodged in the hand of another officer, by whom he was a second time arrested. The result may be easily imagined. Bolland's receipt for the debt and costs, 
dated eighteen months before, was produced, and the prisoner was at once set at liberty. Proceedings were then immediately instituted against our hero, and after a long course of opposition to the law, through which he imagined that he would not be followed, he was compelled to refund the money, which he had so dishonestly obtained. The following case shows that he did not always come off the winner. The custom of putting in sham bail has long been well known, and although recent enactments of the legislature have put an end to this system, founded on perjury and fraud, the men of straw, who formerly paraded Westminster Hall, ready to swear that they were worth any amount, and who were easily recognised by the straw which hung out of their shoes, are yet well remembered. Bolland, in the course of his professional avocations, had frequent necessity for the use of persons on this description, and he had gone so far as to hire two men for the exclusive use of his establishment, whom he had attired in something like decency, for the sake of giving his transactions an air of respectability. Having upon one occasion accompanied his servants to a public house in Covent Garden to regale them after a good hit, he was surprised to see them suddenly carried off by two Bow Street runners on a charge of highway robbery. At the ensuing Old Bailey Sessions, they were put upon their trial charged with the offence alleged against them, and a verdict of conviction having been recorded, they were sentenced to be hanged. Bolland, in his capacity of sheriff's officer, was compelled to accompany them to the gallows, and had the mortification of seeing them turned off, wearing the clothes which he had provided them, and which, by custom, became the property of the executioner. Another instance will show how far his villainy extended. A Mrs. Beauclerk was the wife of a captain in the navy, and her husband having been detained at sea for a period much longer than was expected, she contracted a debt amounted to thirty pounds. The creditor became solicitous that the money should be repaid, but Mrs. Beauclerk, being devoid of the means of payment, and having no friend to whom, in her strait, she could apply, was at length arrested by Bolland upon a writ, which had been placed in his hands for execution, and conveyed to Great Shire Lane. Having tasted all the pleasures of a residence in a sponging house, she became anxious in a day or two for her release upon any terms which she could make, and upon her entreaty Bolland procured bail to be put in for her on a fee of five guineas being handed over. She had scarcely obtained her liberty, however, before she was rendered into custody by her bail, acting upon the advice of Bolland, who represented that her circumstances were such as to render the continuance of their liability in her behalf exceedingly dangerous. Every post was expected to bring news of Captain Beauclerk, and with it the means of discharging the debt, and the poor woman, terrified at an incarceration in Newgate, with which she was threatened, was induced to raise ten pounds, in order once more to procure her liberation upon bail. The money being tendered, her jailer was too good a judge to permit her to go at large without some further security, and he insisted upon her signing a bond to confess judgment, leviable upon her furniture as a collateral security. Mrs. Beauclerk was ignorant of the nature of such an instrument, and readily assented to everything that was proposed, and her surprise may be imagined when, on the very day after her liberation, a writ of execution was put into her house, founded upon the judgment signed upon her confession, under which all her goods were seized. Distracted at the prospect of her husband's speedy return, and at his discovery of her destitution, in a state of the wildest desperation she attempted to set fire to the house which she occupied. Her offence was, from its nature, immediately discovered, and the unhappy woman was dragged to Newgate, to await her trial. Scarcely had she become an inmate of the jail, the name of which she had before so much dreaded, when her husband arrived in London, and was horror-struck at discovering her situation. Every effort was made by him on her behalf, but before the trial of his wretched wife came on, he was suddenly arrested by Bolland, upon a writ sued out upon an affidavit of debt, falsely sworn at the instance of the officer. His condition may be easily supposed to have been heart-rending in the extreme, and his wife, deprived of the assistance which she might have obtained had he been at large, was convicted and received sentence of death. The captain, in order as soon as possible to be able to render his wife that comfort which her situation demanded, and to make some exertions in her behalf, procured his liberation, though it was by paying the debt to which he was sworn to be liable, and the case of his wife being represented to the king, she was at length released from confinement, upon an unconditional pardon which was granted to her. By these and other artifices, 
and by the most unblushing effrontery, Bolland succeeded at length in amassing a sum of two thousand pounds, and the office of city marshal becoming vacant, he determined, if possible, to become its possessor by way of purchase. The situation, as was then customary, was put up for sale, and after a spirited bidding he became the buyer at a price of two thousand four hundred pounds, and having paid the deposit money, and raised such portion of the whole sum as he did not possess, he only waited the approval of the court of aldermen at once to take upon himself the duties of the office. His character had, however, become too notorious to permit of his being allowed to assume a situation of so much importance in the city, and a message was communicated to him by the recorder, in which the nature of the grounds of the refusal were stated. An action was threatened upon the breach of contract, as well as upon the defamation of his character, conveyed by the message of the recorder, but finding that he was likely to gain nothing by an opposition to the Corporation of London, he desisted from any further proceedings, and demanded the restitution of the amount of the deposit money. But here he was doomed to suffer another disappointment. The amount handed over had been attached by the persons, who had become his sureties to the sheriff, on account of certain liabilities which he had incurred to them under their bail bonds, and it was detained in order to await the decision of a court of law upon the claim. Before the proceedings which arose upon the subject, however, had terminated, Bolland was guilty of the offence for which he became liable to trial, and was convicted and executed. It appears that his crime consisted in the introduction of a false endorsement upon the back of a bill of exchange, made by Bolland for the purpose of giving it a fictitious value. A person named Jesson, having discounted a bill for him, they accidentally met at the George and Vulture Tavern, Cornhill, on the day when it became due. Jesson demanded payment, but Bolland declared that he was unprepared with the money requisite to take up the instrument, and tendered another bill for one hundred pounds, accepted by a Mr. Bradshaw, as an equivalent. Jesson, after some demure, consented to take the bill, and Bolland endorsed it with his own name. This was exclaimed against by Jesson, on the ground that it would not be negotiable, if his name appeared on it, and then he took a knife, and according to Jesson's belief, scratched out the whole name, while in reality he scratched out all except the initial, which he left, and to which he added the letters A-N-K-S, so as to make the name James Banks. The bill was then handed back to Jesson, and on the following day it was discounted for him by a person named Cardinot. The latter subsequently demanded to know who Banks was, and Bolland informed him that he was a victualler in the neighbourhood of Rathbone Place, in an extensive and reputable way of business. Before the bill became due, it was again discounted for Cardinot by his banker, and Bradshaw, the acceptor, became bankrupt. Cardinot, in consequence, applied to Jesson to take up the bill, and he in turn went to Bolland, but the latter positively refused to have anything to do with it, and even went so far as to deny, with the utmost effrontery, that he had ever seen it. At a subsequent meeting between Cardinot, Jesson, and Bolland, the latter endeavoured to excuse himself from payment by alleging that his name did not appear on the instrument. But on his being called upon to explain how Banks's endorsement came upon it, he desired that all further disputes might subside, and that he would take it up. An investigation, however, subsequently took place, and Jesson, annoyed at the double fraud which had been practised upon him, took the advice of counsel as to what should be done. An opinion was given that an indictment for forgery would lie, and Bolland was taken into custody. But then immediately a person who stated his name to be Banks applied to Cardinot to take up the bill. The one hundred pounds were accepted, and the supposed Mr. Banks obtained a receipt for that amount, but on his demanding the delivery of the bill, he was informed that it was detained in order to be produced in evidence at the trial, after which he should be welcome to it. The prisoner was indicted at the ensuing Old Bailey sessions, when proof of the facts which we have detailed, having been given, and all efforts to prove the existence of any such Mr. Banks, as had been described having failed, a verdict of guilty was returned. Every effort was subsequently made by the prisoner's counsel, on a motion in arrest of judgment, to procure the verdict to be set aside, but in vain, and sentence of death was passed upon him in the usual form. On the morning of his execution, the unhappy wretch confessed that he had been guilty of innumerable sins, but declared that he had no fraudulent intentions in endorsing the bill when he put it off. 
He was hanged at Tyburn on the 18th of March, 1772, and his body was in the evening conveyed to Bunhill Fields, and there buried. End of part 31 Part 32 of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume 1, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 32. William Griffiths. Executed for Highway Robbery. The person robbed in this case was the celebrated and unfortunate Dr. Dodd, whom, a few years afterwards, fate decreed to be handed at the very spot where Griffiths suffered. William Griffiths was a native of Shropshire, and followed the business of husbandry till he had attained his eighteenth year, when he engaged in a naval life, and remained near three years in the East Indies. The ship was paid off on his return to England, and our hero, having received a considerable sum for wages, spent his money, as sailors generally do, in no very reputable company, at public houses in Wapping and adjacent parts. Being now reduced to poverty, he was persuaded by two fellows named David Evans and Timothy Johnson to join them in the commission of highway robberies. Their efforts were attended with small success, and Griffith's reign was soon terminated. It appears that the Reverend Dr. Dodd and his lady were returning from a visit they had been making to a gentleman at St. Albans, but were detained on the way at Barnet, because a post-chaise could not be immediately procured. Night was hastily approaching when they left Barnet, but they proceeded unmolested until they came near the turnpike at the extremity of Tottenham Court Road, when three men called to the driver of the carriage, and threatened his instant destruction if he did not stop. The postboy did not hesitate to obey the summons, but no sooner was the carriage stopped than a pistol was fired, the ball from which went through the front glass of the chaise, but did not take any effect to the injury of the parties in it. Griffiths then immediately opened the door of the chaise, on which the doctor begged him to behave with civility, on account of the presence of the lady. He delivered his purse, which contained only two guineas, and a bill of exchange, and also gave the robber some loose silver. Griffiths, having received the booty, decamped with the utmost precipitation, but Dr. Dodd lost no time in repairing to Sir John Fielding's office, where he and his lady gave so full a description of the person of the principal robber, that he was immediately apprehended. At the trial the doctor declared that he had only come forward on account of the pistol having been fired, but refused to swear to the person of the prisoner. His lady, however, was more positive in her evidence, and no doubt being left as to his identity, he was found guilty and received sentence of death. He afterwards confessed the crimes of which he had been guilty, and was executed on the 20th of January, 1773, apparently sincerely penitent for his offences. John Leonard, executed for a rape. The circumstances of this case are marked by peculiar atrocity. It appears that a man named Vere, a sheriff's officer, having put an execution into a house of Mr. Brailsford in Petit France, Westminster, he placed Leonard, Graves and Gay, three of his followers, in possession. A young woman named Boss resided in an apartment on the second floor of the house, and on the 15th of June, 1773, the family of Mr. Brailsford, having all gone out in search of the means of getting rid of their unwelcome visitants, she was left alone in the house with the three officers. She was at work in her own room, when, about midday, Leonard opened the door and began in a familiar manner to speak to her. Terror for a while deprived her of utterance, but finding him proceed to take those liberties which female virtue can never suffer, she resisted, screamed out, seized the villain by the throat, struggled until she was exhausted, and then sank down deprived of reason. In this situation her assailant used her in the way that constituted the offence for which he was justly executed. A neighbour, hearing the cries of the distressed female, and suspecting some foul deed, knocked at the street door, and inquired of the cause of the noise, to which Leonard, opening the window, replied that it was only a drunken woman, and the inquirer retired. The three villains, Leonard, Graves, and Gay, were afterwards indicted for this cruel outrage. Leonard as the principal, and the others as accessories to the fact, and upon their trial they were all found guilty. Graves and Gay were burned in the hand, and imprisoned, but sentence of death was immediately passed upon Leonard. Although convicted upon the clearest evidence, this obdurate man denied that he was guilty, 
and on the Sunday before he suffered, he received the sacrament from the hands of the Reverend Mr. Temple, and then, in the most solemn manner, declared to that gentleman that he was entirely innocent of the fact for which he was to die, that he had been repeatedly intimate with Miss Boss, with her own consent, and that all the reason he could conjecture for her prosecuting him was that he had communicated this matter to Graves, one of the other followers, who availed himself of the secret, and found means to get into the young lady's room, and who really perpetrated the fact with which she had falsely accused him. In this story he persisted all the time he remained in Newgate, but Mr. Temple, suspecting his veracity, delivered a paper to Mr. Toll, another gentleman, who usually administered spiritual comfort to the malefactors in their last moments, in which he requested him to ask Leonard about those two assertions before he was turned off. This request Mr. Toll and his colleague punctually complied with, and the unhappy man then acknowledged that he had taken the sacrament to an absolute falsehood, that there was not a word of truth in his impeaching Miss Boss, but that he alone abused her, that he was taught in Newgate to believe that the falsehood might do him service, that he found his mistake too late, and all the atonement he could make was to acknowledge the truth before he left the world, and to beg pardon of God for having acted in so atrocious a manner. He was executed on the 11th of August, 1773, at Tyburn. Samuel Mayle, executed for robbery. The short life of this culprit was remarkable for producing two surprising instances of the uncertainty of identity. On the 4th of September, 1772, he was arraigned at the bar of the Old Bailey for a robbery upon a Mrs. Ryan. The prosecutrix and other witnesses swore positively that the prisoner committed the robbery on the 17th of June, then last passed. The court consequently supposed conviction would follow, but being called on for his defence, he said he was innocent, and that the books of the court could prove where he was on the day of the robbery. Reference was immediately made to the records, and strange, yet true to relate, that on the very day and hour sworn, Mail was actually on his trial at the bar, where he then stood for another robbery, when he was unfortunate enough to have been mistaken for another person. He was consequently acquitted, but the force of example did not deter him from the commission of crime, and although he was discharged from prison without reproach, he came out a determined thief. His career of a villainy was soon ended, for in six months afterwards we find him expiating his crimes at the gallows. He was charged with a real robbery, committed by him on the person of Mrs. Grignion and being unable again to prove an alibi, as he had hitherto done, he was found guilty, and was executed at Tyburn on the 25th of March, 1773. William Farmery, executed for the murder of his mother. While we sketch the shocking crime of this monster, we have some consolation in observing that, in our long researches into the baseness of mankind, he is the first we have met with who, with long lurking malice, shed the blood of his mother. A subject so strangely horrid and unnatural we shall dismiss by a bare recital of the shocking circumstance. It appears that, among other undutiful acts, he had one morning given offence to his parent, for which he was justly reproached, whereupon he went out of her house, took the knife from his pocket, and deliberately whetted it till quite sharp. Then returning with the murderous instrument in his hand, he found his unfortunate mother in the act of making his own bed. Without uttering a word, he threw her down, and, as a butcher kills a sheep, he stuck her in the throat, and left her weltering in her blood, of which wound she died. On his examination he confessed the fact, and said that he had determined upon his mother's death three years before, for that he had treasured up malice against her since she had corrected him for some trifling fault when a little boy. He was executed at Lincoln, where his offence was committed, on the 5th of August, 1775. Amos Merritt, executed for burglary. The case of this prisoner is a fit successor to that of Samuel Mayle, which has just been related. His execution arose out of the following circumstances. On the 19th of August, 1774, Patrick Maiden, convicted of a foot robbery on the highway, and William Wayne and Levi Barnett for burglary, were carried to Tyburn for execution, pursuant to their sentence. 
when the cart was drawn under the gallows, a man among the crowd of spectators called out for the others to make way for him, as he had something to communicate to the sheriff respecting one of the prisoners. This being effected, the man, who proved to be Amos Merritt, addressed Mr. Reynolds, the under-sheriff, and declared that Patrick Maiden was innocent of the crime for which he was about to suffer. Mr. Reynolds desired he would look upon the prisoner, and speak aloud what he had represented to him. He did so, and declared that he was not guilty, but declined accusing himself. The sheriffs, on hearing this declaration, dispatched Mr. Reynolds and the information to the Secretary of State, and to request his further orders, and a respite being obtained for Maiden, he was carried back to Newgate, amid the acclamations of the people. Merritt was then taken into custody, and at the public office at Bow Street before Mr. Justice Addington confessed that he himself was the person who had committed the robbery of which Maiden had been convicted, and the last-named prisoner was then pardoned. Though no doubt remained of Merritt's guilt, yet as no proof could be adduced to that effect, he for a while escaped justice. He had been guilty of many robberies, the particulars of which are not interesting, and we shall therefore come to that for which he suffered. At the sessions held at the Old Bailey in the month of December 1774, Amos Merritt was indicted for feloniously breaking and entering the dwelling-house of Edward Ellicott, early in the morning of the 26th of October, and stealing from it a quantity of plate, a gold watch, and other valuable articles to a large amount. Mr. Ellicott deposed that he lived in Hornsey Lane, near Highgate, that he was awakened by his wife, who inquired what the noise was in the house, and ringing the bell, both of them jumped out of bed. The first words they heard were, "'Come up directly,' and then some person said, "'Damn your bloods, we will murder every soul in the house.' Mrs. Ellicott said, "'Lord, bless me, the door is open,' and running to the door, pushed it close. Mr. Ellicott gave immediate assistance, and a person who was without, who he believed from his voice, was the prisoner, said, "'Damn you, if you do not open the door, I will murder every one of you.' The rest of the evidence was to the following effect. The villains attempted to force open the door, putting a hanger with a scabbard between that and the post, but Mr. Ellicott, who was a powerful man, kept them out by mere strength, and having fastened the door with a drop-bolt, which went into the flooring, he ran to the window and called out, "'Thieves!' In the meantime Mrs. Ellicott, by perpetual ringing of the bell, hail alarmed the servants, who ran into the road after the thieves, who had by this time got off with the property. Notice having been given at Sir John Fielding's, Merritt and his accomplices were taken into custody on suspicion, and after an examination at Bow Street were committed to Newgate. At the trial the evidence was deemed so satisfactory that the jury did not hesitate to find Merritt guilty and in consequence of which he received sentence of death, and was executed at Tyburn on the 18th of January, 1775, within six months of the period of his saving the unfortunate maiden from an untimely and ignominious fate. Connected with the two cases just detailed, we may relate an anecdote of a very remarkable instance of personal similitude which happened at New York in North America in the year 1804. A man was indicted for bigamy, under the name of James Hogue. He was met in a distant part of the country by some friends of his supposed first wife, and apprehended. The prisoner denied the charge, said his name was Thomas Parker. On the trial, Mrs. Hogue, her relations, and many other credible witnesses, swore that he was James Hogue, and the former swore positively that he was her husband. On the other side, an equal number of witnesses, equally respectable, swore that the prisoner was Thomas Parker and Mrs. Parker appeared, and claimed him as her husband. The first witnesses were again called by the court, and they not only again deposed to him, but swore that by stature, shape, gesture, complexion, looks, voice, and speech, he was James Hogue. They even described a particular scar on his forehead, by which he could be known. On turning back the hair, the scar appeared. The others, in return, swore that he had lived among them, and worked with them, and was in their company on the very day of his alleged marriage to Mrs. Hogue. Here the scales of testimony were balanced, for the jury knew not to which party to give credit. Mrs. Hogue, anxious to gain back her husband, declared he had a certain more particular mark on the sole of his foot. Mrs. Parker avowed that her husband had no such mark, and the man was ordered to pull off his shoes and stockings. His feet were examined, and no mark appeared. The ladies now contended for the man, 
and Mrs. Hogue vowed that she had lost her husband, and she would have him. But during this strife, a justice of the peace from the place where the prisoner was apprehended entered the court, and turned the scale in his favour. His worship swore him to be Thomas Parker, that he was known and occasionally employed by him, from his infancy, whereupon Mrs. Parker embraced and carried off her husband in triumph by the verdict of the jury. The following anecdote was related by Mr. Baron Garrow upon the trial of a prisoner whose identity was questionable on the Oxford circuit. The learned judge was in the course of summing up the case to the jury, when he stated that a few years before a prisoner was on his trial before him, upon a charge of highway robbery. His person was identified positively by the prosecutor, who even went so far as to say that he now wore the same clothes in which he had been attired on the occasion on which the robbery was committed, and the jury were on the point of being dismissed to the consideration of their verdict when suddenly shouts were heard in the yard attached to the courthouse, cries of, "'Make way, make way!' were distinguished, and a man on horseback, whose appearance denoted the rapidity with which he had ridden, rushed in among the people, congregated to await results of the trial, and, throwing himself from his horse, which was covered with foam, made his way with the greatest expedition to the entrance of the court. The outcry which was raised had stopped the learned judge in his concluding observations, and before he could resume his address to the jury, the man, booted and spurred and covered with mud, called upon him to stop the case, for that he had ridden fifty miles to save the life of a fellow creature, the prisoner at the bar. His lordship and the court were astonished at the interruption, and called upon the stranger to explain his conduct. His answer was that he knew that the prisoner could not be guilty of the offence imputed to him, and he called upon the prosecutor of the indictment to say whether, after having seen him, he could still swear that the prisoner was the offender. The prosecutor again entered the witness-box, and surveyed the stranger from head to foot. He was dressed in a manner precisely similar to that in which the prisoner was attired a green coat with brass buttons, drab breeches and top boots. Their countenances were so nearly alike in style, that, from the transient view he had of the robber, he was unable to distinguish which was the real thief. The court were unwilling to suffer a person who was really innocent to be convicted, and proceeded to make inquiries of the stranger as to his reasons for interrupting the trial, and as to his knowledge of the circumstances of the robbery. Upon the former point, the only explanation which could be obtained from him was that he was perfectly satisfied that the prisoner was innocent. Upon the latter, he declined to answer any queries, insinuating that, situated as he was, the court could not compel him to criminate himself. The prisoner now reiterated the protestations of innocence which he had before made, and the prosecutor, being strictly examined by the court, declared that, he was so confused by the similarity which existed between the prisoner and the stranger that he was unable to swear that the former was actually the thief, and that his impression now was that the latter was the real offender. Under these circumstances it was left to the jury to say whether they could with safety declare the prisoner to be guilty, and a verdict of acquittal was in consequence returned, to the apparent satisfaction of the court. It now became the duty of the judge to determine what further proceedings should be taken. A robbery, there was no doubt, had been committed, and its commission lay between the person who had just been acquitted and the stranger. The former must be presumed to be not guilty, because the jury had declared him to be so, and a bill of indictment was therefore directed to be preferred against the latter, who was taken into custody. The same evidence which had before been given was now repeated, and a true bill was returned. The trial came on in the course of the ensuing day, and a fresh jury being impanelled, the new prisoner was put up upon his defence. It was a simple and plain one. He was not guilty. The prosecutor had sworn positively to the person of the prisoner, who had been tried on the previous day, and could he now be permitted so to alter his testimony as to procure the conviction of another. He had before declared that he could not distinguish the real offender, and what better opportunity had been since afforded him. Besides, his evidence now went only to his belief as to the identity of the person charged, and surely if the jury had before acquitted a prisoner to whom he had sworn positively, they would not now convict when his testimony was qualified. This reasoning was too much for the jury. Uh, the prisoner made no confession of his own guilt, and he was declared not guilty. 
The sequel was soon discovered. The two men were brothers. The first prisoner was the guilty party, and the whole scene got up by the stranger was a mere fabrication, invented for the purpose of gulling the court and jury. No proceedings could be taken against either party, for although the court had been imposed upon, the imposition was backed by no perjury, and the two thieves, for so they turned out, escaped unpunished. Another instance of remarkable imposition being practised upon the court occurred subsequently at York. The case of a person who was charged with an extensive robbery on the highway had attracted considerable attention. The prisoner, when apprehended, was attired in the habit of a working man, but the prosecutor, whose evidence as to his identity was positive, swore that when the robbery was committed he was well dressed and mounted. The trial came on at the York Assizes, and the court was crowded with persons. Upon the evening preceding the day on which the case was fixed for trial, a gentleman drove up to one of the principal inns of the city, in a travelling chariot, and requested to be accommodated with a bed. A handsome supper was ordered, and the stranger retired to rest. In the morning breakfast was served, and the landlord was sent for. The gentleman said that he was unacquainted with the town, and found that he was a day too early for the business upon which he had come to York, and he therefore desired to know whether there were any amusements going on with which he could entertain himself until dinner-time. The castle, the minster, and various other curiosities were alluded to, in which he appeared to take no interest, and the landlord at length mentioned that the assizes were on, and suggested that he might probably derive some entertainment from listening to the trials, and he stated that a remarkable case of highway robbery was fixed for trial on that morning, and had by that time probably commenced. Some curiosity on this point was expressed, and the landlord, conducting his guest to the court-house, obtained for him a seat upon the bench, upon assuring the high sheriff of his being a person of great apparent respectability, which the landlord had good reason to believe, from his having seen him with a bundle of notes in his possession of no inconsiderable size, which he observed that he had placed in his trunk with his pocket-book on his quitting the inn. The case of highway robbery, as the landlord suggested, had already commenced. The prisoner appeared to be a poor man, and was standing at the bar, with his face buried in his handkerchief, apparently deeply affected by the situation in which he was placed, and almost unconscious of what was passing around him. The trial now approached its termination, the evidence for the prosecution was completed, and the learned judge called on the prisoner for his defence. He raised himself languidly from the place where he had been resting, and assured the jury that he was innocent, when, suddenly starting, he exclaimed passionately, "'There, there, my lord, there is a gentleman seated on your lordship's bench who can prove that I am not guilty.' All eyes were turned to the person to whom the prisoner's finger, in support of his declaration, was pointed, and the stranger was found to be the object of the remark. He expressed great surprise at being thus called upon, and declared that he was at a loss to know how the prisoner could appeal to him, for that he had no immediate recollection that he had ever seen him before. The learned judge demanded that the prisoner should explain himself, and he then stated that on the very day named in the indictment, and by the witnesses, as that on which the robbery had been committed, he was at Dover, and had conveyed the gentleman's luggage in a wheelbarrow from the ship inn to the steam packet, in which he was about to start for Calais. The gentleman, in answer to the questions put to him, said that he certainly had been at Dover about the time mentioned, and that he had lodged at the ship inn, and had gone from thence by steam to Calais. He remembered, too, that a man had carried his trunks, as the prisoner had described, but that although he now had some distant recollection of the features of the man at the bar, he was unable to recognise him as the person he had employed, and he could not, besides, swear to the date of the transaction. The court inquired whether he was in the habit of making memoranda of his proceedings, and whether, by referring to any documents, he should be able to give any more decided information upon the subject. He answered that, being engaged in a large mercantile business, it was certainly his custom to make notes in his pocket-book, but that the book was at his inn, locked in his trunk. The court said that in such a case it was desirable that the most minute inspection should take place, and desired that the gentleman should go for his book. The latter was unwilling to take this trouble, but would give his keys to the officer of the court, who might, in the presence of his landlord, open the trunk and bring the book to the court. Messengers were in consequence dispatched, with directions to make further inquiries of the landlord as to the stranger, 
and in the meantime the prisoner proceeded to ask him questions, reminding him of certain occurrences which had taken place on the day in question, on their way from the inn to the quay, and more especially that the packet was late in starting. To most of these the gentleman assented, and the pocket-book being now arrived, he referred to it and declared that the date mentioned was the very day on which he had quitted Dover as described, and, from all the circumstances which the prisoner had detailed, he was decidedly of the opinion that he was the person whom he had employed. The circumstances attending the arrival and sojourn of the stranger at the inn, as detailed by the landlord, who had come into court, were now whispered to the judge, and the gentleman, having given his name and stated himself to be connected with the most respectable banking firm in the city of London, the learned judge summed up the case, commenting upon the very remarkable coincidence which had occurred, and the jury, giving full credit to the testimony of the stranger, at once returned a verdict of not guilty in favour of the prisoner. The decision appeared to give perfect satisfaction to the court, and the prisoner was ordered to be immediately discharged. The stranger was complimented by the judge upon the essential service which he had been the means of rendering to a fellow creature, and left the court, declaring his happiness at his having been able to give such testimony. Within a fortnight afterwards, the late prisoner and his friend, the London merchant, were lodged in York Castle, charged with the most daring act of housebreaking in which they had been concerned. The notes which the latter had sported at the inn were found to be drawn upon the bank of fashion, instead of upon the Bank of England, and upon the prisoners being tried at the ensuing assizes, they were found guilty, and their lives were justly forfeited to the laws of their country. End of part 32part 33 of the chronicles of crime volume 1 by camden pelham this librivox recording is in the public domain part 33 john ran alias sixteen stringed jack executed for highway robbery the name of this criminal will be immediately recollected as one which has attained no small share of notoriety he was born at a village a few miles from Bath, of poor parents, and during the greater part of his youth he obtained a living by pursuing the business of a costermonger. At the age of twelve years he was hired by a lady of distinction, whom he accompanied to London, and subsequently, being employed in her stables, he obtained some knowledge of horses, and having served in the more humble capacity of poster-boy at an inn, he was at length taken into the service of a gentleman of fortune, in Portman Square, as coachman. It was at this period that he dressed in the manner which gave rise to his appellation of sixteen-stringed jack, by wearing breeches with eight strings on each knee. But after having been employed by several noblemen, he lost his character and turned pickpocket, in company with three fellows, named Jones, Clayton, and College, the latter of whom, a mere boy, obtained the name of eight-stringed jack. The first appearance which our hero appears to have made at the bar of any court of justice was at the sessions held at the Old Bailey in April 1774, when, with Clayton and one shepherd, he was tried for robbing Mr. William Summers on the highway, and acquitted for want of evidence. They were again tried for robbing Mr. Langford, but acquitted for the same reason. He was soon destined to be again in custody, however, and on the 30th of May following he was charged with robbing John Duval, Esquire, near the nine-mile stone on the Hounslow Road, of his watch and money. It appeared that he had given the watch to a young woman with whom he lived, named Roche, who had delivered it to Catherine Smith, by whom it was offered in pledge to Mr. Hallam, a pawnbroker, who, suspecting it was not honestly obtained, caused the parties to be taken into custody. Roche was now charged with receiving the watch, knowing it to have been stolen, and Smith, being sworn, deposed that on the day Mr. Duval was robbed, Roche told her that she expected Ran to bring her some money in the evening, that he accordingly came at about ten at night, and having retired some time with Roche, she, on her return, owned that she had received a watch and five guineas from him, which he said he had taken from a gentleman on the highway, and that she, Smith, carried the watch to pawn to Mr. Hallam, at the request of Roach. Upon this charge the prisoner Ran was again sent to Newgate, but on his trial in July 1774 he was acquitted. On his appearing at the bar he was dressed in a manner above his style of life and his circumstance. 
he had a bundle of flowers in the breast of his coat, almost as large as a broom, and his irons were tied up with a number of blue ribbons. Two or three days after this acquittal, Ran engaged to sup with a girl at her lodgings in Bow Street, but not being punctual to his appointment, the woman went to bed, and her paramour, being unable to obtain admittance by the door, proceeded to effect an entrance through the window, and had nearly accomplished this purpose when a watchman interrupted him and took him into custody. He was charged at Bow Street on the 27th of July with this alleged burglarious attempt, but the young lady appearing declared the prisoner could have had no felonious intent, for that so far from her opposing his entry, had she been awake she would instantly have admitted him, and besides that he was quite welcome to share everything that she possessed, even to her bed. Upon this declaration the prisoner was dismissed with a caution to adopt a less dangerous method of pursuing his amours. After this it seems that the proceedings of our hero became pretty notorious, and he took no trouble either to conceal or disguise his person or his acts. He did not hesitate to proclaim himself as sixteen-stringed Jack the famous highwayman, and to appear at public places attired in a peculiar manner so as to excite observation and attention. It does not appear that his attacks were marked by any great degree of atrocity, and the celebrity which he obtained was rather of his own seeking. A short time before he was convicted of the offence which cost him his life, he attended a public execution at Tyburn, and getting in the ring formed by the constables round the gallows, desired that he might be permitted to stand there, for, said he, perhaps it is very proper that I should be a spectator on this occasion. On the 26th of September, 1774, he went with William Collier on the Uxbridge Road, with a view to commit robberies on the highway, and, being apprehended on the Wednesday following, they were examined at the public office in Bow Street on the following charge. Dr. William Bell, chaplain to the Princess Amelia, deposed that between three and four o'clock in the afternoon of Monday the 26th of September, as he was riding near Ealing, he observed two men of rather mean appearance who rode past him, and that he remarked they had suspicious looks. Yet neither at that time, nor for some little time afterwards, had he any idea of being robbed. That soon afterwards one of them, whom he believed to be ran, crossed the head of his horse, and demanding his money, said, "'Give it to me, and take no notice, or I'll blow your brains out.' On this the doctor gave him one shilling and sixpence, which was all the silver he had, and a common watch in a tortoiseshell case. It further appeared that, on the night of the robbery, Rand's companion, Eleanor Roche, and her maid-servant, Christian Stewart, went to the shop of Mr. Cordy, a pawnbroker in Oxford Road, to pledge the watch, but that he stopped it, and found out its owner by applying to Mr. Grignon, its maker, in Russell Street, Covent Garden. And evidence was also adduced as to the identity of Ran, who was proved to have been seen at Acton within twenty minutes of the time of the robbery being committed. The prisoners were thereupon sent to Newgate to take their trials, and Roche and Stewart, being also apprehended, were indicted as accessories after the fact. The evidence given on the trial was in substance the same as that which had been adduced at Bow Street, but some favourable circumstances appearing in behalf of Collier, he was recommended to mercy, and afterwards respited during the King's pleasure. Miss Roach was sentenced to be transported for fourteen years, her servant was acquitted, and Ran was left for execution. When Ran was brought down to take his trial, he was dressed in a new suit of pea-green clothes, his hat was bound round with silver strings, he wore a ruffled shirt, and his behaviour evinced the most utmost unconcern. Upon hearing the verdict of the jury, which consigned him to death, he endeavoured to force a smile, but the attempt was a failure, and it was evident that the confidence which he had before exhibited now forsook him. He had been so certain of acquittal, that he had ordered a supper to be provided on the occasion, but his anticipations of pleasure were quickly changed into the reality of sorrow. After conviction, his behaviour was for a time unfitted for the melancholic condition in which he was placed. On Sunday, the 23rd of October, he had seven girls to dine with him, and with their mirth endeavoured to shake off the heaviness which beset him, but the warrant for his execution soon after arriving, he became more sensible of his awful situation, and began to prepare for the sad fate which awaited him. At his execution he behaved with decent resignation, and surveyed the gallows with an eye of confidence. He was executed on the 30th of November, 1774, and, having hung the usual time, 
his body was delivered over to his friends for internment. Robert and Daniel Perrow, executed for forgery. The circumstances of the cases of these prisoners are of a very remarkable description. It appears that the accused persons were twin brothers, and were so much alike that it was with difficulty that they were known apart. Robert Perrow carried on business in Golden Square as an apothecary, and was in great practice, while his brother lived in a style of considerable fashion, a Mrs. Margaret Caroline Rudd living with him as his wife. At the sessions held at the Old Bailey in June 1775, Robert Perrow was indicted for forging a bond for the payment of £7,500 in the name of William Adair, Esquire, then a great government contractor, and also for feloniously uttering and publishing the said bond, knowing it to be forged, with intent to defraud Messrs. Robert and Henry Drummond, bankers. From the evidence which was adduced at the trial, it appeared that on the 10th of March, 1775, the prisoner under trial, whose character up to that time had been considered unimpeachable, went to the house of Messrs. Drummond, and seeing Mr. Henry Drummond, one of the partners, said that he had been making a purchase of an estate in Norfolk or Suffolk, for which he was to give £12,000, but that he had not sufficient cash to pay the whole purchase money. That he had a bond, however, which Mr. Adair had given to his brother Daniel for £7,500, upon which he desired to raise a sum of £5,000 out of which he was willing to pay £1,400, which he had already borrowed of the firm. Mr. Drummond, on the production of the bond, had no sooner looked at the signature than he doubted its authenticity, and very politely asked the prisoner if he had seen Mr. Adair sign it. The latter said that he had not, but that he had no doubt that it was authentic, from the nature of the connection that subsisted between Mrs. Rudd, who was known to live with Daniel, and that gentleman a suggestion having previously been thrown, but that she was his natural daughter. Mr. Drummond, however, declined advancing any money without the sanction of his brother, and he desired Perrow to leave the bond, saying that it should either be returned on the next day or the money produced. The prisoner made no scruple to obey this suggestion, and he retired, promising to call again the next day. In the interim, Mr. Drummond examined the bond with greater attention, and Mr. Stevens, Secretary of the Admiralty, happening to call, his opinion was demanded, when, comparing the signature to the bond with letters which he had lately received from Mr. Adair, he was firmly convinced that it was forged. When Perrow came on the following day, Mr. Drummond spoke more freely than he had done before, and told him that he had imagined he had been imposed upon, but begged that, to remove all doubt, he would go with him to Mr. Adair, and get that gentleman to acknowledge the validity of the bond, on which the money would be advanced. This was immediately acceded to, and, on Mr. Adair seeing the document, he at once declared that the signature was a forgery. The prisoner smiled incredulously, and said that he jested, but Mr. Adair remarked that it was no jesting matter, and that it lay on him to clear up the affair. On this he went away, requesting to have the bond, in order to make the necessary inquiries, a request which was refused and persons being employed to watch him, it was found that immediately on his arrival at his house, he and his brother and Mrs. Rudd got into a coach, carrying with them all the valuables which they could collect, with a design to make their escape. They were, however, stopped and taken into custody, and being conveyed to Sir John Fielding's at Bow Street, there they underwent an examination, and upon the evidence adduced were committed to prison. Other charges were subsequently brought against them by Sir Thomas Frankland, from whom they had obtained two sums of five thousand pounds and four thousand pounds on similar forged bonds, as well as four thousand pounds which they had paid when the amount became due, and by Dr. Brook, who alleged that they had obtained from him fifteen hundred pounds in bonds of the Air Bank upon the security of a forged bond for three thousand one hundred pounds, and Mrs. Rudd was then admitted as evidence for the Crown. Her deposition then was that she was the daughter of a nobleman in Scotland, that when young she married an officer in the army named Rudd, against the consent of her friends, that her fortune was considerable, that on a disagreement with her husband they resolved to part, that she made a reserve of money, jewels and effects, to the amount of thirteen thousand pounds, all of which she gave to Daniel Perrow, whom she said she loved with the tenderness of a wife, that she had three children by him, that he had returned her kindness in every respect till lately, 
when, having been unfortunate in gaming in the alley, he had become uneasy, peevish, and much altered to her, that he cruelly constrained her to sign the bond now in question, by holding a knife to her throat, and swearing that he would murder her if she did not comply. That being struck with remorse, she had acquainted Mr. Adair with what she had done, and that she was now willing to declare every transaction with which she was acquainted, whenever she should be called upon by law to do so. Upon the cross-examination of Mr. Drummond, however, he swore that Mrs. Rudd, on her first being apprehended, took the whole on herself, and acknowledged that she had forged the bonds, that she begged them, for God's sake, to have mercy on an innocent man, and that, she said, no injury was intended to any person, and that all would be paid, and that she acknowledged delivering the bond to the prisoner. They then entertained an opinion that the prisoner was her dupe, and Mr. Robert Drummond, having expressed a notion that she could not have forged a handwriting so dissimilar from that of a woman as Mr. Adair's, she immediately, in order to satisfy them of the truth of what she said, wrote the name William Adair on a paper exactly like the signature which appeared attached to the bond. Mr. Watson, a money scrivener, also deposed that he had filled up the bonds at the desire of one of the brothers, and, in pursuance of instructions received from him, but he hesitated to fix on either on account of their great personal resemblance, and being pressed to make a positive declaration, he fixed on Daniel as his employer. The case for the prosecution being concluded, the prisoner entered upon his defence. In a long and ingenious speech, which he addressed to the jury, he strove hard to prove that he was the victim of the artifices of Mrs. Rudd. He said that she was constantly conversing about the influence she had over Mr. W. Adair, and that Mr. Adair had, by his interest with the King, obtained the promise of a baronetage for Daniel Perrow, and was about procuring him a seat in Parliament that Mr. Adair had promised to open a bank, and take the brothers Perrow into partnership with him, that the prisoner received many letters signed William Adair, which he had no doubt came from that gentleman, in which were promises of giving them a considerable part of his fortune during his life, and that he was to allow Daniel Perrow £2,400 a year for his household expenses, and £600 a year for Mrs. Rudd's pin money, that Mr. Daniel Perrow, purchased a house in Harley Street for £4,000, which money Mr. William Adair was to give to them. That when Daniel Perrow was pressed by the person of whom he brought the house for the money, the prisoner understood that they applied to Mr. William Adair, and that his answer was that he had lent the king £70,000, and had purchased a house in Pall Mall at £7,000, in which to carry on the banking business, and therefore could not spare the £4,000 at that time. He declared that all attempts at personal communication with Mr. Adair were strenuously opposed by Mrs. Rudd as being likely to destroy the effects of her exertions on his behalf, and contended that his conduct throughout the whole transaction with Mr. Drummond showed that he was innocent of any guilty intention, and that he firmly believed that he was acting honestly and justly. He then proceeded to call the following witnesses, whose evidence we shall give in the most concise manner. George Kinder deposed that Mrs. Perrow, the only name by which he knew Mrs. Rudd, told him that she was a near relation of Mr. James Adair, that he looked upon her as his child, had promised to make her fortune, and with that view had recommended her to Mr. William Adair, a near relation and intimate friend of his, who had promised to set her husband and the prisoner up in the banking business. He also deposed that she said that Mr. Daniel Perrow was to be made a baronet, and described how she would act when she became a lady. The witness further deposed that Mrs. Rudd often pretended that Mr. William Adair had called to see her, but that he never had seen that gentleman on any visit. John Moody, a livery servant of Daniel Perrow, deposed that his mistress wrote two very different hands, in one of which she wrote letters to his master, as from Mr. William Adair, and in the other the ordinary business of the family that the letters written in the name of William Adair were pretended to have been left in his master's absence, that his mistress ordered him to give them to his master, and pretended that Mr. Adair had been with his mistress for a longer or shorter time, as circumstances required. This witness likewise proved that the hand at the bottom of the bond, and that of his mistress's fictitious writing, were precisely the same. 
that she used different pens, ink, and paper in writing her common and fictitious letters, and that she sometimes gave to the witness half a crown when he had delivered a letter to her satisfaction. He said he had seen her go two or three times to Mr. J. Adair's, but never to Mr. Williams, and that Mr. J. Adair once visited his mistress on her lying in. Susanna Perrow, the prisoner's sister, deposed to her having seen a note delivered to Daniel Perrow by Mrs. Rudd for £19,000, drawn as by William Adair on Mr. Croft, the banker, in favour of Daniel Perrow. Elizabeth Perkins swore that a week before the forgery was discovered, her mistress gave her a letter to bring back to her in a quarter of an hour, and say that it was brought by Mr. Coverley, who had been servant to Daniel Perrow, that she gave her mistress this letter, and her master instantly broke the seal. Daniel Perrow swore that the purport of this letter was that Mr. Adair desired her to apply to his brother, the prisoner, to procure him five thousand pounds, upon his, Adair's, bond, in the same manner as he had done before, that Mr. Adair was unwilling to have it appear that the money was raised for him, and therefore desired him to have the bond lodged with some confidential friend, who would not require an assignment of it, that his brother, on being made acquainted with his request, showed a vast deal of reluctancy, and said it was very unpleasant work, but undertook it with a view of obliging Mr. William Adair. The counsel for the prosecution demanding, if he did not disclaim all knowledge of the affair before Mr. Adair, he said he denied ever having seen the bond before, nor had he a perfect knowledge of it till he saw it in the hands of Mr. Adair. David Cassidy, who assisted Mr. R. Perrow as an apothecary, deposed that he lived much within the profits of his profession, and that it was reported he was going into the banking business. John Lee, clerk to Sir John Fielding, swore to the prisoner's coming voluntarily to the office before his apprehension, and giving information that a forgery had been committed. Mr. Lee was asked if Mrs. Rudd ever charged the prisoner with any knowledge of the transaction till the justices were hearing evidence to prove her confession of the fact and he answered that he did not recollect that circumstance, but that on her first examination she did not accuse the prisoner. Mr. Perrow now called several persons of rank to his character. Lady Littleton, being asked if she thought him capable of such a crime, supposed she could have done it as soon herself. Sir John Moore, Sir John Chapman, General Rebound, Captain Ellis, Captain Burgoyne, and other gentlemen spoke most highly to the character of the prisoner but the jury found him guilty. It will be unnecessary now to give anything more than a succinct account of the trial of Daniel Perrow, which immediately followed that of his brother. He was indicted for forging and counterfeiting a bond, in the name of William Adair, for £3,300, to defraud the said William Adair, and for uttering the same, knowing it to be forged, to defraud Thomas Brook, Doctor of Physic, Mr. Scroop Ogilvy, clerk to Mr. William Adair, proved the forgery, and Dr. Brook swore to the uttering of the bond. The defence set up by the prisoner was that Mrs. Rudd had given the bond to him as a true one, and he asserted, in the most solemn manner, that he had no intention to defraud any man. Like his brother, he called several witnesses to show the artifices of which Mrs. Rudd had been guilty, and many persons proved the great respectability of his character. The jury, however, returned a verdict of guilty, and both prisoners were sentenced to death. But the execution did not take place until January 1776, in consequence of the proceedings which were subsequently taken against Mrs. Rudd. After conviction, the behaviour of the brothers was, in every respect, proper for their unhappy situation. Great interest was made to obtain a pardon for them, particularly for Robert, in whose favour seventy-eight bankers and merchants of London signed a petition to the King. The newspapers were filled with paragraphs, evidently written by disinterested persons, in favour of men whom they thought dupes to the design of an artful woman, but all was of no avail. On the day of execution the brothers were favoured with a morning coach, in which to be conveyed to the scaffold, and their conduct throughout was of the most exemplary description. After the customary devotions were concluded, they crossed hands, and joining the four together, in that manner were launched into eternity. They had not hanged more than half a minute when their hands dropped asunder, and they appeared to die without pain. Each of them delivered a paper to the ordinary of Newgate, which stated their innocence, and ascribed the blame of the whole transaction to the artifices of Mrs. Rudd. And indeed thousands of people gave credit to their assertions, 
and a great majority of the public thought Robert wholly innocent. Daniel Perrow and Robert Perrow were executed at Tyburn on the 17th of January, 1776. On the Sunday following, the bodies were carried from the house of Robert in Golden Square, and after the usual solemnities, deposited in the vault of St. Martin's Church. A mob of 30,000 persons attended the execution, and an equal number appeared at the funeral, but nothing occurred to disturb the solemnity of either scene. Margaret Caroline Rudd Tried for Forgery On the 16th of September, 1775, Mrs. Rudd was put to the bar at the Old Bailey to be tried for forgery. But the counsel for the prisoner pleading that, as she had been already admitted an evidence for the Crown, it was unprecedented to detain her for trial, and the judges differing in opinion on the point of law, she was remanded to prison till the opinion of the judges could be taken on a subject of so much importance. On the 8th of December, 1775, she was arraigned on an indictment for feloniously forging a bond, purporting to be signed by William Adair, and for feloniously uttering and publishing the same. Mr. Justice Aston now addressed the prisoner, informing her that eleven of the judges had met, the Chief Justice of the Common Pleas being indisposed, and were unanimous in opinion that, in cases not within any statute, an accomplice, who fully discloses the joint guilt of himself and his companions, and is admitted by Justices of the Peace as a witness, and who appears to have acted a fair and ingenious part in the disclosure of all the circumstances of the cases in which he has been concerned, ought not to be prosecuted for the offences so by him confessed, but cannot by law plea this in bar of any indictment, but merely as an equitable claim to mercy from the Crown, and nine of the judges were of the opinion that all the circumstances relative to this claim ought to be laid before the court, to enable the judges to exercise their discretion whether the trial should proceed or not. With respect to the case before them, the same nine judges were of the opinion that, if the matter stood singly upon the two informations of the prisoner, compared with the indictments against her, she ought to have been tried upon all, or any of them, for from her information she is no accomplice. She exhibits a charge against Robert and Daniel Perrow, the first soliciting her to imitate the handwriting of William Adair, the other forcing her to execute the forgery under the threat of death. Her two informations are contradictory. If she has suppressed the truth, she has no equitable claim to favour, and if she has told the truth, and the whole truth, she cannot be convicted. As to the indictments preferred against her by Sir Thomas Frankland, as her informations before the justice have no relation to his charges, she can claim no sort of advantage from these informations. The trial then proceeded. The principal evidences were the wife of Robert Perrow and John Moody, a servant to Daniel. The first endeavoured to prove that the bond was published, the latter that it was forged. Sir Thomas Frankland proved that he had lent money on the bond. It was objected by the counsel for the prisoner that Mrs. Perrow was an incompetent witness, as she would be interested in the event. But the court overruled this objection. Mrs. Perrow deposed that on the 24th of December she saw Mrs. Rudd deliver a bond to her husband, which he laid on the table while he brushed his coat. That it was for £5,300 payable to Robert Perrow, and signed William Adair and that it was witnessed in the names of Arthur Jones and Thomas Start, or Hart. Mrs. Perrow, being asked when she again saw the bond, said that it was brought to her on the 8th of March, the day after her husband was convicted, when she selected it from other bonds delivered to him on the 24th of December. She made her mark on it, and deposed that when it was delivered to Mr. Perrow, Mrs. Rudd said, Mr. Adair would be very much obliged to Mr. Perrow to try to raise upon that bond the sum of £4,000 of Sir Thomas Frankland. Sergeant Davy cross-examined Mrs. Perrow. She acknowledged that, till the 24th of December, she had never seen a bond in her life, and that on her first sight of that in question she had no suspicion that anything was wrong. John Moody, the servant to Daniel Perrow, who had been examined on the former trials, was called and repeated the testimony which he had before given. The bond which in this case was alleged to have been uttered was that for £4,000, on which Sir Thomas Frankland had advanced money. The prisoner, on being called on for her defence, in a short speech declared that she was innocent, and concluded by leaving her case in the hands of the jury, who almost immediately declared her not guilty. 
as soon as the verdict was returned she quitted the court and retired to the house of a friend at the west end of the town end of part thirty three Part thirty four of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume One, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part thirty four. The Countess of Bristol, otherwise the Duchess of Kingston, convicted of bigamy. Part one. Few females have in their time attracted so large a portion of public attention as this celebrated lady. She was the daughter of Colonel Chudley, the descendant of an ancient family in the county of Devon, but her father dying while she was yet young, her mother was left possessed only of a small estate with which to bring her up, and to fit her for that grade of society in which from her birth she was entitled to move. Being possessed, however, of excellent qualities, she improved the connection which she had among persons of fashion, with a view to the future success in life of her daughter. The latter, meanwhile, as she advanced in years, improved in beauty, and upon her attaining the age of eighteen was distinguished as well for the loveliness of her person as for the wit and brilliancy of her conversation. Her education had not been neglected, and, despite the small fortune possessed by her mother, no opportunity was lost by which her mind might be improved, and a means was about this time afforded for the display of her accomplishments. The father of George the Third held his court at Leicester House, and Mr. Pulteney, who then blazed as a meteor in the opposition benches of the House of Commons, was honoured with the particular regard of His Royal Highness. Miss Chudley had been introduced to Mr. Pulteney, and he had admired her for the beauties of her mind and of her person, and, his sympathies being excited in her behalf, he obtained for her, at the age of eighteen, the appointment of maid of honour to the princess of wales his efforts however did not stop at thus elevating her to a situation of the highest honour but he also endeavoured to improve the cultivation of her understanding by instruction and to him miss chudley read and with him when separated by distance she corresponded the station to which miss chudley had been advanced combined with her numerous personal attractions produced her many admirers some with titles, and others in the expectation of them. Among the former was the Duke of Hamilton, whom Miss Gunning had afterwards the good fortune to obtain for a consort. The Duke was passionately attached to Miss Chudley, and pressed his suit with such ardour as to obtain a solemn engagement on her part, that on his return from a tour for which he was preparing, she would become his wife. There were reasons why this event should not immediately take place, but that the engagement would be fulfilled at the specified time was considered by both parties as a moral certainty. A mutual pledge was given and accepted, the Duke commenced his proposed tour, and the parting condition was that he should write by every opportunity, and that Miss Chudley, of course, should answer his epistles. Thus the arrangement of fortune seemed to have united a pair who possibly might have experienced much happiness for between the Duke and Miss Chudley there was a strong similarity of disposition. But fate had not destined them for each other. Miss Chudley had an aunt, whose name was Hanmer. At her house the Honourable Mr. Hervey, son of the Earl of Bristol, and a captain in the Royal Navy, was a visitor. To this gentleman, Mrs. Hamner, became so exceedingly partial that she favoured views which he entertained towards her niece and engaged her efforts to effect, if possible, a matrimonial connection. There were two difficulties which would have been insurmountable had they not been opposed by the fertile genius of a female. Miss Judley disliked Captain Hervey, and she was betrothed to the Duke of Hamilton. No exertions which could possibly be made were spared to render this latter alliance nugatory, and the wits of this woman were exerted to the utmost to favour the object which she had in view. The letters of his grace were intercepted by Mrs. Hanmer, and his supposed silence giving offence to her niece, she worked so successfully on her pride as to induce her to abandon all thoughts of her lover, whose passion she had cherished with delight. A conduct the reverse of that imputed to the Duke was observed by Captain Hervey. He was all that assiduity could dictate, 
or attention perform. He had daily access to Miss Chudleigh, and each interview was artfully improved by the aunt to the promotion of her own views. The letters of His Grace of Hamilton, which regularly arrived, were as regularly suppressed, until, piqued beyond endurance, Miss Chudleigh was prevailed on to accept the hand of Captain Hervey, and by a private marriage to ensure the participation of his future honours and fortune. The ceremony was performed in a private chapel adjoining the country mansion of Mr. Merrill at Lainston near Winchester in Hampshire. On a review of life, the predominant evil experienced may be easily traced by every reflecting mind to some wilful error or injudicious mistake, operating as a determinate cause and giving the colour to our fate. This was the case with Miss Chudleigh, and the hour at which she became united with Captain Hervey proved to her the origin of every subsequent unhappiness. The connubial rites were attended with unhappy consequences, and from the night following the day on which the marriage was solemnised, Miss Chudleigh resolved never to have any further connection with her husband. To prevail on him not to claim her as his wife required all the art of which she was mistress, and the best dissuasive was the loss of her situation as maid of honour should the marriage become publicly known. The circumstances of Captain Hervey were not in a flourishing condition, and were ill calculated to enable him to ride with a high hand over his wife, and the fear of the loss of the emoluments over her office operated most powerfully with him to induce him to obey the injunctions which she imposed upon him in this respect. His conduct even now, however, exhibited a strong desire to act with a degree of harshness most unusual so soon after the performance of the marriage ceremony and the consequence was that any feelings of respect which his wife may have fancied she entertained for him were soon dispelled her own expression subsequently was that her misery commenced with the arrival of captain hervey in england and the greatest joy she experienced was on the intelligence of his departure her marriage being unknown to mere outward observers miss chudleigh or mrs hervey a maid in appearance a wife in disguise would have been supposed to be placed in a most enviable condition. The attractive centre of the circle in which she moved, the invigorating spirit of the life of the society formed round her, she was universally admired. Her royal mistress smiled upon her. The friendship of many was at her call. The admiration of none could be withheld from her. But amidst all her conquests and all her fancied happiness, she wanted that peace of mind which was so necessary to support her against the conflicts which arose in her own breast. Nor was her own heart, that inward monitor, the only source of her trouble. Her husband, quieted for a time, grew obstreperous as he saw the jewel admired by all, which was, he felt, entitled only to his love, and feeling that he possessed the right to her entire consideration, he resolved to assert its power, in the meantime, every art which she possessed had been put into operation to soothe him to continued silence, but her further endeavours being unsuccessful, she was compelled to grant his request, and to attend an interview which he appointed at his own house, and to which he enforced obedience by threatening an instant and full disclosure in case of her non-compliance. The meeting was strictly private, all persons being sent from the house with the exception of a black servant, and on Mrs. Hervey's entrance to the apartment in which her husband was seated, his first care was to prevent all intrusion by locking the door. This meeting, like all others between her and her husband, was unfortunate in its effects. The fruit of it was the birth of a boy, whose existence it will be readily supposed she had much difficulty in concealing. Her removal to Brompton for a change of air became requisite during the term of her confinement, and she returned to Leicester House, perfectly recovered from her indisposition, but the infant soon sinking in the arms of death left only the tale of its existence to be related. In the meantime the sum of her unhappiness had been completed by the return of the Duke of Hamilton. His grace had no sooner arrived in England than he hastened to pay his adoration at the feet of his idol, and to learn the cause of her silence when his letters had been regularly dispatched to her. An interview which took place soon set the character of Mrs. Hanmer in its true light, but while Miss Chudleigh was convinced of the imposition which had been practised upon her, 
she was unable to accept the proffered hand of her illustrious suitor, or to explain the reason for her apparently ungracious rejection of his addresses. The Duke, flighty as he was in other respects, in his love for Miss Chudleigh, had at least been sincere, and this strange conduct on the part of his betrothed, followed as it was by a request on her part that he would not again intrude his visits upon her, raised emotions in his mind which can hardly be described. The rejection of his grace was followed by that of several other persons of distinction, and the mother of Miss Chudleigh, who was quite unaware of her private marriage with Captain Hervey, could not conceal her regret and anger at the supposed folly of her daughter. It was impossible that these circumstances could long remain concealed from the society in which Miss Chudleigh moved, and in order to relieve herself from the embarrassments by which she was surrounded, she determined to travel on the continent, trusting that time would eradicate the impression of her fickleness which she left behind her, and that change of scene would remove the pain which every day spent in the theatre of her former operations could not fail to sink deeper into her heart. Germany was the place selected by her for her travels, and she in turn visited the chief cities of its principalities. Possessed as she was of introductions of the highest class, she was gratified by obtaining the acquaintance of many crowned heads. Frederick of Prussia conversed and corresponded with her. In the Electress of Saxony she found a friend whose affections for her continued to the latest period of life. The Electress was a woman of sense, honour, virtue, and religion, and her letters were replete with kindness. While her hand distributed presents to Miss Chudleigh out of the treasury of abundance, her heart was interested for her happiness. This she afterwards evinced during her prosecution, for at that time a letter from the Electress contained the following passage. "'You have long experienced my love, my revenue, my protection, my everything. You may command. Come then, my dear life, to an asylum of peace. Quit a country where, if you are bequeathed a cloak, some pretender may start up and ruin you by law to prove it not your property. Let me have you at Dresden.' On her return from the continent, Miss Chudleigh ran over the career of pleasure, enlivened the court circles, and each year became more ingratiated with the mistress whom she served. She was the leader of fashion, played whist with Lord Chesterfield, and revelled with Lady Harrington and Miss Ashe. She was a constant visitant of all the public places, and in 1742 appeared at a masked ball in the character of Iphigenia. Reflection, however, put off for the day, too frequently intruded an unwelcome visit at night. Captain Hervey, like a perturbed spirit, was eternally crossing the path trodden by his wife. If in the rooms at Bath, he was sure to be there. At a rout, ridotto, or ball, this destroyer of her peace embittered every pleasure, and even menaced her with an intimation that he would disclose the marriage to the princess. Miss Chudleigh, now persuaded of the folly and danger of any longer concealment from her royal mistress, determined that the design which her husband had formed from a malicious feeling should be carried out by herself from a principle of rectitude, and she in consequence communicated to the princess the whole of the circumstances attending her unhappy union. The recital was one which could excite no feeling of disrespect or anger, and her royal mistress pitied her, and continued her patronage up to the hour of her death. At length a stratagem was either suggested, or it occurred to Miss Chudleigh, at once to deprive Captain Hervey of the power to claim her as his wife. The clergyman who had married them was dead. The register book was in careless hands. A handsome compliment was paid for the inspection, and while the person, in whose custody it was, listened to an amusing story, Miss Chudleigh tore out the register. Thus imagining the business accomplished, she for a time bade defiance to her husband, whose taste for the softer sex having subsided from some unaccountable cause, afforded Miss Chudleigh a cessation of inquietude. A change in the circumstances of the captain, however, effected an alteration in the feelings of his wife. His father having died, he succeeded to the title of the Earl of Bristol, and his accession to nobility was not unaccompanied by an increase of fortune. 
Miss Chudleigh saw that by assuming the title of Countess of Bristol, she would probably command increased respect, and would obtain greater power, and with a degree of unparalleled blindness, she went to the house of Mr. Merrill, the clergyman, in whose chapel she had been married, to restore those proofs of her union, which she had previously taken such pains to destroy. Her ostensible reason was a joint out of town. Her real design was to procure, if possible, the insertion of her marriage with Captain Hervey in the book, which she had formerly mutilated. With this view she dealt out promises with a liberal hand. The officiating clerk, who was a person of various avocations, was to be promoted to the extent of his wishes. The book was managed by the lady to her content, and she returned to London, secretly exulting in the excellence and success of her machination. While this was going on, however, her better fate influenced in her favour the heart of a man who was the exemplar of amiability. This was the Duke of Kingston. But remarried, as it were by her own stratagem, the participation of ducal honours became legally impossible. The chains of wedlock, which the lady had been so industrious in assuming or putting off, as seemed most suitable to her views, now became galling in the extreme. Every advice was taken, every means tried, by which her liberation might be obtained, but all the efforts which were made proved useless, and it was found to be necessary to acquiesce in that which could not be opposed successfully, or pass unnoticed. The Duke's passion, meanwhile, became more ardent and sincere, and, finding the apparent impossibility of a marriage taking place, he, for a series of years, cohabited with Miss Chudleigh, although with such external observances of decorum, that their intimacy was neither generally remarked nor known. The disagreeable nature of these proceedings on their parts was, however, felt by both parties, and efforts were again made by means of which a marriage might be solemnised. The Earl of Bristol was sounded, and it was found that, grown weary of a union with a woman whom he now disliked, and whom he never met, he was not unwilling to accept the proposals held out, but upon his learning the design with which a divorce was sought, he declared that he would never consent to it, for that his countess's vanity should not be flattered by her being raised to the rank of a duchess. The negotiations were thus for a time stopped, but afterwards, there being a lady with whom he conceived that he could make an advantageous match, he listened to the suggestions which were made to him with more complacency, and at length declared that he was ready to adopt any proceedings which should have for their effect the annihilation of the ties by which he was bound to Miss Chudleigh. The civilians were consulted, a jactitation suit was instituted, but the evidence by which the marriage could have been proved was kept back, and the Earl of Bristol, failing, as it was intended he should fail, in substantiating the marriage, a decree was made, declaring the claim to be null and unsupported. Legal opinions now only remained to be taken as to the effect of this decree, and the lawyers of the ecclesiastical courts, highly tenacious of the rights and jurisdiction of their own judges, declared their opinion to be that the sentence could not be disturbed by the interference of any extrinsic power. In the conviction, therefore, of the most perfect safety, the marriage of the Duke of Kingston with Miss Chudleigh was publicly solemnised. The wedding favours were worn by persons of the highest distinction in the kingdom, and during the lifetime of his grace no attempt was made to dispute the legality of the proceedings. For a few years the Duchess figured in the world of gaiety, without apprehension or control. She was raised to the pinnacle of her fortune, and she enjoyed that which her later life had been directed to accomplish, the parade of title, but without that honour which integrity of character can alone secure. She was checked in her career of pleasure, however, by the death of her duke. The fortune which his grace possessed, it appears, was not entailed, and it was at his option, therefore, to bequeath it to the duchess or to the heirs of his family, as seemed best to his inclination. His will, excluding from every benefit an elder, and preferring a younger nephew as the heir in tail, gave rise to the prosecution of the Duchess, which ended in the beggary of her prosecutor and her own exile. The demise of the Duke of Kingston was neither sudden nor unexpected. Being attacked with a paralytic affection, he lingered but a short time, 
which was employed by the Duchess in journeying his grace from town to town, under the false idea of prolonging his life by change of air and situation. At last, when real danger seemed to threaten, even in the opinion of the Duchess, she dispatched one of her swiftest-footed messengers to her solicitor, Mr. Field, of the Temple, requiring his immediate attendance. He obeyed the summons, and arriving at the house, the Duchess privately imparted her wishes, which were that he would procure the Duke to execute and be himself a subscribing witness to a will, made without his knowledge, and more to the taste of the Duchess than that which had been executed. The difference between these two wills was this. The Duke had bequeathed the income of his estates to his relict during her life, and expressly under the condition of her continuing in a state of widowhood. Perfectly satisfied, however, as the Duchess seemed with whatever was the inclination of her dearest lord, she could not resist the opportunity of carrying her secret wishes into effect. She did not relish the temple of Hymen being shut against her. Earnestly, therefore, she did press Mr. Field to have her own will immediately executed, which left her at liberty to give her hand to the conqueror of her heart, and in her anxiety to have the restraint shaken off, she had nearly deprived herself of every benefit derivable from the demise of the Duke. When Mr. Field was introduced to his grace, his intellects were perceptibly affected, and although he knew the friends who approached him, a transient knowledge of their persons was the only indication of the continuance of his mental powers which he exhibited. Mr. Field very properly remonstrated against the impropriety of introducing a will for execution to a man in such a state, but this occasioned a severe reprehension from the Duchess, who reminded him that his business was only to obey the instructions of his employer. Feeling for his professional character, however, he positively refused either to tender the will, or to be in any manner concerned in endeavouring to procure its execution, and with this refusal he quitted the house, the Duchess beholding him with an indignant eye as the annoyer of her scheme, when in fact, by not complying with it, he was rendering her an essential service, for had the will she proposed been executed, it would most undubitably have been set aside, and the heirs would consequently have excluded the relict from everything except that to which the right of dower entitled her, and the marriage being invalidated, the lady in this, as in other respects, would have been ruined by her own stratagem. Soon after the frustration of this attempt, the Duke of Kingston expired. No sooner were the funeral rites performed than the Duchess adjusted her affairs and embarked for the continent, proposing Rome for her temporary residence. Ganganelli at that time filled the papal chair. From the moderation of his principles, the tolerant spirit which he on every occasion displayed, and the marked attention he bestowed on the English, he acquired the title of the Protestant Pope, and to such a character the Duchess was a welcome visitor. Ganganelli treated her with the utmost civility, gave her, as a sovereign prince, many privileges, and she was lodged in the palace of one of the cardinals. Her vanity being thus gratified, her grace in return treated the Romans with a public spectacle. She had built an elegant pleasure yacht. A gentleman who had served in the navy was the commander. Under her orders he sailed for Italy and the vessel, at considerable trouble and expense, was conveyed up the Tiber. The sight of an English yacht in this river was one of so unusual a character that it attracted crowds of admirers. But while all seemed happiness and pleasure, where the bark rested quietly on the waters of the river, proceedings were being concocted in London, which would effectually put a stop to any monetary sensations of bliss which the Duchess might entertain. Mrs. Craddock who, in the capacity of a domestic, had witnessed the marriage which had been solemnised between her grace and the Earl of Bristol, found herself so reduced in circumstances that she was compelled to apply to Mr. Field for assistance. The request was rejected, and, notwithstanding her assurance that she was perfectly well aware of all the circumstances attending the Duchess's marriage, and that she should not hesitate to disclose all she knew in a quarter where she would be liberally paid, namely, to the disappointed relations of the Duke of Kingston, she was set at defiance. Thus refused, starvation stared her in the face, 
and, stung by the ingratitude of the Duchess's solicitor, she immediately set about the work of ruin which she contemplated. The Duke of Kingston had borne a marked dislike to one of his nephews, Mr. Evelyn Meadows, one of the sons of his sister, Lady Frances Pierpoint. This gentleman, being excluded from the presumptive heirship, joyfully received the intelligence that a method of revenging himself against the Duchess was presented to him. He saw Mrs. Craddock, learned from her the particulars of the statement which she would be able to make upon oath, and, being perfectly satisfied of his truth, he preferred a bill of indictment against the Duchess of Kingston for bigamy, which was duly returned a true bill. Notice was immediately given to Mr. Field of the proceedings, and advices were forthwith sent to the Duchess to appear and plead to the indictment to prevent a judgment of outlawry. The Duchess's immediate return to England being thus required, she set about making the necessary preparations for her journey, and as money was one of the commodities requisite to enable her to commence her homeward march, she proceeded to the house of Mr. Jenkins, the banker in Rome, in whose hands she had placed security for the advance of all such sums she might require. The opposition of her enemies, however, had already commenced. They had adopted a line of policy exactly suited to the lady with whom they had to deal. Mr. Jenkins was out, and could not be found. She apprised him by letter of her intended journey, and her consequent want of money, but still he avoided seeing her. Suspecting the trick, her grace was not to be trifled with, and finding all her efforts fail, she took a pair of pistols in her pocket, and driving to Mr. Jenkins's house, once again demanded to be admitted. The customary answer that Mr. Jenkins was out was given, but the Duchess declared that she was determined to wait until she saw him, even if it should not be until a day, month, or year had elapsed, and she took her seat on the steps of the door, which she kept open with the muzzle of one of her pistols, apparently determined to remain there. She knew that business would compel his return, if he were not already indoors, and at length Mr. Jenkins, finding further opposition useless, appeared. The nature of her business was soon explained. The conversation was not of the mildest kind. Money was demanded, not asked. A little prevarication ensued, but the production of a pistol served as the most powerful mode of reasoning, and the necessary sum being instantly obtained, the Duchess quitted Rome. Her journey was retarded before she reached the Alps. A violent fever seemed to seize on her vitals, but she recovered, to the astonishment of her attendants. An abscess then formed in her side, which rendering it impossible for her to endure the motion of the carriage, a kind of litter was provided, in which she slowly travelled. In this situation nature was relieved by the breaking of the abscess, and after a painfully tedious journey the Duchess reached Calais. At that place she made a pause, and there it was that her apprehension got the better of her reason. In idea she was fettered and incarcerated in the worst cell of the worst prison in London. She was totally ignorant of the bailable nature of her offence, and therefore expected the utmost that can be imagined. Colonel West, a brother of the late Lord Delaware, whom the Duchess had known in England, became her principal associate, but he was not lawyer enough to satisfy her doubts. By the means of former connections, and through a benevolence in his own nature, the Earl of Mansfield had a private meeting with the Duchess, and the venerable peer conducted himself in a manner which did honour to his heart and character. End of part 34